Oh, oh, you know what? I gotta log in. I was gonna make a sarcastic comment, but oh, um, I was gonna go to the bathroom. Should I tell everybody? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I think we're good to go. Peter, we're good from your perspective. Um, hello, everybody. Sorry to start the meeting a couple of minutes late. We were in a uh, an executive session that we moved into um, on the heels of a workshop that started at four o'clock. So I want to welcome everybody to Chambers. We've got 46 people with us on Zoom this evening. So we've got a full house. Um, welcome, this is the Portland City Council. We're in a regular meeting this evening and I'll call our meeting to order and welcome uh, you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Fournier? Here. Councilor Rodriguez? Here. Councilor Dion? Here. Councillor Ali. Councillor Zaro. Here. Councillor Trevaro. Here. Oh, on Zoom. Councillor Trevaro okay. is with us on Zoom. Here. Okay. Uh, Councillor Pelletier. Here. Councillor Phillips. Here. Mayor Snyder. Here. Okay, everybody is present. And as noted, we do have Councillor Trevaro with, with us this evening on Zoom. We can see her. Um, so Councillor, please raise your hand and I'll do my best to keep an eye on my Zoom screen to make sure I'm calling on you at the appropriate time. Um, so at this time, we're gonna open it up for public comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if there's anybody with us in chambers or on Zoom who would like to speak to the council on a matter that is not being covered on tonight's agenda, now is the time. Right to you, Stephen Scherf. That mic is in the wrong position and it didn't work to fix it. Stephen Scherf of uh, Bracket Street. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you are referenced in your previous meeting as not being part of this meeting, uh, being your executive session. Um, I um, intended to uh, speak to the executive session but there was no audio on the uh, Zoom at four o'clock. So I couldn't, uh, I wasn't even aware that you were, you just looked like you were chatting all of a sudden you left the room. Um, I um, quite frankly don't understand your motive for an executive session. Um, they're really, you know, they're, the public should be informed. If you're looking at uh, locations for uh, siting facilities, uh, that should be a public uh, conversation, not something you do behind closed doors. And uh, I, I, I wanted to object to that. And uh, I came to, for the rest of the meeting because I was concerned that I wouldn't have audio for the rest of the meeting, so. Uh, thank you for your comment. Um, and next we'll go to Zoom. I've got Don Marietta. Don, if you're with us, you need to unmute yourself and just go ahead and give us your first and last name and the organization you represent or the neighborhood that you live in. And you've got three minutes on the clock. Okay, we're having some AV issues, it, it seems. If there's anybody else in chambers who would like to step forward, I'm happy to go back and forth. Okay, I don't see anybody else in chambers, so I'll go to George Rowe on Zoom. Uh, George Rowe, Hanover Street. Um, so uh, the Parks uh, Director uh, recently informed the Parks Commission um, that 
the Back Cove uh, West storage project that has been digging up Preble uh, Athletic Field uh, next to Hannaford's has been delayed like 10 months, something like that. In that they've really uh, apparently have, they've encountered some very difficult uh, subsurface conditions that they had, I guess, anticipated but didn't realize just quite how tricky they would be. And I believe that that project is at least a $50 million project. And I am just sort of always gobsmacked at the fact that there is almost no public visibility on what is going on with the uh, enormous amount of money being spent on uh, the stormwater compliance. Um, you know, we occasionally have little presentations and, and, and whatnot, but considering that the much more modest elementary school uh, renovations, which were capped by the way, they literally could not spend more than a dime than they were allocated. Those projects have been under enormous scrutiny. There's been commissions and committees. I think Mark Dion, Belinda Ray, Nick Mavadonis, they all got to sit on a special oversight committee. There's been absolutely no citizen oversight of all of this money. And we have no good idea about cost overruns and about what's actually been going on with these projects. John Jennings had moved the site of that storage facility from Marginal Way over to the Preble uh, fields for his own reasons, without any council approval of that other than just letting him do it. And so I don't understand how literally hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent uh, over the course of at least the last decade and, and still very much in progress that we haven't had any real public scrutiny of this. And it's just unbelievably disappointing when some projects get all kinds of scrutiny and other projects just completely skate in terms of the public understanding what's going on on a quarterly basis, at least, if not an annual basis, and having some sense of cost overruns and 30 second warning, their impact to our bond capacity and things like that. Um, it's a huge glaring error uh, in what the city council has been doing for years, and it really needs to stop because it's it hurting the credibility of a lot of the hardworking people who are trying to get us to a better place on this stormwater compliance. But it has this dark cloud over it of no transparency of any meaningful kind. Uh, thank you for your comment. And is there additional public comment either on Zoom or in chambers? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment period on items that are not on tonight's agenda, and I'll ask my colleagues on the council if anybody has an announcement this evening. Okay, looking for Councillor Trevorrow. Nope. Okay, I don't see any, so we'll move on from the announcements. And um, next on our agenda are uh, recognitions. Will the clerk please read um, our first recognition? Recognizing Peace in Two Chorus Bronze Award at the Anthem Awards. Uh, this is sponsored by Pius Ali, Councillor. Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I am going to postpone that to a future date because uh, I think uh, Peace in Two have a rehearsal today, so they are not able to join us. Okay. Thank you. So we'll postpone that recognition. Thank you very much for that explanation. And um, the next um, recognition is, uh, does the clerk want to read that one into the record? Sure. Recognizing Teresa Val uh, Valier, founder of Friends of Woodford's Corner as Main Development Foundation's 2022 Downtown Hero, sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Um, thank you. And I'll just take this moment to, um, to share a little bit about Teresa. So congratulations to Teresa Valier, Friends of Woodford's Corner, who will receive, as the clerk said, the Downtown Hero Award this April from the Maine Development Foundation. So um, Wood, Friends of Woodford's Corner has grown quickly and Teresa has been behind uh, the scenes, um, has helped to accomplish nearly everything that they have done. When uh, what started as a Facebook group in 2015 became a community volunteer organization because Teresa had organized a railroad cleanup. Um, she drew in dedicated people who helped the group file as a 501c3 just two years later and put together a board of directors with skills that mapped onto the Main Street model so the organization could become a Main Street affiliate 
And at this point, I'm gonna to turn to Councillor Zaro because I know that you had some suggestions on that front and were helpful in getting that community organization to actually become a Main Street affiliate, which is a pretty big deal and a, and a, great, um, a great asset for the city of Portland. So thank you, Councillor Zaro. Um, though Teresa has no background in economic development, historic preservation, or community organizing, nor is she trained as an urban planner, she's used her background in the food and hospitality industry and her training and experience as a clinical social worker to build relationships and organize events that helped set in motion the rebuilding of Woodford's Corner. In 2022, Friends of Woodford, Woodford's Corner has reached a particularly or had reached a particularly noteworthy milestone, leasing an office in a newly revitalized landmark building on the corner right there. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, and raising enough money to hire a paid staff person who will finally relieve Teresa of some of, the man, uh, some of the burdens of managing and performing the myriad administrative tasks that keep the organization moving forward. I don't see Teresa here with us in chambers. I'm gonna look, glasses on, glasses off to see if she's with us on Zoom. Um, but in any event, what, I, what, what we all wanted to do tonight was offer our congratulations and recognition of a great community member. So thank you for your work, Teresa Valliere. Okay, um, and uh, next we will move to the approval of the minutes from our previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the March 6th city council meeting? So moved. Second. Councillor Phillips with a second from Councillor Zaro. Are there any questions or comments from the council about those draft minutes? Being none, we'll go ahead and vote to approve those minutes. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor? Yes. Trevorrow? Thank you. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? I'm a yes. And so that passes unanimously. Um, and now we move into proclamations. So we've got several this evening. Will the clerk please read Proclamation 15? Proclamation 15, 22, 23, recognizing April 2023 as Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month. Sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Thank you. And I'm actually going to hand this one over to my colleague, Councillor Ali. Uh, Mayor, my computer is being slow, and I only have one of the two proclamations uh, printed. So you may have to read that. Okay. I, I will be happy to read this, but I do want to thank Councillor Ali for his um, uh, close attention to proclamations and working with staff to make sure that uh, proclamations that we see each year are brought forward with um, appropriate edits and updates. So thank you, Councillor Ali. I'll go ahead and read this one into the record. Again, this is the proclamation recognizing April 2023 as Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month. Whereas genocide is a human tragedy inspired by the most repug repugnant elements of hatred, intolerance, and inhumanity, and whereas Article 2 of the United Nations Genocide Convention contain, contains a narrow definition of the crime of genocide, which includes a mental element, intent to destroy in whole or in part a national ethical, um, sorry, eth ethnic, racial, or religious group as such, and a physical element killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And whereas for decades, campaigns of dislocation and murder have been used with a clear and ultimate purpose to annihilate an other race, religion or ethnic minority through coordinated massacre. And whereas as a result of genocide, millions of people, adults and children alike have been murdered, had their cultural identities stolen or experienced forced relocation. And whereas by recognizing, remembering and educating ourselves on past and ongoing instances of genocide, we help protect historic memory, ensure that similar atrocities do not occur again and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution and tyranny. And whereas residents are becoming informed as to the causes and effects of genocide, as well as the ramifications of these tragedies in our shared human history on the generations of people descended from survivors of genocide and those impacted by genocide today. 
and whereas the month of April is designated as Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month in recognition of the many genocides which have occurred or begun in the month of April, so that all members of the human family may preserve the memory of victims, honor survivors, and stand together in opposition to the possibility of future genocide by fostering peaceful coexistence between diverse communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Kate Snyder, Mayor of the City of Portland, Maine, and members of the City Council do hereby recognize April 2023 as Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month in the City of Portland, Maine, and invite the residents of Portland to commemorate the solemn observance and recognize how much more we must do in the struggle against these unthinkable crimes against humanity. Signed and sealed this 20th day of March, 2023. Thank you. Will the clerk please read Proclamation 16. Well, Proclamation 16, 22, 23, recognizing April 2020, 2023 as American Heritage Month. And this one's also sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. And I hand it over to my counselor, my, my colleague, <laughs> Counselor I, Ali. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, I think I'm your counselor, I'm at large. You're my, <laughs> you are. <laughs> uh, proclamation recognizing April 2023 as Arab American Heritage Month. Whereas for over a century, Arab Americans have been making valuable contribution to virtually every aspect of American society, including in medicine, law, business, education, technology, government, military, and culture. And whereas since migrating to America, men and women of Arab descent have shared their rich culture and tradition with neighbors and friends, while also setting fine example of model citizens and public servants. And whereas they brought with them to America, their resilient family values, strong work ethic, dedication to education and diversity in faith and creed, which have added strength to our great democracy. And whereas Arab Americans have also enriched our society by sharing in the entrepreneurial American spirit that makes our nation free and prosperous. And whereas the history of Arab Americans in the United States remain neglected and defaced by misconceptions, bigotry, and anti-Arab hate in the forms of crimes and speech. And whereas they join all Americans in the desire to see a peaceful and diverse society where every individual is treated equally and feels safe. And whereas, the incredible contribution and heritage of Arab Americans have helped us build a better nation. And now therefore, be it resolved that Kate Snyder, mayor of the city of Portland, Maine, and members of the city council do hereby recognize April 2023 as Arab American Heritage Month in the city of Portland and invite citizens of Portland to celebrate the many accomplishments and rich history of our Arab American neighbors that add to the diversity, strength, and vibrancy of Portland. Sign and seal this 20th day of March, 2023 by Kate Snyder, Mayor of City of Portland. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ali. <laughs> Will the clerk please read or, uh, Proclamation 17. Proclamation 17, 22, 23, recognizing April 1st through the 7th, 2023 as the Week of the Young Child, sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Thank you. And I'd be happy to read this into the record. Whereas the first years of a child li child's life are the period of the most rapid brain development, laying the foundation for all future learning. And whereas high quality early childhood programs provide important benefits to children, families, and the city by saving taxpayer dollars, making working families more economically secure and preparing children to succeed in school, earn higher wages and live healthier lives. And whereas there are fewer available slots in both home-based and center-based early childhood education programs than the number of children from birth to age five, limiting access for working families that need an affordable mixed delivery early childhood education system that offers a range of high quality options that meet their needs. And whereas young children need skilled, educated, competent, consistent, and compensated early childhood educators to ensure that children supported by families in our community have the early experiences they need for a strong foundation. And whereas in celebration of the National Association for the Education of Young Children's Week, 
Young Children's Week of the Young Child, the City of Portland expresses its support for continuing to advance the early childhood education system for children, families, and educators. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Kate Snyder, Mayor of the City of Portland and members of the Portland City Council, recognize the efforts of the Maine Association for the Early for the Education of Young Children and Portland Works for Kids to promote early learning and healthy development and recognize April 1st through 7th as the Week of the Young Child. Signed and sealed this 20th day of March, Kate Snyder. Thank you. And lastly, we'll go to, I'm going to say lastly, but I know we've got a lot tonight. Our last proclamation this evening, um, will the clerk please read 18. Proclamation 18, 22, 23, recognizing April 3rd through the 9th, 2023 as National Public Health Week, sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Thank you very much. And I will read this one into the record as well. Hold on. Okay. Okie doke. Okay, recognizing April 3rd through 9th as National Public Health Week, whereas the week of April 3rd through 9th, through 9th is National Public Health Week, and the theme is centering and celebrating cultures in health. And whereas between the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and August 2022, life expectancy in the U.S. decreased by one and a half years, with the most significant decreases observed in Black and Hispanic populations. And whereas racial and ethnic minority populations in the United States continue to experience disparities in illness and death rates. In Portland, 16.6% .6 of people identifying as, as Hispanic and 7.4% of those identifying as Black have no health insurance compared to 7% of the entire population of Portland. And whereas the United States has the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed country and is the only developed country to see those rates rising. And whereas according to a February 2023 report by the Maine Attorney General's Office, 10,110 drug overdoses were reported in 2022 including 716 suspected or confirmed deaths. And wherein, whereas in urban environments like Portland, health status can differ by neighborhood due to differences in the built environment, environmental quality, community context, and access to healthy food, education, and healthcare. And whereas public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare for, withstand, and recovery, recover from the impact of a full range of health threats and public health action has played a major role in reducing and in some cases eliminating the spread of infectious disease. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Kate Snyder, Mayor of the City of Portland, Maine, and members of the City Council do hereby recognize the week of April 3rd through 9th, 2023 as National Public Health Week and call upon the people of Portland to celebrate the impact of public health, as well as to encourage family and friends to adopt preventive lifestyle habits. Signed and sealed this 20th day of March, 2023. And um, for anybody who's checking out the agenda online, we do have a plain um, language version that I'd like to hand off to my colleague, Councillor Fournier, to read into the record. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I think it's really important um, as the Chair of Health and Human Services and Public Safety. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is making sure that the language of these proclamations is uh, plain language, so it's easily understandable for the public. Um, and sometimes with the whereas language, um, the message can get a little bit lost. And so when we met this past week for Health and Human Services, we talked about um, just taking this opportunity to read the alternate text so that it's available for everyone um, in that plain language. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me to read this. So uh, Portland National Public Health Week proclamation. So the week of April 3rd through the 9th, 2023 is National Public Health Week and the theme is centering and celebrating cultures and health. So until three years ago, life expectancy or how long people live on average has slowly increased over time because it, because of advances in medicine and technology. So from 2020 to 2022, life expectancy in the US decreased by 1.5 years with black and Hispanic populations impacted the most. So some highlights uh, of public health work uh, inequities, minority populations in the US continue to have higher illness and death rates. 
In Portland, 16.6% of Hispanic and 7.4% of Black populations have no health insurance. This is compared to 7% of the overall population of Portland. More women die in childbirth in the U.S. than any other developed country, and the U.S. is the only country to see these numbers go up. In Maine, there were 10,110 drug overdoses reported in 2022. 716 of those overdoses ended in death. In larger cities like Portland, how healthy you are can depend on where you live. Access to parks and sidewalks, air quality, community connectedness, and access to healthy food, education, and healthcare all impact your health. Public health professionals help communities. Public health, public health helps to prevent, prepare for, resist, and recover from health threats. This includes disease outbreaks such as COVID-19 pandemic, measles, natural disasters, and disasters caused by human activity. Public health action has played a major role in reducing and in some cases, eliminating the spread of infectious disease. For these reasons, our mayor, Kate Snyder, and the city of Portland, Maine, members of the city council, recognize the week April 3rd through the 9th, 2023, as National Public Health Week. We thank those working in the field of public health, and we call upon the people of Portland to celebrate the impact of public health and encourage family and friends to adopt healthy lifestyle habits. Thank you. That is helpful. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. I appreciate that. Okay, moving on from proclamations this evening and into our consent items. Um, so we've got a couple of items tonight under our consent calendar. Will the clerk please read orders 150 and 151? <clears throat> Order 150, 22, 23, declaring August 6th through the 9th, 2023, uh, the Circus Mercus at Payson Park Festival, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager, and Order 151, 22, 23, declaring June 11th, 2023, its Recircram Music Festival, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Thank you very much. And just so uh, folks in the audience understand, we'll take public comment on these two items at the same time after we hear from the city manager who will provide context for us. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I see Andy Downs out there, my, my good friend who handles these events. I don't think there's anything um, specific uh, that, that we have to update you on. These are pretty regular events. Um, Andy, if you could maybe just give a little bit on on the timing of the of the circus one, I think it's August sixth and ninth. Is that correct, or through the ninth? Just to make sure that everybody understands, that will be um, at Payson Park, and then the um, Maine Academy of Modern Music will be at the Ocean Gate parking lot uh, for Sunday, June eleventh, and that will be a music festival that will be during the day, but will have the um, stopping uh, at 10 o'clock, um, and most of the music will be just during the day period. But Andy's here if we have any specific questions. Uh, great. I appreciate that. Thank you. If there's any public comment on either of these items, please come step forward in chambers. Um, don't hesitate. Come right up to the mic. I'll start on Zoom, I think. There we go. Uh, first commenter is Devin Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, council members, and city staff. Um, thank you so much for all that you do for the city. Um, I want to start by saying that I'm a huge fan of Circus Smirkus, but I have a couple of things that I just want to call attention to about um, this specific event. Um, it, you just mentioned that this is a regular event. This is, to my knowledge, never been held in Payson Park. I believe that they're usually at Fort Allen and it's not like a big top event. Um, and most of the larger events that happen in Payson Park happen in the Triangle, um, which is in a different location. Um, obviously we have gone through the process with the larger music festival with C3 Presents. And I appreciate that with this, there's an, a lot more info. There's a map included. It's 3000 people over the two days instead of 40,000, but there's also, like the parking is just going to be on city streets. Um, and my main issue actually is that in the process of learning about um, the festival, I found out that there's some infrastructure underneath the part of the park where they are suggesting that this event be held. So um, I actually didn't get any of this information until this morning. <laughs> so I scrambled to get in touch with Brad Roland, um, the engineer for the city, and he let me know that there's a variety of infrastructure under the park in that specific area, including a 60 inch pipe 
three rows of 14 foot wide box culverts, which are 450 feet long each, and electrical conduit running end to end of the conduits that are only 36 inches below the ground surface. Um, and so he had some concerns also about four foot poles being dug into the ground. So I guess I would just say that's something for y'all to look into. I did just send that to you, but because I've been scrambling to get this information, I did not get it to your emails earlier, but it is in your inboxes. Um, and mostly what I want to say is that this is just another example, I think, of where it would really benefit you all to do the work to really figure out policies, procedures, and permitting application processes around what event, events to hold um, and how to use public space for profit and what that looks like. Obviously, this is a much smaller event, but it's still an instance of a public park being used for a profit. Um, it's a smaller space, so it's much easier, but I just hope that you'll do that work. And I'm not sure how this became- Any second warning. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how this became a consent item um, lumped in with another event, but nobody in the neighborhood knew about this. I don't even know if the council knew about it. We just found out about it. And I think it's really important for there to be transparency and for people to be included in the process. And, um, you know, just to give the information that's needed and make sure that the due diligence is done. Thank you so much. Um, Devin, thank you for your comment. Um, I lost Zoom there for a little bit, but I think I'm back. So if you would like to speak on Zoom, go ahead and raise your hand. I don't have any hands raised there right now, but it could be because I just got reconnected. But we do have a speaker with us here in Chambers, so we'll hand it over to you, Stephen. Stephen Scharf of Brackett Street. Uh, good time to make a plug that since you're going to be digging in the ground with mechanical means, you should be calling DigSafe, and DigSafe will come out and mark out where uh, significant uh, infrastructure is for you, uh, so that you so that they don't hit it. So the I, I I would and I would hope that the city would not require the uh, event organizer to do it, but the city would do it itself. Even on your own property, you need to call DigSafe. DigSafe is as simple as calling eight one one. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Any other public comment on the uh, consent calendar before the council this evening? Orders 150 and 151. Okay, I do not see anybody. So I'm gonna close public comment and come back to the council please for a motion. So moved. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Ali. And I'm looking to the council for any discussion on these two items, Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a, a Brief question about the information we just found out about. The under, is there anything that the council has to do to avoid? I, I totally want to heed the 811 call. But in terms of, I believe that the venue, the digging just needs to be moved based on the infrastructure that was that we're now aware of. Is there anything that council needs to do with our motion today in that regard? I, I was just trying to pull up the order. That may be more of a question for Michael, but I think that the order doesn't specify, uh, does it specify the location of the of the um, event itself. I was gonna have Andy come up. I know that we have a, I just wanted him to talk a little bit about the process that we have too, since there was a question about that. We do have a pretty extensive process that we go through for each of these events and looking at, at these types of issues. And maybe you could talk about that specifically, Andy, and with regard to this event as well. Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, regarding the dig safe, so with the staking and uh, what's, proposed for Dyer's Flat. It is subject to, to dig safe. So we've been working with the organizers about making sure they go through that process and we're working with them currently about the staking. So that's something that we do manage internally. Um, for all the events that come through and we have roughly 800 or so events that come through our facilities and our parks, um, we have an internal process uh, of working with the organizers, this particular organizer, uh, Portland Ovations, we work with very closely at Merrill Auditorium. They're one of our prime tenants. But when an application comes forward, we meet once a month with different city departments, uh, parking, business licensing, police, fire, um, and others to go through and evaluate whether this is going to be done safely, um, whether uh, what the impact will be, um, so from everything from a small scale event to a large scale, like that's brought forward. So there is a pretty thorough process that we go through to analyze and determine whether this is something that we want to bring forward to council. So we go through that process prior. 
Thanks, Sandy. And I would say that these are usually consent items that are before the council. Um, and I do think I'm just looking at the order. I don't want to speak for Michael, but it looks like um, we've identified specifically in the order that the area where the um, festival would be would be that Dyer's flat area, which I think is the area that's being referenced. Is that correct? So it would, I mean, are you comfortable with the materials you've been for? presented that that's the location that um, will work best for this and you've talked with staff and yeah we, we've we've discussed with staff and with the the organizers on on the best location it, if there is a problem with the dig safe we, we would have to reevaluate is is this required to do tonight can we look at that and have that done and bring it back to the council uh for for the city i, I think absolutely i would i would ask the organizer if that's doable Get him on the mic. Yeah, thank you for stepping forward. Council, hi. I'm Eric Hager from Portland Ovations. I'm the production manager there. We have a window closing for uh, announcement and public relations and ticket sales, but obviously we will. We don't want to drive a stake into an electrical conduit, so we will uh, defer to council's decision and advice. Thank you. Oh, cut back to you, Councilor Rodriguez. I don't have a follow-up question, but I want to hear. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fournier. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just curious about process because uh, I know we obviously had a very big decision about um, the concert that was being brought forward to Payson Park and it seemed like there was a lot of public engagement in that process. And I'm wondering how this particular incident differs because it feels like for, I don't know if it's on the promoter, it's their responsibility to engage with the neighborhood organizations or the abutters in this case um, where, it seems like this is another pretty big event. And as we heard from the public, there you know, feels like there's a lack of engagement from their perspective. So if, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about who, whose responsibility is it to engage with the people that are around where this is gonna be happening so that they're, they feel like they're a part of that decision-making process. Uh, Thank you. Typically, we, we ask the organizer to reach out and, and provide outreach to, to the neighborhood and, and to the areas that will be impacted. Um, this compared to the last festival declaration we brought forward is, is very different. The reason this is coming in front of council is because of the duration, um, not because of the size. So the size of it itself um, with a number of attendees, that's typically handled internally. Um, and, and we can inform uh, different, different groups uh, in the area and of these events that, that are happening. But again, there are you know, close to 800 events that we're managing. So the outreach is challenging. Um, so for the larger, more impactful ones, we certainly do our best to engage, uh, but we do ask organizers to do that. Um, so considering this one is closer to maybe 3000 people, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, how many other events do we have at Payson Park that are about the same size that are happening this year? Uh, well, it's it's 750 people per performance, so it won't be 3,000 people at one time. Okay. Um, so, so in scale, it is a little bit smaller. Um, but I don't think we've brought anything. Uh, I don't think we've brought anything to Pace and Park outside of a a road race um, that needed council approval. So, I think there's a new interest in Pace and Park, which is great, and and okay. we're very supportive of that. Um, so, we're starting to see more inquiries come in. Okay. Um, but nothing to the, to the scale. Last question. Um, I certainly also hear the concern about parking. I live near Payson Park and parking is challenging when we were back in Little League days and that's 50 people. So thinking about multiplying that multiple times, is there something within their packet that talks about parking impact or how parking mitigation would happen? There is not space <laughs> for that many cars in that area, especially considering the construction that's down there. Um, so I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that. So I know organizers are reaching out to uh, local churches and Shepherds High School and, and trying to mitigate the parking challenges. Also in the advertising and in the marketing, it is encouraging people to walk, use the trail, carpool, um, doing everything they can to, to uh, mitigate the parking challenges that could arise. Uh, but we work very closely on what's available and and make strong recommendations on on parking plans that are presented. Thank you. Other questions or discussion from the council on either item, Councillor Dion. 
I don't I don't remember who made the public comment, but I thought the person uh, brought up the correct topic when we were discussing the major well the initiative that would have brought a significant concert to Payson Park. One of the uh, final conversations centered on this notion that the licensing scheme should be revisited. I I looked at it at that time and really the language and the intent was for something a little bit greater than a significant family gathering and everything that goes along with that. And it's nothing against parks, but I mean, they're, they're kind of stuck trying to approve things with language and standards that probably are not as current as we would like them to do. So I guess this is a comment and a question of the chair. I, I don't know if this is an item for consideration by the executive reporting back to us or whether it should be a question that goes, and I could be wrong on jurisdiction to public safety as a licensing question uh, to determine that I, I take the advice of the, the interim manager at this point. But I think before we're presented with other questions or proposals, we ought to take a look, see at that particular ordinance as a possible candidate for revision. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. And I'll look to the city manager for discussion of where that licensing language review could live. Yeah, I, so that's chapter 19 is my recollection and it's about festivals. It is uh, rather old. We have tweaked it a couple of times. I know we had language that specifically probably 15, 20 years ago that addressed First Amendment events and so on. So it's been a little while since we've looked at it. Um, there are specific triggers. We do have processes in place, which Andy just described, but we're happy to look at that again and talk about that a little bit more. Um, when I think about where it would live, I guess public safety makes sense, I think, but I'm I, I'm not sure if that was the first committee that jumped to my mind, but um we, we can make sure, I, I'll just say that we'll put a pin in it. I'm, in fact, as we're talking right now, I'm emailing staff and, and we'll have that uh, on our radar screen and, and hope to bring that back to some council committee to review very shortly. Thank you, Madam Manager. Thank you for that comment, I appreciate it. Other discussion from the council? Okay. Seeing none, so we've got this consent calendar before us. I think we're ready to vote, but we do have a flag on the issue of um, licensing language so that as we make our way through these decisions, we're comfortable that that's as up-to-date as can be. So we'll keep our eye on that, but we'll move on this that's before us this evening and we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Orders 150 and 151 both pass unanimously. And now we head into licenses. Will the clerk please read order 152? Order 152, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of citrus. Application is for a class A lounge with indoor entertainment and outdoor dining on private property located at one city, one city center, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Uh, thank you. Is there any public comment on order 152? Okay, we do have a hand up on Zoom and uh, I'm probably not gonna get this name right because it's all one word in lowercase, but Blaine Tully. Yeah, I think they can. Yeah, yeah uh, I am Mark Olson, the owner of One City Wine Academy in Citrus. And I just wanted to uh, point out uh, one thing uh, that is that this is not a new business license. We um, actually have been in this space for 10 years um, and uh, this is our third year as Citrus. Uh, we did change our DBA and we're actually just switching away from a class A restaurant to a class A lounge um, because while we wanted to sell food, the people just wanted to dance. So um, we've had to change uh, the style of license, but this is actually not a new license, but just a change um, of, of class. And with that in mind, um, I spoke with um, Tom Williams, the health inspector, and he said he did not need to do a new health inspection. However, because it is technically a new style of license, um, we have been contacted by the grease trap people. And so I would love to um, ask City Hall, uh, first, to, first point is to clarify that this is not a new license, but that we've been here for a while. And then secondly, to um, ask City Hall to um, do as Tom Williams with Health has suggested and not allow us to go through the 
uh, grease trap inspection process. Again, we did less than $1,000 in food sales last year, and that's why we're changing our license. Thank you. Okay, thank you for being here, and thank you for that comment. Um, before we meet, move into it, is there any other public comment on Order 152? Neither on Zoom or in chamber, so I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. Second. Councilor Ali with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. And we move into council discussion. Um, I think I just want to turn to the city manager and ask when uh, new is a characterization of different, I think, in this cat this circumstance. So I just wanted to clarify and uh, sort of mark what the owner uh, talked about. Yeah, I think that's correct. I'm not sure if Zach or um, Jessica Hanscom are on the Zoom link. Are either one of you? Got Zach with us. Zach, could you weigh in on that? Uh, sorry for the glare. That's all right. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, a, a change of classification is a new license, and it says it in the description that the establishment currently holds a class one FSC, um, and it is so it's a change. Thanks, Zach. So yes, it is. It's just a. It's due to the fact that it is a change. Great. Thank you for the clarification. Any other council discussion on this license before we vote? Nope. We're good to go ahead and vote on Order 152. Councilor Fournier just stepped out. Councilor Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Dion. Yes. Councilor Ali. Councilor Zaro. Yes. Councilor Trevaro. Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 152 passes 8-0. And uh, Mr. Olson, thanks so much for being here with us this evening, helping to clarify, and also for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read Order 153? Order 153-22-23, granting municipal officers approval of SARA application is for a class three and four food service establishment with outdoor dining on public property located at one Monument Square, uh, Suite 103. This is sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there public comment on order 153? Uh, no public comment. I'm Steve. I'm the owner of Sarah. I'm just here in case there's questions. Thanks, Steve. Good to have you here. We'll come back to you if there are. I don't see any hands up on Zoom. So we'll close public comment and I'll come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second. Rodri Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Zaro. And is there any council discussion? Any questions? For Steve? I don't think so, but thanks for being here. Um, we'll go ahead and vote on uh, Order 153. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 153 passes 8 0. Um, Steve, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing business in the city of Portland. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay, uh, moving on. We've got one communication in our um, packet this evening. Uh, will the clerk please read communication 27? Communication 27, 22, 23, regarding staff impl implementation of LD uh, 2003, an act to implement the recommendations of commission to increase housing opportunities in Maine by studying zoning and land use restrictions. This is sponsored by Christine Grimondo, Director of Planning and Urban Development. Great. and. Uh, I look first to you, city manager. Uh, Christine is here. She has a brief presentation. Her um, memo was, was lengthy and she wants to boil it down very quickly for you. I believe she may have one slide to show you, um, but if not, it's just going to be a brief summary of what her memo says. Hi, Christine. Hi, thank you, uh, city manager West and uh, Mayor Snyder and members of the council. That's uh, a great intro. There's a there's a memo in the council's packet, uh, communication regarding LD 2003, uh, and it provides a summary in a few uh, a few different ways. And I'm going to just provide um, uh, I'm going to try and boil that down, uh, what the sort of key points are uh, of that, uh, and I can throw up a slide up uh, of those as well. But I'm going to just talk uh, for a moment. So LD 2003, it was signed by the governor in April 2020, 2022. Uh, and it is uh, aimed at creating housing requirements for municipalities on the topics of residential density, zoning, ADUs, and affordability, uh, among some other things. And Portland has analogous regulations for all of the elements of LD 2003. We meet or exceed these requirements in most cases, and we have many other housing tools and policies beyond the scope of what LD 2003 contemplates. Uh, 
Um, but we we word them differently, we structure them differently because they've been implemented here over over years. Uh, and so for us um, and for this analysis, um, it wasn't it wasn't as simple as just checking a box. Do we do it? Do we do we not? It required a little interpretation uh, and sort of combing through uh, some of the detail of our respective wordings of those. Um, of those requirements. Um, so I would say it's not a matter uh, of the city uh, adopting LD 2003 uh, whole cloth uh, for staff. The exercise is really doing that analysis to see where are there gaps and where do we do need to do some reconciliation for with our land use code uh, to, new, to new state requirements. So the communication in your packet goes at this a, a few different ways. Uh, there's some uh, sort of lengthier commentary on each item, but there's also a table that kind of gives a snapshot by by section uh, of where there's just no issue or where we have uh, maybe partial consistency or not complete consistency. Uh, and then um, and then there's four bullet points at the end that summarizes those. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm just gonna go over those real, real quick. So LD 2003, it has density bonus requirements for zones where multifamily is allowed. We do this uh, in addition to height and other dimensional bonuses, but there is one zone where that's not the case. That's the R6. Uh, so we would need to look at adding uh, bonuses to the R6 uh, as well. Uh, there's a requirement that up to four dwelling units be permitted on residential lots, uh, unbuilt residential lots. Uh, a subset of our low density residential zones do not currently meet this requirements. Uh, this has implications for them. Uh, most of our zones do, and in some cases uh, far exceed uh, four dwelling units uh, per lot. Um, LD 2003 has a requirement that zones not have different dimensional requirements for single family as for multifamily development. Two of our zones uh, have different dimensional requirements. R4 and F R5 uh, have some different standards uh, for whether you're um, uh, single family or multifamily, uh, things like setbacks and minimum lot sizes. Uh, and lastly, ADUs are to have the same dimensional standards as single family dwellings in LD 2003. Uh, this is true citywide, except two island zones have different minimum lot sizes. Uh, for, for ADUs. So we, uh, in future revisions, uh, will look uh, to those standards uh, for bringing those uh, R code and LD 2003 uh, closer together. Uh, there's a couple of substantive points here, but in uh, by and large, uh, we're, uh, we're in a good place with it. Uh, and as part of our recode process, we're looking at all these points about how we're going to implement uh, changes that are uh, keeping LD 2003 uh, in mind. And with that, I don't think a slide of those four points is necessary, but if it helps anyone, I can throw it up, um, but I talked through all of it. So I'll just wrap it there and happy to uh, answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Grimondo, for this communication and for being here this evening. Um, this is a communication, so there's no public comment. It's not a debatable item. There's no action that the council is taking tonight, but if there's any comments or questions from the council, uh, happy, to, happy to put those forward. At this time, Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I uh, I read through the how do you call it uh, the uh, the um, uh, the materials that uh, is shared by us. I also know that um, the housing the legislative committee did uh, uh, supported this. Uh, I think last year, but I wonder if uh, uh, I know our calendars are full and stuff. Uh, staff's plate is full. Is there the possibilities of uh, uh, a workshop down the line? On LD 2003 specifically? Yes. I'll look to the manager for that one. Um, I think, I mean, I will say that my recollection of the calendar in March, April, and May is pretty packed. Um, we could do a uh, circle back with you on um, an update uh, and I'll flag that uh, for sometime in May. Um, we will have, um, Councilor Trevorrow has requested a workshop on affordable housing. Um, that will be coming um, uh, April 3rd. April 3rd. Yeah. And so we may have some discussion about some of these concepts at that time, but um, I'll, I will uh, try to flag that, Councilor, for some time in May. Yeah, because uh, last night when I was going through, I asked myself if uh, the everyday person who owns a property in Portland who may want to do something like this, will they understand all the... Um, um, legislative jargon in it. Yeah. So, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you for the suggestion. 
Christine, I've got a quick question for you. So the my understanding is that the legislation um, is required, uh, co compliance is required by July 1, and your memo is really helpful and very thorough, and there are places in it that um, explain that um, in some cases, not most, but in some, Portland does have some work to be fully consistent or compliant. So I wanted to ask you about that July 1 deadline and um, and how we're, how we're looking at that as a city, uh, knowing how important it is to, to be in compliance. Uh, sure, thank you for that question. Uh, it is July 1, however, um, I will uh, point out there's still rulemaking underway uh, for LD 2003. There's still mm -hmm. a lot of discussion at the state level about exactly how to interpret uh, many of these standards. And so no one has adopted it uh, yet. Um, and, 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 and it's going to be a fairly tight window. And I expect um, maybe too, too tight in some ways um, because there, uh, there's still clarification underway what some of, some of these standards mean. Uh, and that process is not even, that's not wrapped up yet. I expect it, expect it uh, to be wrapped up uh, fairly soon. I would I would expect April, potentially May. Um, it, it would be um, a, a really short window for communities, uh, for, for many, if, if any, to adopt by July 1. So we know that date's out there, um, but I, I'm not overly concerned. One, uh, I think we're in um, very good company. We're also in a very good place. And as I've said, we have, we have basically imp policies implemented uh, that are analogous to LD 2003, except for a few areas. And so we, by the July 1 deadline, I, I think those items will not be on the books yet, but we will be diligently pursuing them. So there will be amendments uh, out by then. We, our approach to some of that interpretation discussion underway um, is uh, to kind of safely uh, sort of make safe interpretations of where we think they're gonna land uh, in some cases. Uh, and to, to actively have uh, regulations as part of uh, some of the amendments will be rolling out uh, by June uh, uh, for uh, recode, recode phase two. We're gonna be uh, rolling out uh, some sort of uh, groups of chapters at a time, and we're gonna pick those up in those first, uh, those first rollouts early summer. And so they'll be actively in review. Uh, I do not think they'll be adopted by July 1, but I don't think they'll be um, negative consequences. There's not going to be sort of an enforcement arm around those around those pieces. And I think the fact that we're uh, actively pursuing implementation uh, to bring us in alignment uh, will uh, will be okay. Uh, and I'm actively talking to uh, to folks uh, with the state about this. Um, and I'll certainly keep uh, the council posted on progress and any other sort of direction or news coming out uh, out from. Uh, from the state on this matter as well. And again, as was mentioned, we'll be speaking uh, about affordable housing in April. And if we have any new news, we're happy to bring that forward too. Thank you very much. Um, spring's gonna be busy for planning, I think. Thanks for bringing up the context of recode phase two and, um, and the fact that that's around the corner as well. So um, any other questions or comments from the council on this communication? Okay, I don't see any, so we'll move on, but with our thanks to Director Grimondo for uh, filling us in this evening and sharing information. Okay, um, so we're gonna move on to resolutions and I'll ask the clerk to please read resolution seven. Resolution 7, 22, 23, adopting the fiscal year 2023, 2024 housing and community development annual action plan, according to appropriations for the community development brought Block Grant Home and Emergency Solutions, grant programs and certifications pertaining thereto, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Thank you, and I understand that we will have uh, Lawson Condry, who is the chair of the Community Development Block Grant Allocation Committee um, with us this evening to offer some context. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. I'm looking for you on Zoom. <laughs> You're here in person. Great, thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Um have some notes. Hi, everyone. Thanks to thank you for serving everyone. Um, I'm Lawson Condry, uh, 213 Auburn Street, North Deering, uh, chair of the Community Development Block Grant Allocation Committee. Um, 
So first, uh, we, the committee, I'll speak on behalf of everyone, uh, want to thank all the many organizations who applied this year uh, and are grateful for all the work they do for and with the city and people of Portland. Uh, there were nine applications for development and six were able to get funding. There were 14 applications for social services and nine were able to get funding. Uh, I just have a couple key points. I know everyone has the letter from us and the city manager. Um, one, uh, we support and agree with how the city manager was able to allocate uh, or reallocate the funds based on how we originally scored and um, scored the uh, applications. Uh, it's largely based um, on our recommendations and given uh, her wide discretion, uh, more organi organizations can now receive funding. Uh, the second key point is for community policing. Um, this is something the committee has recommended before and are glad that city manager was able to make this change or at least recommending this change. Uh, we've highlighted this in the report, um, but I wanna vocalize here that the committee supports community policing and the mission. However, given the need in the city for an array of uh, diverse support services and the fact that those services will only become more in demand, uh, then we need to find more creative solutions to address those problems and issues. Um, we believe it's imperative to provide as much funding as possible to those organizations. So by reallocating the community policing funds away from, from the CDBG overall fund, uh, just makes it for more organizations to get money. Um, so we hope the council agrees. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I know we're going to hear from our interim city manager, Danielle West, but I just want to remind people who are following along with the agenda that um, tonight we have the opportunity here to hear public comment, but we will not be taking action tonight. So just a reminder to the community um, that that's what we're doing tonight. So I'll hand it over to the city manager and then we'll head right into a public hearing. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I want to thank the CDBL committee as well for all their hard work as well as city staff Mary Davis and her team really works extremely closely with the committee and with me to make sure that all of these recommendations get made um, in a timely manner so um, thank you to everybody for all of your hard work um, as Lawson just said I do have more um, discretion than than the committee does and so I was able to take a lot of their recommendations and then also work with staff to try to find some additional funds um, specifically CARES Act funding to help address uh, the significant needs that we see in the social services area. Um, I uh, just would note, I know the council is well aware of this, we talk a lot about all these social service programs pretty regularly. Um, they serve a major issue, one of the council's goals to address homelessness and uh, the housing crisis. So really tried to focus in on that and try to find ways in which to provide funding to um, a variety of organizations that um, the committee uh, just couldn't reach within their limited um, discretion. So um, uh, as Lawson noted, um, the administration and planning um, that basically evens out. So there was no changes there with regard to development activities. Um, I took all of the allocation committee's recommendations and just um, made a switch uh, to fund the Hope House um, they had specifically some waterproofing needs and the Hope House um, serves our asylum seeking population. And so um, thought that was, first of all, the, the amount of money that was available lined right up with what we had and thought that was directly um, connected to all of the different things that we're trying to do with the asylum seeking population in Portland. Um, and then lastly, with regard to uh, the social services um, section you'll see is, as Lawson described as well that I made um, some tweaks to the recommendations mostly to serve to be able to serve more people so moving um, recommending the move of the 150 a thousand for community policing to the general fund um, that is something obviously I'm uh, very connected to and I know that the community um, takes well advantage of and is a great program but I think it's better served in the general fund and so the, that opened up additional monies as well as um, some additional CARES Act funding in the amount of $106,000 and change, and then some Cotton Street uh, proceeds from a sale um, of so that were $20,000. So ultimately that allowed me to provide additional funding 
uh, to fund, fully fund uh, Catholic Charities ILAP program uh, to be able to uh, assist asylum seekers, and also the Catherine Morrill Day Nursery Child Care Voucher Program, which is heavily used. And um, as I think we've heard in the past, that program serves people and helps them uh, a lot of times stay just outside or be able to continue to stay just outside of the homeless um, situation and crisis situation because they do get that assistance through that voucher program. So saw that as a significant need. Um, additionally, we I took some of the Cotton Street money and put it towards the Preble Street Food Program. So all of that allowed us to fund those additional um, programs, as I mentioned. Happy to answer any question. And, and as the mayor said, we won't be voting on this until our next meeting on April 10th, but we'll be taking public comment both evenings and um, either night, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for that. So, um, like I said, we will head into the public comment. If you'd like to comment tonight, that's great. You can hold your comment until next week. We ask that you don't comment on both nights. Um, so either tonight or on April 10th. And I know the clerk is going to be keeping track of folks who have the opportunity to speak tonight, something we do during the budget process. Um, to ensure that people have as much opportunity to comment as possible, but not um, two times. Um, so anybody in chambers want to come forward to talk about um, resolution seven? I have a hand up on Zoom, so I'll head right over there. Victoria Morales, you've got the you've got the floor. Thank you very much, Mayor Schneider, City Manager West, City Councilors and staff. My name is Victoria Morales. I'm the Executive Director at Quality Housing Coalition. And QHC is extremely grateful for the recommendations made by the CDBG Allocation Committee, City Manager West and staff to support Project Home Trust, which is a guaranteed income pilot program, the first in Maine, to provide direct cash assistance to low-income mother-led households to prevent, to prevent the financial crisis and extreme stress that results when mothers lose benefits such as general assistance, TANF, and SNAP. Project Home Trust is based on a five-year successful guaranteed income program that has demonstrated significant improvements in the participant's ability to pay bills on time by 50, 56%, to have enough money for food by 17%, to have an emergency savings by 48%, and to have health insurance by 25%. Project Home Trust was designed by Project Home Mothers based on their experience with homelessness and housing insecurity and essential needs programs. And it will be led by Peace Mutesi, a former Project Home Mother. I ask you all for your support for this innovative program and I thank you for your service. Thank you very much for your comment and for being with us this evening. Is there any other public comment this evening? Okay, I've got a couple people on Zoom, but nobody in chambers, so we'll focus on Zoom until I see somebody step forward. Uh, go ahead, Andrew Bove. Good evening, Mayor Smiter and members of the council. My name is Andrew Bove, and I'm a social worker at Preble Street. I'm here tonight asking you to support the city manager's recommendations for allocation of the community development block grant funds. We are pleased to see her recommendation for our emergency food programs, as well as many of our trusted partners in homeless services. Preble Street values our longstanding partnership with the City of Portland to help food insecure Portlanders and people experiencing homelessness. And this funding is critical to our ability to continue these efforts in our community. Everyone deserves access to healthy, nutritious food, and these funds ensure this for people in shelters, sleeping outside, or those staying in hotels. We look forward to continuing our collaborative partnership with the City of Portland and many of the other organizations represented here tonight to ensure that everyone in our community is safe, fed, and well cared for. Thank you. Thanks for being here with us tonight. And next we go to Jenny Stasio. Good evening. My name is Jenny Stasio, and I'm the Director of Operations at Through These Doors, which is the Domestic Violence Resource Center in Cumberland County. Um, I want to thank the City Council for funding our project, the CDBG grant, last year um, to bring domestic violence services to the Bayside neighborhood um, and to the committee and the city manager this year for recommending continuation funding. Um, our project to date has served 109 survivors of abuse. These survivors were provided with behavioral health services, emergency services to prevent homelessness, 
food assistance, housing startup services, and emergency shelter services. We found that the survivors of domestic violence accessing our community-based services in the Bayside neighborhood are among the most vulnerable that we serve. These survivors are experiencing a culmination of extreme poverty, homelessness, violence, mental health concerns, and substance use disorders. The services provided through this program are reaching survivors of abuse that we otherwise may not reach due to barriers to accessing services. By bringing our services and supports to the people most in need, we are helping to eliminate barriers to safety. We've seen many successes in the first year of our project and a resounding need for continued advocacy and support. We thank the committee and the city manager for recognizing this and for advocating for the continuation of our work. Thanks so much. Thank you too, and thank you for your comment. Anybody else want to step forward in chambers with regard to resolution seven or on Zoom? Okay, I am going to close the public comment period on resolution seven. I want to thank everybody who did step forward this evening and just remind others that you have another opportunity to um, weigh in on this issue that will be before the council on April 10th for consideration. Well, the clerk, so we're heading into unfinished business. We're going to take three orders. Together, will the clerk please read order 147, 148, and I ask that we take 156, which is relevant to these two other orders. Um, I'm suggesting we take that out of order um, and, and consider it together. So orders 147, 48, and 156, please. Order 147, 22, 23, authorizing general obligation bonds to finance a portion of the city's fiscal year 2024 capital improvement program in the amount not to exceed 17,455,000, sponsored by the Finance Committee, Mark Dion Chair. Order 148, uh, 22, 23, appropriating bond proceeds and other funds in the amount not to exceed 24,530,000 for the city's fiscal year 2024 capital improvement program. And 156, accepting and appropriating a 39,270 donation from the reconstruction of the baseball court on Great Diamond Island, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. I think that's for basketball. Um, right. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. So, what we'll do here is um, uh, we've read all three orders. I'm going to look to Councillor Dion to talk about all three orders. We'll act on them separately. Um, so when we take your public comment, it'll be on any of the three or all, um, but we'll take our votes separately. So just spelling that out for folks. Councilor Dion, I look to you as the chair of the Finance Committee to offer some comments here. Thank you. I'll try to be brief, Madam Mayor. Um, but it's a little bit challenging to be brief with the significance in terms of the issues that a budget addresses. And this is the CIP budget. So I want to begin with just that simple observation. These particular orders deal with allocations that respond to the infrastructure of the city, whether it's equipment, vehicles, um, tools necessary for our city staff to accomplish the service expectations placed upon them uh, by our residents and those who come to Portland for other reasons as well. So I'd like to uh, bear in mind or at least suggest to you that a CIP budget is how we get the job done. It's not necessarily a programmatic budget where we're looking to move forward a particular social policy initiative. This is the hardware of government. This is what makes sure the sidewalks are walkable and streets are plowed. In that light, I'd like to take a moment to uh, publicly appreciate the efforts of Councilors Trevaro and Zaro as members of the committee, um, their inside commentary and their own diligence uh, is reflected in these documents and will also be reflected in the overall operating budget as well. I'd like to thank the interim city manager, Danielle West, and our finance director, Brendan O'Connell. This is a voluminous body of data and requests. Almost $50 million was submitted um, by departments looking to enhance their capacity to serve the citizens of Portland. Uh, we were only able to meet about $10.6 million of those requests, all of them legitimate for the committee working with senior staff, uh, department directors, 
and the executive, we had to call that list down to something that's manageable in this budget cycle. And another point to make about a CIP budget for those who are here today and those watching from another locale is you want to consider infrastructure investments of this nature as a never ending cycle. We review and get comfortable with what we call year one requests and the allocations that flow from that. But frankly, we also look out almost five years as to see where these investments will be realized. I mean, the investment, though minor probably in the grand scale of expenditures, but significant to island residents has to do with recreational facilities. Uh, that's an important piece of how they define community. And that was identified a couple of cycles ago. And finally, we've gotten to a place where their position in the prioritization schedule uh, has succeeded in their funding. We're making significant investments in Congress Square, both in terms of the park, as well as intersection redesign. Uh, we've met 100% of the requests from the school department having to address their capital needs as well. We're meeting challenges confronting the public library in terms of managing their HVAC issues. Uh, none of those are particularly great news stories, but it's actually what keeps the machine of government functioning. And I think the CIP reflects uh, a narrative that isn't always appreciated, that there has been a lot of cooperation between the Board of Education the co-superintendent's office, the executive and this council and trying to meet their financial needs so they can meet the mission of serving our children. Consistent with that is we've made um, appropriation recommendations in this body of requests to address parks, the resources they present for recreation and mental health for our citizens and their families. Uh, we're committed the long-term investment in the playgrounds that support schools. I don't know, that was the best part of me. Going to school was rec time. Um, so I'm committed to that strategy for the long haul for children who may think as I do. I'm looking at my notes here and I, I have sometimes a tendency of speaking too long. So I'm gonna to try to limit that. I want you to also appreciate as um, taxpayers that we spend meetings in the finance committee. The finance committee has private conversations among ourselves as to what those priorities are. The interim city manager has made herself available throughout the process uh, for conversations on specific items and where it fits in her fiscal landscape. Our finance director, I don't believe has any interest in sleeping because he has provided all the background material uh, that we have needed in order to make an informed decision. This isn't a happenstance uh, agreement to what the city managers propose. I think this has been well-informed and well-intentioned action by the committee. And I hope it's uh, ratified this evening by the council. And I'll close with that, Madam Mayor, is I sincerely appreciate, and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of my committee members, um, the voluntary participation by many members of the council as a whole. It's not incumbent on them to attend our meetings, but many have showed, participated vigorously, made their opinions known, both in terms of what they thought was important for the city as a whole and specific, specifically for their districts. So I want you to understand that What's presented here this evening, this 10.6 million, is not the work of three of us, but three of us who received and engaged support and advice from many members of the city organization and among our peers here on the council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councilor Diane, for that thorough um, uh, summary of where we are this evening and the work that the Finance Committee has done. And I also wanna thank you very much for your leadership as chair of that committee. So um, again, we have, I was so enwrapped in what you were saying that I lost my, lost my spot on the agenda, but I'm back. 
Um, we are again at orders 147, 48, and 156. Uh, we've heard from our finance committee chair. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna be looking for public comment on all three items. So feel free to step forward in chambers, raise your hand on Zoom, we'll toggle back and forth. Um, again, uh, you can offer comment on the totality of the CIP budget or something specific. Um, we'll start here in chambers with you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Scharf of um, uh, Bracket Street in Portland. <clears throat> um, I'm a bit confused by the um, counselor's uh, comment that this is a $10 million bud plan because it's actually $10 million in borrowing. The enti entire plan is $24 million. So his uh, description of a $10 million plan is actually incorrect. Uh, but the entire plan is $24 million. Some of it comes from other sources. And that's why, um, you know, um, I have spoken for the last 20 years to the city needing to have a comprehensive committee to, re to review and create a capital improvement plan. It should not be on two staff members and three members of finance committee to review a plan and, and present it to the entire body here. There should be a, a larger committee reviewing this stuff and coming up with a plan for what the city really needs to be doing and figuring out, is this project really make sense? Does this project not make sense? You know, is it somebody's wish list who has a uh, little power over here versus here? And uh, so I would recommend the council really adopt that concept, which I believe is in the city ordinance um, and, and, and um, embedded in the city ordinance. Um, some specific things on the plan um, that uh, sp uh, detail, Congress Square redesign is uh, listed as $700,000, but there's some other couple hundred thousand dollars thrown in there where it says, Oh, the rest of the money is somewhere else. Um, sort of weird how it was all worded there. Made it very complicated, difficult to, to understand where, where the money's flowing. I would like to get a very specific, before you approve this tonight, I would like to get a very specific um, outline of what we are spending to rebuild the entire intersection of Congress Square and the park. So. This references Congress Square, but is this 700 for the park or is it for the entire intersection? And I think it's very important considering the problems the city went through last summer with the contractor uh, who is absolutely incompetent. And this city should never hire that contractor again. 30 second warning. Um, the other issue, uh, uh, things I just wanted to point out is there are two items for $200,000 for pickleball courts. That's pretty expensive for pickleball courts. And they're just rebuilding other, 140,000 of it is converting uh, tennis courts into pickleball courts. It makes no sense if we're spending that much money to do that. Uh, Longfellow and Lysis Playgrounds are getting $450,000 and $80,000. That's time, Stephen. Yeah, yeah, just have one minute. Go ahead. With um, those are in, we, we just put out a bond to rebuild those schools. And part of that bond was supposed to be for uh, the rebuilding of those playgrounds. So I'm not sure why we're bonding, uh, you know, why we're putting them into a separate plan to for this additional stuff when it was already in the bond that we did for those schools. Thank you. And, and the last thing I want to speak to is the restroom pump truck. We spent, we spent, I'm gonna to have to ask you to wrap it up, Stephen. We've spent a, a, a ton of money building these restaurant restrooms around the city and no one figured out that we'd have to actually pump them out on a regular basis. And Thank now you. we're spending $140,000 for a pump truck, which has no clue, it provides no information as to how much it's gonna cost Thank to you. run that pump truck. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hop over to Zoom, Ann Weber. And you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. My there name is Ann Weber. I'm a year-round resident on Great Diamond Island, and I am a member of the City Island Liaison Committee. And I would like to thank um, our district representative, uh, Anna Trevero, 
as well as the Finance Committee for bringing the two projects we have in the, in the CIP to this stage of, of funding. And I ask on behalf of the committee that the full council approve this funding. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else in chambers? And if you would like to speak, just go ahead and step forward. Hi, uh, thank you, Mayor Snyder, City Manager, full council and the Finance Committee. Uh, I'm CJ Oprathaz, I'm the Executive Director of the Friends of Congress Square Park. I'd like to um, obviously encourage the council to support the CIP, CIP funding for the Congress Square redesign. Um, we get well over 30,000 uh, park visits a year of all sorts of people. It's truly a, a public space where we build community, um, not just through the space itself, Uh, but through our programming, we have hundreds of uh, free events every season. Um, a lot of them, you know, actually encouraging people to get to know each other. So it's very active uh, community building space um, and really valuable to the city. Um, but as built, it's not at its best. Uh, it's pretty inaccessible as a space. There's quite a lot of walls. It's not as green as it could be. There's not as much greenery as it could be. Um, and this redesign would really alleviate a lot of those problems and help us do our work a lot better and build the community much better. Um, I also brought some cards from uh, some folks that use the park uh, with their comments I'd like to share. Um, so the prompt is they support the Congress for Redesign because um, it's a great space to be with the community. And it's provided us with a space to connect and support local artists and makers. Um, it is all about community sharing and joy. We need a space that is for us. Uh, the design helps build community, expresses the art community, and will make the space that much more welcoming. Uh, and finally, it's a great space to be with the community, and it has provided us with a space to connect and support. I already read that one. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so on behalf of those folks who use the park uh, and the organization, again, like to um, encourage the council to support the CIP funding for the Congress Square Redesign. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. I appreciate that. Um, and we do have another hand up on Zoom, George Rowe. Uh, George Rowe, um, Hanover Street. Um, the uh, Great Diamond Island, it's not appropriate to uh, bundle that. There was no notice in the agenda to do that as a, as a, a combined item. So I'm going to withhold any comments on that. Um, you have gotten a couple of emails from me on this topic. Um, I just want to say that it's been probably uh, the worst process I have ever seen um, the city charter specifically requires a five-year plan to be before the city council when they're deliberating on this. And there has been no five-year assessment of anything, uh, either at the finance committee level or at this council level tonight. That's a violation of the city charter mandate. And that is actually one of the big things that the charter commission did in 2010 was to try and force this council to confront the fact that we have these enormous hundreds of millions of dollars of backlogs of projects and to try and think multi-year, over five years at least, and make those tough decisions and also realize the, in your face, the opportunity cost of handing your friends candy, which is basically most of what happens in the CIP each year. And I also want to point out that the audit that caused so much attention on the school side was very clear that there is no transparency about the project balances in the CIP funds. There is dozens and dozens of accounts for all these projects that have been building up for years. And you're basically right in this budget robbing Paul to pay Peter to the tune of over $3 million, but you're not telling us what projects were reduced, canceled, or reallocated to allow us to, to be able to steal money from prior CIPs to do that. There's no transparency. There's a lot of things that you guys are happy with. I mean, our city manager and our district five counselor, they, they like to golf. Well, we're spending money on the golf course. So of course they're happy with that. But in terms of actually moving policy forward in our city, there's been virtually no morning. justification. And because somebody else got an extra minute, I'm gonna ask for an extra minute. 
just to conclude my remarks. But what happened here is on January 31st, there was a meeting of the Finance Committee. There was no public comment. Andrew Zaro wasn't even present for that meeting. That the information for that meeting was published the day before. And then a, literally a week later, they voted on it with virtually no time for the public to even digest what was going on. Thank you, that's Mr. Not a, you're at three that's minutes. Not so if you wouldn't process. mind wrapping it up at this point, that's that not would a be process. Appreciated. Thank that you. is that is a snow job. Okay. And I know that we're now in spring as of like two hours ago, but that's a snow job. And you ought to be ashamed that this is how you're conducting this business. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else in chambers who would like to offer comment this evening? And if you if you're here and you're just go ahead and stand forward and I know that you're in line, that would be great. Go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, I'm David LaCase. I live at 80 High Street. Uh, I've been involved with the Congress Square redesign since 2013. When we first met with Jeff Levine, who was the planning director at the time, and Caitlin Cameron, the urban designer, Jeff stated that projects such as this take at least 10 years. Those of us newbies to public projects were shocked and said, how could something so simple take 10 years? Caitlin stated that we should not forget that this was a very unique project as the private sector rarely works jointly with the city on a city owned project. Well, here we are 10 years later. The design and construction drawings actually took over seven years to complete with input from multiple organizations and individuals including WRT, the Parks Department, the Department of Public Works, the Portland Public Arts Committee, Portland Downtown, the PMA, the Friends of Congress Square Park, with your planning department leading it all. I'm sure they will tell you that organizing and focusing this group was a bit like herding cats. However, last year, the intersection rebuild was started and should be completed this year with the park and PMA Plaza scheduled for summer of 2024. The Congress Square Capital Campaign Committee has raised over a million dollars in private money and continues to fundraise for the project and Sarah Z sculpture. This kind of private support for a public project is unprecedented in the city of Portland. I especially would like to thank the city planning department and city staff who have invested hundreds of hours working on this project over the last 10 years. I would also like to thank the city council and the city manager for their past and continued support for this amazing project. It is incredibly exciting to see the completed project in sight. Thank you, and as we say, hope to see you in the square. Thank you very much for your comment. Others in chambers who would like to step forward? to speak to any of these three um, items on the agenda. I don't see any and no more hands up on Zoom. So I'm gonna close public comment and come back to the agenda. And like I said, we'll be handling these um, one at a time. So I'm gonna look for a motion from my colleagues to take up order 147 first. So moved. Second. Councillor Zaro, uh, Councillor Dion with a second from Councillor Zaro. And now we will open it up for Council discussion. Councilor Rodriguez. I meant to look around and see if anyone wanted to go first, but <laughs> my hand just inadvertently went up. That's all right. I'll, I'll kick it off. <clears throat> um, I guess um, I'm going to kind of pick up where some of the public comment um, left us off. Um, is there uh, a five year strategic plan for our SMP process? Is that a global five-year plan, or does each department have their own strategic five-year plan? There is a five-year plan. Brendan is Brendan. Are you on the? Mm -hmm. Yes, I see him. He's ready to to speak to this issue. Earlier today, I just wanted, um, with regard to the comments, we had received some of these comments over the weekend. So we did, as staff, uh, walk through them, uh, have prepared responses, and I did send the link to the council. Um, for that five-year plan. Um, we did discuss it with the finance committee as we always do. And what's in front of you tonight is just that one year, which we're asking you to allocate and authorize, which is required. So I think Brendan can speak to that in a little bit more detail. Um, and I would just add for the record that I'm a golfer, but it's pretty terrible and I don't do it regularly, but thank you, Mr. Rowe for identifying that. 
Over sure, to you, Brendan. Sure. Um, I have answers to a couple of different questions that were raised, but I'll start with uh, just the CIP charter requirements. So we do bring the one-year CIP and also the five-year list of requests and available funding to the Finance Committee each year. I will say of the focus both from the public uh, and from committees typically on that one-year CIP because those are the actions that come in front of the City Council. The City Council cannot bind uh, future councils in regards to specific spending, uh, but we do try and bring the full picture of all the five-year requests. Some of our departments actually do maintain longer-term plans. I know Parks and Rec does a 10. The school department had a 20-year facility study done, but uh, we do try and keep the five-year plan updated, and that does get presented to Finance Committee and posted on uh, the city website. I will say the five-year plan um, is typically brought directly to the committee, and then we do some updates after 6.30 when the audited financials and audited financial information comes out does get posted around June of the formal report, but that represents the final city council approved CIP, which may include amendments to the city manager's recommendations, which are brought forward uh, to the finance committee in the winter. So uh, you can find those reports uh, not only on the finance committee page, but uh, there's a capital improvement plan page as well. And the five-year CIP is posted to the backup of the committee pages. That's I think the other the other question I know I have an answer for prepared. I don't know if anyone else wanted to bring it up was the Congress Square total dollars. I want to get that while I'm talking. Sure, go ahead. Paid. Yep, and then we'll sure. head back to you. Council. So uh, the total uh, square park project is three point three million dollars. The city has provided one point six five million dollars of funding to date, and the Friends of Congress Square Park have come up with nine hundred fifty thousand to date. And there's a remaining delta of seven hundred thousand uh, in next year's CIP. And this year's CIP is proposing seven hundred thousand dollars for the park. There's also an intersection project, and that is a two point six million dollar contract, slightly higher than the original estimate, due in part to some of the delays uh, on the project. And that's why there's an additional $200,000 in this year's capital improvement plan for that intersection to get us to the $2.6 million total with 1 million funded via the State Department of Transportation. So only 1.6 local. Thank you very much, Brendan, for that. And we're back to you, Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Brendan. Always very helpful. I, I was aware of the school's long-term um, CIP plan because I was involved Oh, I was serving when the enrollment and facility studies came out. And, you know, as it was mentioned earlier today, that big um, uh, you know, improvements to the four elementary schools um, was part of a whole bunch of, you know, delayed maintenance and lack of. So I know that there was a lot of effort on their part. And I, I knew that the other departments had a similar long term strategy, but it's good to bring it out here and discuss it. Um, I didn't have anything other specific, but I did want to um, just express gratitude to Brendan. He helped me um, by sharing a whole bunch of information about Riverside Golf Course, um, particularly looking at literally the PL to see exactly how money flows through that um, operation. And, you know, and taking into account both benefit expenses and the uh, debt service from the CIP investments that have happened there over time. And with all that into account, it is still a significant revenue producing or operation for the city where it's putting back into the operating uh, operation budget um, almost half a million dollars every year. Um, and again, it's, it's the improvements that we're putting into the facility are actually going to help facilitate even more of that revenue producing because it's going to help operations um, as well. So I, I totally see how that um, you know, could be perceived by the community as, a, you know, us spending money on a golf course. I think that nothing looks, nothing sounds more privileged than that. But when I look at how it returns money to our operating budget, that is, you know, deeply in need of more revenue sources. Um, I see as that's a, you know, a, an investment worth making, and it has been over the years. Um, for the record, I only go out into the Riverside Golf Course to go sledding with my kid. My kid's 14, so that doesn't even happen anymore. So I don't even use the facility. <laughs> Um, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Other questions, discussion from the Councillor, Councillor Dion? Thank you. I, I'm overjoyed at the thought that somebody would put the words golf and my name in the same sentence. <laughs> I, I labor with a fantasy that one day when I get to the course, they'll ask me not to leave. 
They have a job for me specifically trying to prove to the rest of the world that I'm as great as I think I am in my mind. <laughs> so it's likely that'll never happen, but it's a wonderful dream. I, I only wanted the microphone for a moment, Madam Mayor, because I do want to respond to Mr. Scharf. Uh, I want to thank him for correcting the record. Um, maybe he'll agree with me or not, but in my mind throughout the CIP, I focus on how much we have to borrow because in my mind, it's how much do we get to pay back? So the number I referred to as the CIP budget uh, was incorrectly stated by myself. And I just want to put that out there. Another piece of evidence that I'm human. But um, thank you, Stephen, for correcting the record for those that were watching, uh, because I, I have confidence in the conversations I've had through the process uh, with the manager's office, as well as our finance director, that there was adequate funds from other sources that would underwrite the expenses that are outlined in the CIP budget. But to me, the CIP bonding process is akin to using a government's equivalent of a credit card. So that's something I try to pay attention to because most credit cards that I've met demand payment at some time. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Scharf. Thank you, Councillor Dion. Other discussion from the council? Um, I, I'm going to be happy to support uh, these uh, orders this, this evening. And I, I did want to just circle back and say that um, the five-year plan is something that's required in our charter. And I think it's something that we're all very mindful of. And so we get that opportunity to look at the five-year plan and then recognize that each year is calibrated based on how needs get prioritized over the course of any given year. And that can happen because an HVAC system goes down or a, a, any number of systems fail or we've made a decision to um, you know, increase investments in sidewalk plowing um, uh, capacity. So I think the five-year plan is really important. It's the place where we can flag things and being nimble in the annual review of the CIP, of course, is um, critical as well. And um, so, uh, so just wanted to say that I have, I have every confidence that we're all very aware of that and Kind of bugging the manager all year long about what's coming up. Is this going to be able to be realized this coming year? If not, why? So, you know, the more discussion, the better throughout the year. It's not the needs in, in a city like Portland um, don't get looked at once and then we, we turn our attention away for the next 11 months or 10 months. We, we contemplate them all the time and um, try to try to balance it as well um, because it is kind of the workhorse investments. Some of them are just we have to make them and others of them may be investments in park facilities and um, recreation and and um, and those are important too to a community. So um, I did also I just wanted to follow up um, on the Congress Square um, question. I know it's something that is um, valued by our community and um, we've made significant investment in this um, this both the park and the intersection. And so as folks in the community have asked me about that um, and the city's commitment, um, it's true that we, um, you know, we've made, as, as was mentioned um, before by our finance director, we've made significant investments both as a city, but also as a, um, a friends group, which is such a, an incredible value that we've got in the city of Portland when people come um, to our parks and fundraise and do work to support those spaces that are used for so many things. So thank you to uh, those of you who are here tonight, who I know work really hard to bring assets to bear. Um, Brendan, just a clarifying question for me. There's 700,000 in the um, order that we're looking at tonight uh, for the Congress Square redesign. In your explanation a little bit earlier, were you saying that we would see that number again next year? Or when you said next year, did you mean FY24? Uh, so there's another $700,000 in our five-year CIP in next year's CIP budget. Okay, thanks and for again, the clarification. Like, we, we don't guarantee future funding, but no, because we've committed so much to data, that's likely going to be in the list of recommendations. Okay, thank you. I just wanted clarification there for future councils and um, and that recognition that the the long term planning that's been done, as was mentioned before, the ten year um, uh, plan and working together is um, 
you know, it, it does stretch over time and over years. So that's all for my questions. Other discussion or questions from counselors? Councillor Phillips. I was really trying not to bring this up tonight because um, it just, well, once you hear it, um, I'm really concerned about the clock at Congress Square Park. Isn't that the park that we're talking mm -hmm. about? And I mean, I, it seems silly, but <clears throat> for me being from Portland um, and having the, um, um, the, what is it called? The railroad, you know, the building on St. John Street, having that um, be demolished and not having that in our history um, is something, seriously, I, I don't struggle with it every day, um, but I do think about it because it could have been a serious monument. Um, and we, we tore that down. Uh, and so now I'm in total support of the Congress Square Park and what we need to do to revitalize it. But I don't want us to just take this clock and put it somewhere because we don't know where else to put it. Um, because that to me is also part of Congress Square Park. Um, and I, I just wasn't gonna bring it up because it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal because it's just a clock. Um, but for me, being from Portland, it really does have some significance for me in the city. So I don't know what we can do with the clock. I know that I trust the friends of Congress Square's Park to work with the developer to figure out where it goes or whatever. Um, and I just, I just don't want us to put it somewhere and leave it because it does hold some significance and history, some serious history in the city. Thank you for your comment. I was just going to speak to that, Councillor Phillips. That's very much on staff's mind. I know Kathy Alves, our facilities director, is very focused on that. And so we've been talking about ways in which to make sure that that's preserved and where to put that. So it's very much on our radar screen. So I appreciate that comment. Okay. Any other discussion on Order 147, which is before the council for a vote? Uh, Councillor Fournier? Thank you. Just a quick question uh, for Brendan and also a lot of gratitude to my colleagues. Um, I'm no longer on the finance committee. I've moved over to health and human services and public safety, but it is <laughs> a ton of work. So thank you so much for showing up and doing that. Um, just relative to the Congress Square Park, I I would be remiss if I didn't say something because I just keep hearing these numbers. And number one, I'm wondering, have we spent this much on any of the other parks in our city? This is a very specific square in the middle of the city. And I'm thinking we've had so many different discussions about equity in parks. And now we're spending millions of dollars on one park when we've been fighting about getting parks in other spaces. And so my question, and I, I don't know if Brendan has this for this evening, but have we spent this much on any other park and knowing that there's still another $700,000 to go. And when we just had our, uh, our budget meeting last week and we're talking about struggling in so many other areas. It just, for me, it's very hard to just not say anything when we are saying we're committed to equity, we're committed to housing, we're committed to health um, and public health for our community. This just does not feel like an equitable investment to me. So um, I appreciate that there has been a ton of engagement with the community to try and get these funds um, to make this happen. That doesn't to me mean that we, we should be on the hook for the rest of it. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it with that, but that's my question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Brendan, can you offer any insights there? So in recent history, we have not funded parks, any specific park at that level. I think, you know, when you look at some of the larger parks where there's multiple things like ball fields, a playground, tennis courts, uh, we might be approaching that over a, a much longer period of time, but certainly uh, nowhere close to that level of investment at one park uh, in, in a single or even over a few CIP years. Thank you. Councillor Ali. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank uh, staff and my, everybody's comments. Uh, I just want to uh, say a few things. I wasn't going to say anything, but I don't know if that will be helpful to some of the comments uh, my colleague made about uh, equitable. I think uh, 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 until recently, I walk everywhere and sometimes I take the bus or Councillor Rodriguez gives me a right. Uh, 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 but uh, I think in all the parks that we have in Portland, I think uh, with the exception of the, a, a, the East and Waterfront, the uh, Congress Square Park is a place that I've seen uh, many different people from different parts of the city of Portland. Uh, I've gone to, uh, even though I don't know how to dance, I've gone to uh, 
Latinx dance uh, there. I've been there with uh, uh, immigrant groups. I've been there on uh, uh, Juneteenth. I've been there for several things. I one of the young people that I work with who have moved on, uh, he went to college to learn how to make movies. His first uh, movie festival was at the park. I think he called it a movie at the park. So I think it's a very valuable uh, part of our city where people from different backgrounds gather. So I appreciate those who put the work in. And Councillor, thank you for your uh, comment. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Any other discussion before we act? Councillor Dion? I, I totally respect uh, Councillor Fournier's assertions and descriptions of her concern. Um, I smile meekly at Councillor Phillips' notion that, of course, she's from Portland, which must make me from away. Um, I arrived here in 1972, and for those of us here or watching, Congress Square was the center of all the disarray and disorder of the city. So I, for one, have sat back and watched a decade's evolution of that space to where I think one day it'll be known as an anchor point for Portland, as a hub for how we define ourselves as a community. And then on a more practical level, I just want to get it done. I want to get money allocated so that we see it done. And the critique that we received from the public today about the contractor and otherwise, I'm not gonna dispute that. I think that's more factual than I'd like to embrace. But the bottom line is, sometimes we just need to get it done. And that's why I endorsed it in my role on this committee. And I hope to see it through with the appropriate votes this evening and in the future. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Diane, and I think that, um, you know, as my I, the, I asked my question because I wanted to just be clear: what are we doing tonight? What may come before a future council? So we do have one um, one action on that. Well, we have we have the whole body of work before us tonight. So, um, Councillor Trevaro, I'm sorry if I've left you hanging. Um, sometimes I am not as focused on Zoom as I as I should be, but there you are. So you haven't. I just raised my hand a couple okay. seconds. So. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly weigh in. I think Councillor Dion gave a thorough introduction to this item in the beginning. And so I just wanted to kind of echo those sentiments and that I will be supporting it in whole this evening. I think that staff, as they always do, has done a fantastic job this year in going through all the needs and being able to um, put together a list of what we can meet this year and um, what will best serve our community. Oh, my um, <laughs> screen is doing that funky thing again. It was doing that the other night. So I'm just gonna stop my video. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I also wanted to say with regard to Congress Square, I, I said this during the finance committee discussions. I lived up there for a period of time. I think I moved there in late 2007. And so I kind of followed this um, from, you know, many, you know, that long ago. And there were early designs for the park even before um, the design that we currently have. There was a contest at one point. And, you know, the idea was that at the time it was an underutilized public space. And the thought was that it was underutilized because of its recessed design. And so there was a need to kind of um, bring it back to life and have it be a space for people in that area to come. And um, people were very excited about it. And um, it was one of those many things that um, got put out there to the public and just never really materialized. Um, so I am excited that after all this time, it, it finally is coming to fruition. And I, I do see it as, um, as value added to a diverse, socioeconomically diverse community that lives up there. There are several dense um, low-income housing buildings in that area. And um, this offers public space just steps outside of their door. So um, I am excited. I do understand the concerns raised just about the kind of large sum of money 
um, all allocated in one place. But um, at the same time for this, I, I am really excited to see it go forward. So I'll be supporting that as well as the entire package tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Other discussion before we move to a vote on order 147. I think we're ready to go ahead and do that. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 147 passes unanimously. And next, I'm looking for a motion to approve order 148. So moved. Councilor Dion with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. Is there any council discussion on order 148? I don't see any. We'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 148 also passes unanimously. And lastly, in this um, package of three, I'm looking for a motion to um, approve Order 156. We'll move. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Fournier. Any discussion? on order 156. Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chavarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 156 passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. And so many thanks to city staff, our uh, interim city manager and uh, Director of Finance in particular, but I know all levels of staff and across all departments are working on this. So many, many thanks to City of Portland staff um, to help get us here tonight. Will the clerk please read order 149? Order 149, 22, 23, amendment to zoning map regarding IMB-B, industrial moderate impact on industrial way, sponsored by the planning board, Maggie Stanley chair. Great, and I think we've got the chair of the planning board here uh, with us, Maggie Stanley. Do you wanna offer some comments heading into this order this evening? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, good evening, I'm pleased to present that on January 24th, 2023, the planning board voted six to one, Silk was opposed to recommend the city council adoption of 50 industrial way. LLC's proposed zoning map amendment that would change 50 industrial way and eight adjacent parcels from an IM industrial moderate impact zone to an IMB industrial moderate impact zone. Mm, yep. In its review of the application, the planning board found that the zoning map amendment to the IMB to be consistent with many of the shared goals and objectives expressed in the comprehensive plan, including promoting an economic climate that increases job opportunities and economic well being valuing and nurturing Portland-based businesses and supporting industries with high growth slash high value potential, creating an economic prosperity by growing Portland's tax and employment base, and supporting economic vitality by ensuring the efficient movement of goods, services, and people. The board felt that the IMB is an appropriate zone for the subject area and would add appropriate density and bulk to lots that are currently built out with industrial buildings, allowing for future expansions or enlargements of existing businesses. Over the course of the review, the board requested that planning staff consider expanding the IMB zone to encompass more lots than originally proposed. However, after staff analysis and further board deliberation concerning the existing built compacts, impervious surface ratios, and geography of the Dole Brook urban impaired stream watershed, the board ultimately agreed that the IMB zone should be expanded to encompass adjacent smaller, more intensely developed lots and to exclude the larger lots, which could still be, which could still expand on the existing IM zone. In conclusion, the planning board voted 6-1 to recommend the city council adoption of 50 industrial way LLC's proposed zoning map amendment. Thank you. And I think um, Christine Germano and Kevin Kraft are also here. Excellent, thank you so much. So all three of you are here uh, for questions that may arise, but um, at this moment with that um, uh, summary presentation offered from the chair of the planning board, I'd like to see if there's any public comment on order 149. Okay, I don't see anybody stepping forward in chambers, but I do have a few hands up on Zoom. So we'll first go to Kylie Mason. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor, City Council members, and City staff. My name is Kylie Mason from Sebago Technics. Uh, I represent the Allagash application uh, that 
that began this process. Um, I just wanted to state that we've been very appreciative working with the city staff. They've been uh, phenomenal to work with in advancing the application. Additionally, our time with the planning board was um, very productive, uh, and we really appreciate their support. This approval for the amendment will enable Allagash and other landowners to improve their developments uh, for the next decade at least. And it's a very important expansion potential for Allagash uh, and strengthens their ties with the community in Portland. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your comment. Anyone in chambers wanna step forward to offer comment on this order 149? Seeing none, I'll head back to Zoom. Sean Diffley. Uh, good evening, Mayor Schneider, City Council, and uh, members of city staff. <clears throat> My name is Sean Diffley. I'm the engineering director at Ali Ash Brewing Company. I'd like to back up uh, Kylie's comments and just offer a quick word of appreciation to the planning board and city planning staff for helping us get it, this amendment put forward here today. Um, as Kylie mentioned, the passing of this amendment will allow <clears throat> us at Ali Ash to continue to grow here in the city of Portland. Thank you again. Thank you for your comment. Anybody in chambers? We'll head over to Zoom again, where we've got George Rowe. Uh, George Rowe, uh, West Bayside. Just wanted to highlight, as uh, along with my public comment that I submitted, um, this is exactly why uh, zoning is such a terrible thing in our American society. Um, you all remember that Allegash played a key role in helping uh, the city purchase um, some land uh, next to the Riverton Trolley Park. And one of the big uh, reasons that that was never considered for housing in any serious way by our city and our council and our planning department is that it would have required a, probably would have required a rezoning to build uh, enough housing on that site to be feasible for, especially for like an Avesta, uh, you know, uh, affordable housing developer. And, you know, oh my God, rezoning, that's like so hard to do. Like, how can we even consider that? Like, that's like not something that, you know, we're ready to do. But Allagash just a few months later knocks on your door and is like, hey, I need to rezone this, you know, this factory where we make our beer, even though we're moving to Scarborough and our flagship's going to be over there. We still definitely don't want to move our manufacturing right away. So, you're like, okay, let's do it. And so you do it and that's it, that's it. And the problem is you have to like cover your track. So instead of it being a spot zoning, you have to throw in a few other neighboring properties so it doesn't look like you're just doing a special favor for Allagash. So, but then you get called on that and so you're embarrassed. So you add a couple of extra ones, but then you realize that this is supposed to be like a special area of like wetlands, you know, protection because of the Presumpscot River and Dole Brook. So then you make sure that a lot of small industrial properties, literally just like a few doors down, don't get the same benefit that Allagash does because you're supposedly worried about wetlands. Well, long story short, this is exactly how zoning, especially exclusionary zoning in America works. And you guys do it. You're the ones who make you grease the wheels. You're the ones who actually make this happen. And the powerful get what they need, even if it's kind of expensive and annoying and it takes longer than it should. But 30 second warning. Everybody else who doesn't have the money, doesn't have the power, doesn't have the connections, they get shut out. They sleep on a tent on a sidewalk or in a public park before the police come and kick them out. Uh, they move to Wyndham, they move to Florida. Um, if they don't get a, a lottery ticket through the subsidized housing wait list, they just go somewhere else. Some of them even go to Canada. That's America. And you guys are the ones guarding the system. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment on order 149? Okay, I don't see any, so I'll close public comment. I'm gonna come back to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second. Councillor Fournier with a second from Councillor Zaro. And I would like to remind folks that we do have resources. We have people here from both the planning committee and the planning board. So uh, if there's any questions during council discussion, 
we definitely have the opportunity to have questions answered. Any discussion? I don't see any. I think we're ready to go ahead and vote on Order 149. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Bradbury? Yes. Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 149 passes unanimously. And we will move on in our agenda to the orders section. Will the clerk please read Order 154? Order 154, 22, 23, approving the Home American Rescue Plan Allocation Plan sponsored by the Housing and Economic Development Committee, Councilor Pius Ali, Chair. And I'll head over to Councilor Ali, who is the chair of that committee, for uh, some context here. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I think this is something that a, uh, the Housing Committee does uh, once every year. Uh, and uh, Mary might be somewhere out there on virtually to speak to it. She's actually right there. Oh, she's there here. In oh, person. Mary. Over to you, Mary. Thanks for being here, Mary. Thank you. Good evening, counselors. I'm Mary Davis, the interim director of the city's housing and economic development department. Um, Councilor Ali made reference to a program that you're probably familiar with, our home program, which we receive funding from the US Department of Urban Development every year. Um, this is slightly different from that. Um, through the American Rescue Plan Act, um, funding was allocated to uh, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development for this particular program called Home ARP. Um, Entitlement jurisdictions like the city of Portland were, were given an allocation um, of this funding. And there were very specific um, rules, qualifying populations, eligible activities that were associated with this funding. Um, very different from our usual home program. I would also note that because we are part of the Cumberland County Home Consortium, this funding is um, available for projects throughout Cumberland County. And we worked very closely with the Cumberland County Community Development staff to um, create this plan. Um, as I said, uh, the home ARP funding is very different from the regular home program. And there were uh, a lot of different requirements as far as um, outreach and collaboration in order to create the plan that's in front of you. So we had meetings very specifically um, with social service providers, um, other interested community members. We participated in um, outreach meetings that Maine Housing held with um, the COC, uh, statewide social service providers, housing developers, um, so there was a very robust outreach uh, program for creating this plan. Um, the city received uh, just under 3.6 million. I should stop saying city. The Cumberland County Home Consortium received just under 3.6 million. Um, in collaboration with the county, um, we um, are recommending that the funding um, not use the allocation formula that was within our um, home program, but that we make this funding available countywide um, so that we can hopefully facilitate greater impacts. Um, very specific populations are eligible for this funding. The funding is to be used to address the need for homelessness assistance and supportive services. Um, it can be used in a variety of different ways um, to develop and support of affordable housing tenant-based rental assistance, provision of supportive services, and acquisition and development of non-congregate shelter units. The qualifying individuals or families that are eligible for this assistance are homeless, um, as is defined under the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, um, families or individuals at risk of homelessness, um, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, um, and parts uh, and, and or are part of other populations where providing supportive services or assistance would prevent a family's homelessness or would serve those 
with the greatest risk of housing instability. In addition, um, the last qualifying population is veterans and families that include a veteran. Um, so in our plan, we took those um, four er eligible areas or types of activities, um, and we made some recommendations about um, what we thought based on the community input that we received, what would be the best use of those funds. Um, so the plan before you um, is recommending uh, funding in the supportive, service, ser supportive services category um, of 763,755, um, acquisition and development of non-congregate shelters for 250,000, and development of affordable rental housing at just over $2 million. Again, um, the plan isn't recommending specific projects, it's recommending funding in these categories and um, the Cumberland County commissioners have approved the plan. Once um, it's approved here at the city, it'll be submitted to HUD. Once HUD approves the plan, we intend to release um, requests for proposals um, for the use of the funding. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that um, that summary, Mary. It's really thorough. We appreciate you being here. Before I go to the council for discussion and questions, I'd like to take public comment on Order 154. Anybody in chambers who would like to step forward? Um, and I think George, I, I see George Rowe on Zoom. It might be his third. Great, okay. Just, just wanted to make sure that you knew, uh, George, but go ahead. Uh, George Rowe, West Bayside. Um, just wanted to highlight, um, you know, two thirds of this money is uh, likely to go towards uh, potential housing development opportunities. And uh, just wanted to make it clear that, um, you know, there's very few actual places where this kind of development can occur in Cumberland County. Um, you know, community after community have really shut down uh, either through uh, a short-term moratorium or, you know, some some version of, of basically zoning out poor people. Um, they have made it virtually impossible for this money to really be put to much good use in, in the short term. And that is, you know, that's the reality. So, you know, it's a shame that, I mean, if you actually scroll through this and, and if somebody actually took the time to actually open the, the, uh, the backup material, there's just an enormously long, you know, bureaucratic uh, slug of, of paper uh, exhaustively talking about all of the work, <laughs> uh, and it was busy work, that went into creating this quote unquote plan. And it really comes down to at the end of the day, uh, whether middle class and mostly upper middle class people in Cumberland County are going to allow more neighbors near them? And the answer is no. Uh, you've shown, this council has shown it, I mean, supposedly the most diverse, most progressive city council um, in, uh, in the city's history. Um, and you're deathly afraid of making uh, any move that upsets the neighbors, whether it's a music festival or a shelter or affordable housing uh, you know, complex. Um, we literally are scheduling a quote unquote celebration for the opening of a 208 bed homeless shelter on the outskirts of our city next to a suburban propane distribution tank farm, next to a scrap metal yard, next to a waste management dumpster facility, next to a tree cutting uh, uh, chipping yard. That's not a celebration. That's a complete and total failure. 30 second warning. Of everything that people in this city claim to be champions of. It's exclusion. It's, I don't care who you are, just don't get close to me. And you're not allowed to live near me if I think you're gonna bother me. And the solution is right now to hand over most of Bayside to Port Properties, which is fine. We'll, Bayside's always been welcoming Thank to housing. Thank you for your comment, George. But that's where we're at. 
Uh, any other public comment on order 154? Okay, oops. <laughs> Not on Zoom either. Okay, I'm gonna close public comment, come back to the council for a motion, please. So moved. Second. second. Councillor Rodriguez with a second from, I believe it was Councillor Zaro. I hope I got that right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And now we have the opportunity to have some council discussion. If there are any questions, uh, Director Davis is here. Any questions, comments, discussion? I will happily be supporting this this evening. I think that the, um, it is a long memo in the, in the backup. Um, I think it's 40 some pages, um, but lots of times that's what's required when there's government, um, that uh, not only city government, but working together with county government uh, in response to a federal program. So thank you for that, that work and um, making our way through there is really informative. And I would say that the home, the home American Rescue Plan al allocation plan aligns perfectly with the council's goals. Um, and it's not just, as Mary said, it's not just focused on the city of Portland, it's focused on Cumberland County. And I think that's, um, that's good and meaningful work uh, when we think about making investments um, in, in housing and response to homelessness. So happy to support this tonight. I see no hands up from my colleagues. So we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 154 passes unanimously. We're going to take um, Order 155, but I did want to just note that um, we're going to take a little bit of a break uh, after 155 and before we head into the public hearing uh, period associated with Order 157 and the work that that will entail. I just want to give, we didn't have any turnaround time between executive session and the council meeting, so I want to give people a chance to stretch their legs um, after this and then we'll come back. So will the clerk please read Order 155. Order 155-2223, approving the rules of the rent board sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. And I'll go to you, Danielle. I'm not sure if the chair, Elliot Simpson, is he available? Oh, there he is. I didn't know if you had uh, some comments you wanted to provide on these rules specifically prior to uh, public comment. Yeah. So we prepared rules, uh, the new ordinance that was passed in November 2022 required city council approval of some of our rules, procedures, and forms that are used. So that's what is before the council this evening. The rules of the rent board, which is how we, the board operates. The new maintenance and net operating income uh, worksheet, which is the basis of the new ordinance for evaluating rent increases. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I would just note also that um, we're requesting that this be passed as an emergency. Um, that's due to the fact that uh, these uh, need to be passed immediately so that they can go into effect prior to, I think it's, um, the deadline's coming right up. What is it, Michael, you March quoted me? Yeah, March 22nd. So we need to get that in place as soon as possible. Great, um, thank you so much, um, Chair Simpson, for being here with us this evening. We appreciate you being available for questions. Um, and so before I look to the council for a motion and some discussion here, we'll see if there's any uh, public comment on order 155 in front of the council this evening. Hello, Hi. Uh, my name is Buddy Moore. I live uh, at 95 Welch Street. I just want to speak in favor of the maintenance of net operating income uh, methodology that the rent board is proposing. Um, it is the gold standard for determining a fair return for landlords under almost every rent stabilization ordinance in the country. Um, and the board has worked really hard on this. Um, and I just want to offer my support for it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We'll go to Matt Walker, who's on Zoom. Uh, hello, I'm Matt Walker. I live at 655 Congress Street. Um, I also just want to say that I think the MNOI is a good thing for the rent board to be doing. So I'm really glad that this is getting done. And I want to thank the city manager for uh, getting this through as an emergency order on time. Uh, and just the last thing I want to say is thanks to the rent board. It's a ton of work and I see all the effort y'all put into it. And uh, I recognize it and appreciate you. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else who would like to speak to order 155? Okay. 
Seeing none, I'll close public comment on order 155 and come back to the council for a motion, please. Move to pass, it's an emergency. Second. Well done, Councillor Rodriguez. I appreciate the inclusive language with the emergency passage and Councillor Zaro with the second. Is there any discussion <laughs> before I say, oh, 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 sorry, 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 hold on, let's go back. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well done. Any discussion from the council on order 155? Councilor Dion. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the work the rent board did. Thank you. I, I actually read the rules. I read the ordinance more than once over the weekend. And then I took a look at the uh, MNOI. I guess there's a future for accountants and lawyers. Mm. Okay, it's pretty detailed. And I think it may be an appropriate instrument for assessing what some would refer to as corporate landlords. Um, I think they should be subjected to that kind of scrutiny. I don't have a problem with that. But my only comment to the board is consideration, much like the IRS did. You know, there was the old 1040. Then they developed the 1040 easy that people could understand. I mean, I read this over a couple of times because I wasn't really clear what was being asked of me. So I think for landlords who own a couple of buildings, they're not really big business. They've made investments over a couple of decades. This could be pretty challenging, all right? So I, I'm gonna vote for it so we can move the process along so that you can exercise your responsibilities as a red board. But sincerely, trust me, there are folks that are going to be intimidated by that instrument. And they might, it might not be so for those who are landlords that actually have legal counsel on retainer. That'll just be a billable experience for them. But for a, loss of, a lot of land persons that I know, especially if they're getting on in their years, this is going to be really tough. So I just want to put that on the record. It's, it's real important to me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dion. I think Chair Simpson, if you wouldn't mind stepping forward, I was, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what's in our packet and it's a significant amount of information that you're asking for from landlords. So what degree of help do you have to offer people who might have, uh, you know, a few units and would need help filling out this form? Um, I think the Councillor's concern is one that I have expressed and I think other members of the board have expressed with the way that the ordinance was written. The maintenance and net operating income refers to a pretty specific methodology. And, you know, based on conversations we've had with the Corporation Council's office, this seems to be, when you look at a lot of other cities, there are no simplified versions that don't take into consideration so many factors. Uh, based on the research I've done, there are cities that their ordinances are written that allow for certain simplifications for small landlords or for increases under a certain percentage. Unfortunately, with the way that this new ordinance is written, we don't believe that we have that uh, flexibility to alter that maintenance and that operating income methodology that is called for in the ordinance. If So I, I mean, I personally would support having it simplified, but I think just given the, given the way that the ordinance is written, uh, our hands are somewhat tied there. Mm -hmm. In regard to help, the Housing Safety Office is doing the best that they can to support the rent board in reviewing these applications. I'm hoping that after we get a few that maybe we can revise the application to still be in compliance with the ordinance, but simplify it as much as possible. Uh, one of the well-known downsides of the maintenance and operating income methodology is the complexity and time-consuming nature of it. And to say that it is a you know, necessitates accountants and lawyers is very much the case in a lot of uh, localities that have these sorts of uh, methodologies in place. So, yeah, it's not uh, a simple methodology. Thank you. I appreciate that. Councillor Dion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your uh, candor in assessing that instrument. And I would like to pose a question to the Corporation Council. Are we to understand that the chair's analysis of uh, 
our inability to modify that form is correct? The, uh, the language in the new, um, uh, the, the, the recent changes to the, to the, to the rent control ordinance um, do have pretty specific requirements about this particular uh, form of analysis, the MNOI analysis. Um, and they also state that, that the board has to adopt rules that are, as, as the chair said, um, that are um, essentially, I'm just looking at the language, similar to, the, to what um, other towns have done th that have similar ordinances. Um, they haven't tried to reinvent the wheel here, um, but that, that form was reviewed and approved by the, by the board. Um, it's consistent with the language in the new ordinance, which was approved at the, um, by referendum last fall. Um, and it unfortunately says what it says. Uh, whether or not there's some flexibility down the road to create a simpler form, I don't know that, that it, I don't know that it's going to simplify the methodology. The form is complicated because the methodology is complicated. And I think that the, I think that the form, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chair, but I don't, it, you guys didn't create this from scratch. It was a, a form borrowed from another jurisdiction, which is what the which is what the language in the new ordinance uh, advises the board to do. And, and Michael, you th this is subject to the five year rule, right? So the council couldn't amend that ordinance provision to change the requirement. Correct. It's subject to the five year rule, and yeah, won't can't be changed unless um, it, unless it was to go back out uh, for uh, a vote. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And the reason I asked and his, his explanation is very clear. When I first started reading this, I said, I'm going to go to council and move for a division. I was going to tear off the form rule and see if we could modify it, because I think there's a whole class of landlords that are ill served by this, or at least could be intimidated by doing it correctly that I thought it was worth exploring, but the more that I read it, I came to a conclusion, I have to live with it. That's why I was posing it to the chair as to whether or not he could take action with his body to at least provide an alternative form that would arrive at somewhat similar outcomes in terms of reliability to assess what, I guess, the base rent would be and other such factors. I, I mean, I, I guess I would say at, you know, at some point down the road, I know that the, the you know, the board is under uh, significant time constraints to get these rules done. There wasn't a lot of time between the effective date of the of the new co the new ordinance and when these rules had to be in place. Um, whether or not there's some ability to come back and get approval for, uh, you know, another form in the future, as long as it's consistent with the language in the in the ordinance, that would be fine. But but changing the ordinance itself, as the city manager said, is um, would require um, not only action by um, by the council, but also a uh, uh, a vote of the or an election of the voters. Thank you, Corporation Council. Thank you, Mr. Well, Chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilor uh, Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to I want to just kind of speak a little bit of what Councilor Dunn just said. Um, you know, from ten from the ten forty to ten forty EC, and then if I can add another layer, then there's TurboTax, right, which completely changes the way that questions are framed, and it's supposed to be helpful, but it's really not. <laughs> TurboTax, especially if you're running a, a business and you have difficulty in, in figuring out your expenses. So I do believe that efforts to simplify complex applications, of such as tax preparation documents, is not necessarily um, as effective as 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 we think it is. Um, and I'm saying that just from my experience of when I've had to file my taxes and as I include my, my overhead expenses and cost of goods sold for my business, I've, you know, I've, I prefer to go straight to my Schedule C form instead of going to TurboTax. It's, it's just the government has actually made that simpler. <laughs> um, so to speak to the application itself, I agree that it, it seems to be asking for a significant amount of information. However, as with any business, having a solid understanding of how your operating expenses um, are breaking down is ultimately how you're going to stay in business. So businesses that tend to, to not do well 
Um, when we look at their numbers, often we see a poor calculation of operating expenses, which makes them then have to uh, artificially or you know inflate their overall prices because they're trying to chase this like net profit that you know it's never there because they're just not calculating their operating expenses correctly. So asking somebody who is making housing a business or their their business um, to have accurate accounting of their operating expenses is actually a way to support them as as an entrepreneur. Right, because you do need to have accurate accounting of all your expenses. So, I, as as a, as as anybody that's uh, you know running their own their own business or or doing their own accounting, um, you know, I would expect them to have accuracy in the in their operating expenses, regardless. But I I, I don't want to pretend that this uh, application is simple, and uh, all you have to do is plug in your PNL numbers here. Um, so I just wanted to say that that I, I while cumbersome, I do think that it is appropriate. And it's uh, it's beneficial to the landlords themselves just to have accurate information on their operation. And that's all I have. Thank you, Councillor. I have a question for you, Chair Simpson. I think on the heels of that. So I appreciate that um, that commentary. That you know, the more information you have, the more organized the information is, the better poised a business is to succeed. Um, and we have lots of folks who own properties in Portland with many many units. But I'm wondering about the person who might own a two unit. Um, uh, who works full time, maybe has a family, um, but has these two units of housing that they rent out. So it's not their business per se. Um, it it is is of course a business, but it's sort of in in addition to their um, you know their work and their life. And I'm just wondering to the to the extent that you have a sense of this, can you talk at all about the different kind of landlords that we have and how this interface works for the smaller ones? Um, yeah, thank you for your question, Madam Mayor. I I think you bring up a concern that I myself and others on the board have expressed with the ordinance. Um, I, my reading of the ordinance is I don't see a way to simplify it too much, but I think that there are a number of, you know, smaller landlords in Portland who may only have a few units who would wish to utilize this process. Uh, one thing I will state is that not all, the only landlords who are going to be using this form are the ones who are trying to achieve a rental increase that is above the automatically allowable. So we don't really have a prediction for how many we'll see, but if it's the historic you know, trends of the board, we get a few per month. Um, so if more would like to use this, then yes, and smaller landlords could, you know, it is asking for a lot of information. Uh, one thing I will say is that the board works a lot with the housing safety office who ends up being on the hook for answering a lot of the questions from landlords and they can provide feedback to the board on things that can be done to improve the form. So, and I'll continue to work with the corporation council's office on any you know revisions that we can make that are still compliant with the ordinance after we get some experience with how this will work for Portland. Uh, one of the last things that I'll say is that a lot of the cities that have these maintenance of maintenance and net operating income methodologies have staff, professional staff that are dedicated to these sort of things. In Portland, this entire infrastructure is based on volunteers. So it's certainly, that could be an area of difficulty for applicants, but I won't get too much into that, but I think hopefully that addresses some of your concerns. That helps, thank you. Other questions, discussion from the council before we move to a vote here? Um, uh, I, I want to say thank you to, to you and to others who serve on the rent board in that volunteer capacity. We know that you're putting in a lot of time and bringing your own um, context and personal expertise to the table. So um, I think we hear you that um, there's a volunteer role and then there's a paid professional staff role. And I want to acknowledge how much work you all are doing as volunteers. Thank you. And I think we're ready to go ahead and vote on uh, these, uh, to, to pass these as an emergency, Order 155. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 155 passes unanimously. Thank you again for being here. And as mentioned, we're going to take a little bit of a break before we head into Order 157 so that um, people can uh, do whatever you need to do. So let's be, meet back here in 15 minutes. It is now 741. Um, so I will see you at 756.
and I'm on Zoom. Peter, I'm looking at you. Are we good to go? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, we are back. We've got attendees. Uh, we've got folks in chambers. Thank you for being here. We've got one more item on our agenda this evening, um, which is Order 157. So we'll head right in there, and I'll ask the clerk to start us out by reading that order into the uh, record. Order 157-22-23, setting an election date on citizen initiative amendment to the Portland City Code regarding an act to approve tenant protection sponsored by Ashley Rand, City Clerk. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to spell this out a little bit and then we're going to go to public comment. Um, okay. So we've got a couple of things in our um, our agenda back up, back up this evening. We've got um, a citizen initiative, which is an amendment to an ordinance that uh, we had a public hearing on last week um, in response to uh, our, the hearing had to do with setting the public hearing date. Um, so tonight, what we will be doing is having a public hearing um, on the council's work to um, set an election date for a proposed citizen initiative that has been submitted to the clerk's office. In addition to this citizen initiative, we have an amendment to order 157 in our backup materials sponsored by both um, Councillor uh, uh, Phillips and Councillor Trevaro. So that serves as an amendment to order 157. Hope that makes sense. So when we take public comment this evening, we'll be taking public comment on setting an election date for the citizen initiative amendment to the Portland City Code regarding an act to improve tenant protections. And we'll be taking public comment on a proposed competing measure, which acts as an amendment to order 157. I hope that makes sense to folks. The original 147 is setting the election date for uh, the citizen initiative. The amendment to 157 is a possible competing measure that will be uh, teed up for you by Councillor Phillips before we head into our public hearing. So um, we've got, like I said, we've got folks with us here in chambers, people on Zoom. I just remind people to give us your first and last name, either the your address or the neighborhood you live in or the organization that you represent. The city clerk will keep your time to three minutes and give you a 30 second warning. Um, we appreciate hearing from you. Um, and lastly, what I'll say here is in the event that, um, so we've got the, uh, the order setting an election date on the citizen initiative. In the event that an amendment to order 157 were to pass, there would also be a third element on the ballot, which would be the none of the above, which we can of course talk about uh, later. Um, but I think everybody's pretty familiar with, with what all that looks like. So with that, I hope I've made that less confusing, not more confusing. Um, I'll go right to my colleague, Councillor Phillips, to offer her amendment to order 157 and then we'll open it up for public comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I um, <clears throat> let's see. I um, I looked at the um, citizens' initiative, um, and I um, had some concerns um, that we weren't really um, completely looking at tenants' tenants' rights, um, because ultimately our goal here is to look at housing, and it's not just to look at the unhoused. It's not just to look at the homeless, but it's also to look at those folks that are in housing and making sure that those folks are um, being able to afford to stay in their house um, or their apartment um, and uh, making sure that we were being fair um, to them and, and, and getting them to pay their rent um, and staying housed. We also have an obligation to landlords. Right? We also have that obligation. This is not just so, it's just not, it's not a one thing. It's both. And so I really tried to take a look at this and I really tried to put a competing measure together with the help of Councilor Tavaro and with the help of Corporation Council um, to something that um, I think is fair um, to both. And so um, in taking a look at this, I, I've talked to folks on the council about this. I've, I've tried to get some support. I've tried to say, is there something else that we should um, be putting forth. Um, and so I really try to have this be a competing measure from myself and me um, with help and with consideration from the council. Um, and I appreciate Councilor Trevaro 
um, being willing to co-sponsor this with me. Also, basically, I want to put together a competing measure that says a couple of things. One, um, in simple terms, that we uh, increase the banked rent from 10% to 20%. Um, and if somebody is, um, if there's a no cause eviction or a voluntary termination, um, that some, that both the landlord and uh, the uh, tenant agree to that, and we get an affidavit from that stating that that was the case. Um, another one is uh, supply uh, is uh, of the voluntary terms of what it does mean um, to actually have a no cost eviction or um, voluntary termination. And the other one is to increase the, re re the relocation cost um, by $2,000, depending on when you leave. So that's what I'm putting forward. Um, I welcome comments and I welcome comments from both the public and from my colleagues um, on this measure. Thank you, Councillor. And now we will open it up for public comment. So again, if you're with us in chambers, please feel free to step forward, make a line behind the podium so that I know you're here and you wanna speak. Don't wait to stand up. We can keep, keep, keep it rolling and I'll toggle between Chambers and Zoom. So I don't see anybody in Chambers. I'll go straight to Zoom. Rudina, you're up. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, City Councilor and staff. My name is Rudina Gobizi. I live in Portland at 285 Clifton Street. My husband and I have not owned property in Portland for over 40 years. My husband is born and raised in Portland and I'm an immigrant and I've been living in Portland for a long time. We both have been working very hard for every dollar we have. When we first started being landlords, everything was done with a handshake, later on a lease, and the last three years has been very complicated. You'd literally have to be a lawyer in order to keep up with all these legal changes. The lease is not five pages anymore, but 50 pages. Before rent control, we usually did not increase rent to our current tenants, but after they left, we were able to uh, update our property and send, uh, a set our rent to market value. The last three years, this has not been possible. We have to increase rent for our current tenants every year. After they lease, after they leave, we won't be able to update our property because we can't recuperate our losses anymore. We worked very hard to collect signatures from our community to place our proposal to address this on the ballot. We spoke to Portland resident and collected it in the end over 3000 signatures, actually more if we had more time. Today, I found out that there is a competing proposal that did not require collecting signatures. Not sure what this is. Why are certain council members working with and for Ethan Streamling trying to undermine our efforts with a proposal on the 11th hour. The proposed act to improve rent control maintains all tenants protection in the current rent control ordinance approved by Portland voters. The proposal is incredibly narrow in focus and easy to understand by both tenants and housing providers. We have volunteered countless hours to put the risk proposal and the accompanying summary in front of the voters because we believe it is crucial compromise that will help tenants and help Portland. Because without this, we are thinking on selling our, all our properties in Portland. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Please step forward. You can, you can just stand right up to the mic and give us your name. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, Councillors and my esteemed community members. Uh, my name is Leo Hilton. Uh, I live at 3 Salem Street in District 2, and I'm a co-chair of the Maine Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I know we're not speaking to the merits of these proposals this evening, but um, I just want to say rent control works. Um, in our first two years under rent control in Portland, um, we, uh, with the enhanced tenant protections, um, our city has effectively stabilized rent for the first time in decades. Um, it's not perfect, but uh, I think the law's greatest flaws are exhibited in the city's failure to enforce them effectively. Um, the sponsors of this proposal, uh, this ballot question, argue that they can fix our rent control measure um, and ameliorate the housing crisis um, by allowing landlords to further increase rents. If this act is an act to improve tenant protections, the question for me is uh, improve them for whom? Um, it's clear to me that this initiative sponsored by a group of landlords and developers 
is a cynical attempt to uh, improve their own ability to uh, enrich themselves. And I think most relevant tonight is their insistence on deception as a key element of their campaign for such. Um, they masquerade as a grassroots group advocating for tenants' rights, um, calling themselves the Rental Housing Association. Um, and I'd also just like to put forward uh, what is a rental housing association? Uh, the only people providing housing are the uh, my brothers and sisters in the building trades who are building the buildings that we live in and maintaining those buildings. But um, in addition to that, they've titled their uh, question in a way that misrepresents its content um, and included a summary that seems guaranteed to confuse voters as to the actual matter that we're voting on. Uh, last month, uh, I was sick with COVID, went out for my uh, once daily walk, double mask, trying to keep myself away from other people. And uh, I was accosted by a signature collector who um, continued to badger me even after I told them that I was uh, contagious with COVID. Um, I refused to sign their petition, um, and I was a little bit perplexed that they didn't have any um, supporting documentation or full language of the measure while they were collecting my signature. Um, this is all to say, uh, I urge the council to do what seems only reasonable in response to this clear attempt to gut an important provision of a law that was adopted overwhelmingly by the people of Portland um, at two elections with some of the highest turnout we've ever seen at an election um, that historically has some very, very low turnout. Um, and what I'd ask the council is that first, um, you amend the summary language to accurately represent the intent of the question, um, specifically that uh, it will amend, not improve tenant protections, and um, to remove the clearly biased language about discouraging no cause evictions and aligning it with other second cities. warning. Thank you. Um, and second, um, I fully support the competing measure um, sponsored by councillors Phillips and Tavaro. Um, I think that this is important so that Portlanders can use this opportunity at the ballot to vote for something positive, um, make a positive impact in our city that allows us to build a place we can all can live in and not just for the people who own the buildings. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And I do just wanna um, remind folks that what we're taking public comment on tonight is two things, um, setting an election date um, for the citizen initiative and secondly, the amendment that was offered. So if you could narrow your, um, your comment to uh, those two things, that would be helpful. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Zoom, Chris Aceto. Chris Aceto at 12 Pine Street. Um, I wanted to uh, just point out the utter hypocrisy of the idea that when other people, other groups, others, quote, associations that the previous speaker spoke about, uh, when the DSA came in with, with their referendum question, nobody from the council tagged an amendment onto to their uh, amendment questions. But when something, uh, when a citizen's initiative is raised from, quote, a competing group, of the DSA, namely landlords, this association, an amendment is hooked onto it. The, the, it, it seems so hypocritical that when a citizen's initiative is formed in this case, that it can't be put on the ballot. It has to be put on the ballot with modifiers set by the council, but when someone else puts one on, yep, you're good to go. And I would like to ask Councillor uh, Phillips directly, if she did or did not get this information, this amendment, this idea from the former mayor, third place in the last election, Ethan Strimley, because that pollutes the whole process. It's like he's running the council from uh, the Trailway Building, because if it's if it's if it's Regina's idea on her own, fabulous even though it's hypocritical, but I've, you know, so, Mr. So, oh, Mr. Aceto, someone else could, folk, I'm going to, I'm just, I, I was you can try to interrupt the last speaker, but I'm going to interrupt you and I'm going to just make this reminder, please focus your comment on setting an election date and the decision before the council of whether or not to approve uh, an amendment to order 157. So again, I, hey, I well, really didn't want to interrupt okay, the you, previous speaker. You, and I don't love to interrupt speakers, but I'm asking folks to stay as disciplined as you can within the context of public uh, comment. Thank you. Okay, on my time, I'll be as disciplined as I can. The amendment is tagged on to a referendum question where it was never tagged on to referendum questions in the past. It's, it's 
it was never applied to previous citizens initiatives and questions. And part of that amendment is where did the idea for the amendment come from? So I'm very precise on what I'm speaking about. The amendment is polluted by the idea that the person who's initiating the amendment got that amendment for some, from somebody who initiated- 30 second warning. I've, I've, had, I've said everything clear. I'm sure people get my point. I don't have to, have to add to it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Chambers? Hello, my name is Zara Kane. I work full time in Portland's food service sector and I live in Westbrook because I cannot afford Portland's rent. I ride the bus. Southern Maine Landlords Association has gotten a makeover recently. Realizing astutely that public sympathy for landlords is in short supply, they have renamed themselves the Rental Housing Alliance of Southern Maine. When, put it, when you put it that way, it almost sounds like they might be representing renters. They do not. They tell you they are going to improve tenant protections. They are not. This is an act that extends no protections whatsoever to Portland's tenants. Their message to you is that this will only affect the next tenant. Many of you are renters. Think about your own apartment. Think about that mold around the bathtub lining and the ants that come through the floorboard every May. Hi there, sorry, sorry about that. Um, again, hate to interrupt, but really what we're, so the initiative set forth by uh, landlords that is slated for um, action tonight by the council to set the election date, that's gonna be decided by voters. So the content of that is gonna be decided by voters. And so what we're talking about tonight as an action for the council is setting an election date. Um, so that's, we're taking public comment on setting the election date. Again, when, when we talk about the amendment to order 157, we're talking about the possible inclusion of another viewpoint on the ballot. So if you could please keep your comments focused on what we've published in the agenda for public hearing, I'd really appreciate it. Right on. The situation for Portland renters is dire as it is, giving further handouts to the rent um, to the landlords of Portland is again something that will be decided at the ballot box in June. Um, with the <clears throat> and as a resident of Westbrook, I am of course powerless to stop the will of the public. However, supporting Regine um, Councillor Pelletier's competing measure is a means by which the residents of Portland can actually advocate for those their own interests versus being asked to sign away their rights, the mechanisms by which we actually keep the rents down in Portland um, without any means by which to um, advocate for themselves that ballot, that ballot box. It's going to be a low turnout election in June, and we want to give the renters of Portland something positive that they can actually look forward to. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Emily Manter on Zoom. Uh, my name is Emily Manter. I live on Cumberland Ave in District 1 in Portland. Um, I'm speaking in support of adding the competing measure. Um, in early 2021, I moved into an apartment in Portland and learn, learned that the landlord had increased the rent 60% between the previous tenant and myself um, without having made any significant improvements to the unit. Um, as an example, I did a bit of research and I think the oven was from the 80s. Um, so they were not making improvements that they needed to um, pay for. Um, this was an extremely high rent increase that was not allowed under the rent stabilization ordinance that was in effect at the time. I raised the issue with the landlord and copied the housing safety office and the landlord adjusted the rent to be in compliance. However, when my lease expired, the landlord um, did pursue a no cause eviction. Um, I imagine they raised the rent at least 50% for the new tenant rather than the 5% allowed under the ordinance. And I imagine they got away with it. My experience is not unusual these days, unfortunately. And it's clear that extreme rent hikes between tenants is something we need to make more difficult and enforceable, not easier. Um, in my eyes, this is an issue of disincentivizing evictions. Um, so I would support having a, a competing measure on the ballot um, to give folks um, more options because I think that um, 
this this measure needs an alternative um, because it would certainly make things worse. Um, thank you. I am curious about um, the competing measures um, aspects around no cause evictions. Um, I don't quite understand um, what that piece would do, and I'd be curious about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment. Um, just another reminder to folks, come on and step forward. If you're in chambers, you don't have to stand back. You can be at the at the mic, at the ready. Um, please direct your comments to me. Those are part of the council rules. We don't call out individual counselors. Um, so you can direct your comments to me, but we're really not pulling out individual people's names here. Um, thank you uh, for familiarity with the council rules and we'll head to our speaker here in chambers. Uh, hi, my name is Chase Heimbach. Um, I live on Congress Street in District 2. Um, I signed on to this measure because I was lied to by the person collecting signatures. Um, yeah, so I think that we should probably have um, a competing measure and change the language. Um, I'll keep it short. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Jonathan Cully on Zoom. Yes, hi, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jonathan Cully, owner of Redfern Properties. We develop and own apartments um, in Portland. Um, you know, first I'll acknowledge what sort of everyone's saying and, and the council knows we do have an affordable housing crisis locally, regionally, nationally um, that deserves bold solutions, but it's important that they're thoughtful solutions and, and ideally apolitical. It's a shame that housing policy has become um, politicized. And, and I think there's blame to go all around for that. Um, I do think that you should put the uh, the uh, citizen petition ordinance on as soon as possible. I was part of um, the effort to create this petition. Um, I think it should go on soon because um, I, I will sort of reiterate that the petition does not remove or change any protection for existing tenants. It does uh, address what happens when a tenant voluntarily moves out, allowing for a reset of base rent. Um, my concerns about the competing resolution are, are largely process oriented. Um, from my understanding, there's no precedent for the council to offer a competing resolution to a petition uh, proposing ordinance changes. I know the Homeless Services Center, there was a competing resolution, but that's a different situation. Um, there was obviously no competing resolution when the DSA pr proposed rent control in 2020, nor the rent control changes in 2022. Um, and I would say in the past, the council's determined that the voters should decide on the merits of the petition and not muddy the waters or confuse voters with an alternative proposal. And I think that's exactly what this petition, uh, the, the complete, uh, competing resolution would do. Um, my reading of the competing resolution is that it's frankly vague and difficult to interpret and will increase the administrative burden on the city. Uh, well, the citizens initiative will dramatically decrease the administrative burden on the rent, rent board and, and city staff. Um, finally, usually when counts, the council makes housing policy, it's been through a thoughtful and deliberative process, and it usually starts with staff's research and analysis, and then moves to committee for discussions and deliberations before being worthy of consideration by the full council. Um, in this case, it appears that the resolution just surfaced at the very last minute, maybe last week. Um, my understanding is there's been little or no staff input. It certainly didn't originate with staff, and there's no clarity on who wrote the documents and, and what the specific policy goal is that they were trying to target. So. Um, I urge you to reject the competing resolution based on both substance and process. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. In chambers, please. Hi, thank you all. My name is Stacia Brzezinski. I'm on Deering Street. I strongly support the competing measure, and I'm here to speak on that. For myself and the many, many low and income renters in Portland, the search for affordable housing is exhausting, demoralizing, usually unsuccessful, and if you haven't considered this, I'd like you to consider it today entirely unnecessary. I'm speaking now to all in the council as well as the questions authors if you're present. Housing is not optional. It's not a luxury. Shelter is a basic human need and we should respect that unalterable fact and protect it fiercely. I voluntarily moved out of my apartment last year to move in with my partner. That's wonderful. If the person in my current apartment did the same thing before me, that shouldn't mean that I couldn't live there. So, excuse me. I wish that um, the fact that housing is a human right was uncontroversial enough to never make it onto a ballot. Um, and from what we know about how signatures were gathered, there's a good chance it shouldn't. Uh, at the very least, 
Portland voters deserve clear, honest language, but also a functional alternative when this enormous part of their lives, of my life, comes to a vote. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, over to Zoom, Jamie Clark, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Clark. I live at 60 Bra Brackett Street in District 2. I'm here to speak in support of the competing measure and for the change of the summary language to the proposed question. Um, as someone who works in the city at a local grocery store, an essential institution to the city, the city, I've struggled to make rent in the past, in the very recent past, and recently had to change my living arrangements due to rent increases in my old neighborhood. I was lucky to find affordable housing, luckier than a lot of people who live and work in our city. With already high rent in Portland, giving, the landlo giving landlords the ability to raise rent as much as they want after a tenant leaves will hurt those who are already struggling with our city's rent, people who live, work, and contribute to our city. The Act to Improve Tenant Protections is a misleading name, and I urge the council to alter the language and to allow the, um, uh, the competing measure to go through. Um, and that's really all I have to say about it, but thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Hi, my name is Camille Howard. I live on Vesper Street in District 2, and I'm speaking today in support of Councillor Phillips' amendment. I work between 45 and 55 hours each week and can still just barely afford to live here in Portland. And I've had many friends and neighbors be asked to leave their apartment over the years, and I've seen them struggle to find new housing in the city. This has led to a persistent anxiety that for some reason I may have to leave my apartment because the market is already so much more expensive than the rent that I'm paying now. If friends balloon even further in town, it means that I would lose my community and my life here in Portland. I encourage the council to consider how difficult the rental housing market already is for young people trying to start building their financial lives in this city and to change the summary language to reflect how this measure would truly affect the city and tenants who live here and to add the competing measure to the ballot that would truly protect Portland's tenants. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Elizabeth Frazier on Zoom. Good evening, I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Elizabeth Frazier. I live on Commercial Street right here in our lovely city of Portland. I am speaking this evening um, in support of setting the date for the uh, citizen initiative for the uh, earliest possible election date. Uh, and appreciate the council's support of that effort. Um, I am speaking in opposition to um, the effort to do a competing measure for two reasons. One, um, I you know do a lot in housing policy, both you know sort of locally and at the state level. And typically, those types of policies start in the housing committee uh, and are brought forward in a thoughtful and deliberative process. That wasn't the case here. Uh, in fact, I don't believe. Uh, the language has been reviewed by any deliberative body uh, in advance of tonight's hearing. So I would oppose that uh, for that reason, but also because I'm a renter here in Portland as well, uh, have been for about seven, eight years, I've been living in the same building during that period of time. And the landlord actually lives in the building with me, which is very unique. Uh, I live down on Commercial Street, so you can imagine how unusual that is. But um, in the first few years I was here, my rent probably increased 2% per year, maybe 2.5%. I was very happy about it. Since 2020, my rent has increased um, by the maximum every year. And uh, I certainly understand the rationale for it. I, I don't blame the landlord whatsoever. Uh, they had to put in a multi-million dollar window refit project here this year. And I'm sure that was a very expensive project for them. And, and it should certainly be something that they're able to um, recover the value of the property in if and when I, I choose to leave. Uh, so I would say that uh, encourage the council to oppose the competing measure that's been presented and please set the election date as early as you can. And I'm gonna give you back a minute and 12 seconds. Thanks so much. Thanks for your comment. And here in chambers. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council. My name is Grayson Luckner. I'm a state representative in Portland. I reside on Warwick Street. And I'm here to speak in favor of the amendment. I serve on the housing committee uh, at the state of Maine in the legislature. And I also want to apologize on the behalf of the state of Maine because we have not done nearly enough to address the housing crisis that you all are keenly aware that we are mired in and have been mired in for decades. Uh, 
So it's fallen not just to the state, the, the federal government has, has failed as well to provide solutions for housing. And that has forced the city to take action to protect tenants and to protect the notion that housing is a human right, which I believe to my core. Um, so it's not easy. I'm gonna say something that's probably gonna alienate some people behind me. I don't think it's easy to be a landlord in Portland. I think it's much harder to be a tenant in Portland who is facing eviction, who doesn't know where they will end up and if they can keep their jobs, if they can live in this community that we all value so much. Um, so I think that this amendment is well thought out. It's a compromise. Uh, it's going to make it easier to live in this city. And I truly don't believe that many building owners who are providing housing uh, are going to struggle. I think if you look at the market treating our housing as a market, these people are doing just fine. And we have to ask ourselves, you, you folks have to ask yourselves, um, Madam Mayor, that you know what is the most important thing here, providing a livable city for all or allowing a uh, small privileged segment of folks to continue to um, make uh, large profits uh, at the expense of uh, people living here. So um, I'll see the rest of my time and look forward to hearing you all uh, chime in in the housing committee in Augusta. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, next, we go to Madeline on Zoom. Hi. Um, my name is Madeline Mackenbar. I live on Deering Ave in District 3. Um, I'm thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I just also want to include my voice in favor of the competing measure. Um, Portland rents are incredibly high. Um, I have multiple times over the pandemic um, had very unstable housing and Honestly, it almost left our community for New York where I was able to find cheaper places to rent. Um, but so much of my life is tied here that it was important to stay. This is my hometown. Um, this is my community. And um, I think that it would be important to look at the language of the proposed ballot question as well, um, as it's incredibly misleading. And um, That's all I really have to say. I feel like everybody who's been speaking in favor of the competing measure have had really beautiful points to make. And I just wanna reiterate that I am in support of their voices as well and of the competing measure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next in Chambers, that's you, yep. Hi, um, I am Dylan and uh, I live in uh, D2 Grant Street. And uh, I would like to uh, speak out against the uh, misleading language of this uh, and advocate for changing the language to reflect the uh, true spirit of this initiative. Um, this is uh, an amendment and not an improvement. It doesn't specify any improvements and to the protections for tenants. Um, and uh, the, the clearest point of the initiative is to uh, gut rent protections. Um, and uh, all right. So just a reminder, we're setting an election date for the citizen initiative, and then we're talking about the amendment that's being proposed. Mm. Anyway. Um, uh, Okay, um, I lost my spot and now I'm all like, all right. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, the um, language here is, uh, does not, um, uh, it, it, it's the first half of it. Um, it doesn't say anything about uh, the protections um, to tenants and uh, it doesn't say, it just says discourage. It does not say, uh, 
it doesn't specify what disincentivizes uh, landlords from um, uh, evicting their uh, tenants at the end of the year. It doesn't have any solid um, uh, language to uh, to support that. And I don't know uh, why it's um, called an improvement to tenant protections when uh, there's nothing in the language to um, uh, support that. And uh, I every time uh, something like this comes up, um, uh, the young folks all 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 show up because um, we're we're uh, we're we're trying to make it. and um, it, and uh, if we're, um, if we're uh, thirty second warning. Uh, if we're turning off um, what what the spirit of the uh, rent control ordinance is, and um, giving landlords free reign to increase uh, their rents and incentivizes them to. Uh, to discontinue leases and uh, or you know um, not make improvements to properties, you know there okay. is no uh, checks and balances for the for any landlords to be um, genuine uh, in keeping their tenants and all. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, can I have one more minute? Uh, I'll just ask you to wrap up. We've got a lot of folks who are looking to speak. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, it um, it offers no protections to the tenants at all, and just um, uh, yeah, it, it and uh, so yeah, that that's what I wanted to speak against is that um, that how misleading uh, the language is, and how many of those three thousand signatures just saw improved tenant protections and. Um, signed way and uh anyway thank um, you thank you very much for your comment next we'll go back to zoom we've got hadrian hatfield hello um thank you everyone for allowing me to speak today my name is hadrian hatfield and i live at 196 bracket street in district two um i would like to voice my support of an amendment um and adding a competing measure to this citizens initiative um I believe it's necessary to add an amendment despite um, the, the lack of other um, instances of this happening in the past because of the confusing and misleading language of this is the initiative. I am one of the people who signed it and thought that I was um, signing something that would support tenants and only realized later after a great deal of effort and research that that I didn't support it. And I'm not here to talk about, like we're not debating um, whether to support or reject the measure, but um, I I think that it's necessary because to, to add an amendment because the language is misleading. Um, and I support the proposed amendment slash competing measure um, because I believe it offers a reasonable compromise between the existing code and the citizens initiative. And I really appreciate the specificity of the exact things that would change, which I believe are the specificity is what's missing um, from the existing citizens initiative. So um, thank you very much for giving me the time. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Rose Dubois. I live on Morning Street in District 1. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak tonight and why I support the competing measure. This past November, the, voter, the voters of Portland overwhelmingly voted to enact a law that gave many new protections to tenants, including limiting the ability of landlords to excessively raise rents. In precincts with a high concentration of tenants, over 75% of voters voted yes. It should be clear to anyone why this is so incredibly popular with Portland's tenants. Rents already far exceed what many of us are able to afford, and many tenants, including myself, are only a rent raise or two away from no longer being able to live in Portland, having to face leaving our friends, family, and community behind. Giving landlords the ability to raise rent as much as they want on turnovers as this new measure proposes will be devastating to our city and undo key elements of what we just voted on only four months ago. 
Um, anyone who is evicted or needs to find a new place to live for any other reason will find themselves facing rents much higher than they have now. Unlike some of the other residents here tonight, I did not grow up in Portland. For most of my life, I lived in rural and conservative parts of New England, and as a young trans woman, this was an incredibly difficult, isolating experience. I cannot express in words how much leaving that behind and moving here changed my life for the better. The city is a place where I'm able to be myself and have a wonderful queer community. I could not have imagined ever wanting to leave. All that being said, while Portland prides itself on being a welcoming place for queer people, if we can't afford to live here, then no amount of rainbow crosswalks and pride flags and shop windows will amount to anything more than hypocrisy. If Portland wants to remain a safe harbor for queer people, then its housing policy must reflect that commitment. Trans people struggle disproportionately with homelessness due to, due to having a much lower income on average, and higher rents will destroy the city's working class queer community. If this happens, I simply do not know where else I will go. This ballot question by enabling landlords to have unlimited increases on vacancies will make it impossible for young queer kids to move here like I did. Many of them will be trapped in vulnerable and often abusive situations as any vacant apartment in Portland will be prohibitively expensive. I ask the council to support adding a competing measure to the ballot. The original measure claims that it will discourage no fault evictions, but this is simply not true. The proposed competing measure will give voters a choice to actually limit this practice from happening while acting as a compromise and allowing landlords to raise rents when they actually earned it. I also encourage the city council to change the summary language to be more neutral. The current language is misleading and it is only fair that the voters know what they're voting on, unlike what happened when the signatures were collected, which is something that I personally witnessed happening. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. And in particular, I wanna thank the two councilors for sp sponsoring the competing measure. I and Portland's tenants will not forget it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment, Matt Walker on Zoom. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk. My name is Matt Walker. I live at 655 Congress, uh, and I am uh, talking today because I wanna uh, speak in support of Councillor Phillips's competing proposal. Uh, uh, so thank you to Councillors Phillips and Trevorrow. Uh, wow, you got guts, that's pretty cool. Um, I think it's really cool when the councillors wanna step up for the citizens. So specifically, I like this proposal because what it's doing, or this, uh, competing proposal, right? What it's doing is it's specifically targeting the claimed intent of the original proposal, right? So the original proposal talked about incentives for landlords to increase rents on existing tenants. And it talks about discouraging no cause evictions, but nowhere in what they're gonna do is actually gonna do that. So these, the, uh, the counselor's competing proposal targets those concerns that they said they had and come up with and came up with a solution to fix them. And I especially like that the uh, their summary language here is specific. It's got like an A, B, C, D of exactly what it's going to do, right? A, B, C, D, exactly what it's going to do. You can scroll through the, the legal text and that's exactly what it does. When you look at the original language's summary, it, it talks about uh, the incentives and it talks about what it discourages, but it does not talk about what it actually does. What it actually does is says the landlords will just jack up the rent between each tenant and it's going to just break rent control. That's literally what the intent is. So given the circumstance with the signature collections, I think it might be a good idea for the council to take a look at the original summary language too, and just make sure that it's actually talking about what it will exactly do, right? What's, what's it gonna do? And not about what it says its intent is, not about what the incentives or what, the, what it discourages, just what does it do? So I fully support the competing proposal. It's specific in what it's gonna do and it directly addresses what the purported intent of the original proposal was. It's a really incredible piece of work to put out so quick. And I thank you. I really think it's, you've got guts and it's, it's super awesome to see that coming from my city council. So thank you. Good evening, councilors and Madam Mayor. My name is Katie Wilson and I live in District 2 on Hill Street. I am speaking tonight in support of the competing measure. As has been stated time and again this evening, housing in Portland is already cost prohibitive and hard to come by. Portland voters demonstrated in both 2020 and 2022 that they support rent control and want to see housing made more affordable in this city. Councillor Phillips and Councillor Trevorrow have crafted a competing measure that seeks to preserve the core tenants of rent control while concurrently making a compromise with those landlords who are concerned about their ability to increase their rents after a tenant voluntarily vacates their unit. Thank you for your time. I hope you will vote in support of the competing measure. Thank you for your comment. We'll head back to Zoom, Winston Lumpkins. Thank you. 
uh, Meta Mayor and the Portland City Council. For the sake of democracy, it's essential that people understand what they're signing and what they're voting for. I expect the council to provide a clear and neutral description and title for the referenda, as you have done for other referendas in the past. Din disingenuous for an act to improve tenant protections to be called any kind of improvement. Though it is poorly written and confusing, it will create at least a slightly increased motive to coerce tenants to leave their apartments. Existing regulations, in spite of November's election, are not sufficient to protect tenants from being asked to leave so that landlords can raise rent even by 5%. Some of my closest friends have been deeply affected by this in the last few months and are facing an uncertain housing situation because of it. Self-reporting your landlord's wrongdoing simply does not work and cannot work. An act to improve tenant protections, in fact, does nothing to prefer, further prevent the displacement of current tenants and leaves in place the currently insufficient system of self-reporting. It will not improve tenant protections and it will lead to displacement and abuse of Portland's tenant population. This may be the will of the people in June, but we must be aware of what we're voting on. I can't write that description any more than the authors of this petition could, but I trust the council can figure it out with the help of Portland's Corporation Council, whose office I hold in the highest regard. That said, I support the competing measure as I think it is a good idea to allow landlords to fully empty their bank rent increases between tenants. Speaking as a tenant, I have no issue with yearly increases in rent when I know what they're for, as is now the case, and they are limited to 10% per year. Inflation exists after all, but it would be nice if there weren't banked rent hanging over a new tenant's head. Tenants aren't greedy, we're afraid. I will also mention, I think if the legal language of a referendum is under a single page, it should be included on the ballot, as otherwise there is never no point in never having discussed printing it at all. I admit disagreeing with the clerk on that point. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for your comment. Next in chambers. My name is Bobby Cope and I live in Portland at 172 Concord Street. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. My husband and I have been left-leaning Democrats since we first registered to vote in 1972. We own three three-unit buildings in Portland full of wonderful tenants, and we live in half of a duplex and rent the other half to our son and his family. We love our home, and we love having our granddaughter right next door. We have been lifelong Portlanders for almost 70 years. I grew up in an apartment with my grandmother and aunts downstairs. My husband lived downstairs from his grandparents until he was 10. I have never lived in a single family house. We understand why people live in apartments and that has been part of our philosophy as landlords. In the past, I never raised the rents on existing tenants. I have great tenants. I had one tenant for 20 years. I never raised the rent. I only raised it upon a vacancy. Now I raise the rents each year by the percentage allowed in an effort to someday get to market rate if I live long enough. We have treated our tenants fairly and favorably without government intervention. I believe that I represent a typical Portland landlord. I support the language and summary of the proposal which was submitted via the referendum process because I believe it will allow us to continue to provide this housing to our tenants without increasing rents every year. I went door to door, neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, gathering signatures for it. They understood what they were signing and did so with enthusiasm. The proposal I worked for is narrow in focus and easy to understand. It, remain, it maintains all tenant protections in the current rent control ordinance. I support putting it on the June ballot. Conversely, the competing measure is confusing and perhaps deliberately so. This will only make matters worse for tenants and the rental housing supply. If the council wants to bring forth housing policy proposals of such a complex nature, such proposals should be thoroughly analyzed and vetted to the proper city agencies on housing. I ask you to please deny putting the competing rent control proposal on the ballot. It will not serve Portlanders well. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next we go to Zoom, Tyler Matz. Uh, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Uh, hey, folks, my name is Tyler Matz. Uh, I live on Salem Street in District 2. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm speaking out in support of the uh, competing measure. Uh, I'm a blue-collar worker in Maine. 
finding reasonably priced housing in Portland has always been a tremendous challenge. Uh, the problem is that working people are an essential part of any healthy city, and this ballot question and act to improve tenant protections proposes measures that will make our lives even harder. Uh, it's a misleading name, in my opinion, and I urge you to alter the summary language of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next in Chambers. Hello, uh, my name is Wes Pelletier. I live on Crescent Street in the West End. Um, first, I just want to clarify, there is no committee process for competing referendums, so this is the process. Um, we are in it. Um, this referendum question is a cynical attempt by the Southern Maine Landlords Association to undermine the democratic process. Um, but fortunately, our city's charter places checks in the hands of the city council to deal with just these circumstances. Um, so many of these people who signed this petition, perhaps a majority signed because they were told that this would uh, protect tenants and lower rent. I was specifically told um, there's actually two items on the ballot and the, this one was the good one. Um, so is the city council's, additionally, is the city council duty as defined in state law to ensure that ballot language uh, accurately reflects the referendum um, at hand uh, and the language being put forward in this amendment, well, the amendment we heard about, uh, that language should be improved. The, the language right now, as we've heard, uh, very misleading. Regardless, more importantly, uh, the other amendment being put forward tonight is a compromise between the actual impact of the referendum, which is to allow landlords to raise rent um, on turnover, uh, and then what the signatures were telling everyone in any crowd that I was in, uh, which is that this would strengthen tenant protections. Um, this is exactly the sort of situation the uh, the council's power to add a competing measure to the ballot was created to rectify. Uh, and I hope you all take this opportunity to give voters an option this June that reflects more accurately what they were sold. Uh, I'd also like to thank the councilors who put these amendments forward for their labor time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We'll go to Rose Greeley on Zoom. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Rose Greeley and my husband and I currently provide rental housing in Portland. Um, we've been part of the community for 35 years and Portland property owners for 25. For many years, we lived in our apartments alongside our tenants as we improved the buildings. We offered below market rental rates, successfully balanced rent increases with what our tenants could actually pay and made great friends along the way. We provide housing for new Mainers, low income folks and asylum seekers which started as an opportunity to help a community in need of safe and clean housing has become an expensive and baffling effort to meet the city's ever-growing demands on property owners. We're selling the building because balancing our vision with what the city expects is no longer tenable. I'm speaking today for, for three reasons. Setting housing policy should be carefully considered to address the needs of all, and not rush through as part of a political agenda. And I personally worked to gather signatures for the proposed ballot question and found enthusiastic support from every person I spoke with. The act to improve tenant protections is a common sense and narrow fix that maintains all current tenant protections. I strongly support the straightforward act to improve tenant protections and the accompanying summary. I urge you to vote against the very confusing proposed competing measure. And thank you very much for your time and consideration. Uh, thank you for your comment. We'll go next to Chambers. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Councilors. My name is Glenn Gallick and I live on Hill Street in District 2. Um, I'm speaking tonight in support of adding a competing measure to the ballot. Um, I wanna thank Councillor Phillips, Councillor Trevorrow, and all of the staff for working on such short notice to put forward um, what I believe is a well thought out and carefully considered measure on such short notice. Um, I believe this measure strikes a balance between the financial needs of landlords by raising the maximum allowable rent increase in case of voluntary turnover from 10% to 20%. The strengthening of tenant protections uh, by protecting against no-fault evictions and respecting the immense difficulty of enforcing rent control by defining what a voluntary turnover is and outlining a process for landlords to complete should they wish to claim the voluntary turnover rent increase. I am deeply concerned that should the proposed referendum pass, 
Uh, we will see an increase in no-fault evictions, followed by unlimited rent increases, which will go unchallenged and never be walked back. Thank you for your time and careful consideration. Thank you for your comment. Jenna Lutz on Zoom. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Jenna Lutz. I live in Libbytown. Um, I'm speaking tonight to strongly support changing the summary language to the proposed ballot question and adding a competing measure. The title of this ballot question itself is very concerning, let alone its content. The title is intentionally deceptive as this measure will in no way improve tenant protections. It's actually quite the opposite. It serves only to benefit landlords like those who belong to the organization who got this measure on the ballot through misleading campaigning. On the contrary, removing restrictions on rent raises between lease contracts poses a huge threat to housing accessibility for working class folks. Ask any working renter in Portland and they would tell you that renting in the city is already extremely difficult. I've personally witnessed many friends rent being raised multiple times within the span of a few months, despite no real change occurring in the unit to reflect that raised rent. If this ballot measure passes in the election, rental units in the city will become even more unreasonably expensive and price out hardworking people who struggle to keep up with rent and cost of living as it is just to enrich landlords who feign financial struggle. I urge you to alter the deceptive summary language of this initiative and to, to reflect its true impact on tenants and to support adding a competing measure. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And our next speaker is in chambers. Uh, good evening, Mayor Snyder. Uh, you know, I, my name is Rebecca Starr. Uh, I live on Melbourne Street in District 1. Um, as I was standing here, you know, I had something to say all written out, and then everyone in front of me just came forward and said it much better than I could. Um, so for the sake of time, I will just keep it short and say uh, that I support the addition of the competing measure. Um, and I thank Council Member Phillips and uh, Council Member Trevorrow for putting it forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Nori Hilton on Zoom. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Nori Hilton and I live on Belfield Street. I'm speaking tonight in support of changing the summary language to the proposed ballot question and in favor of the competing measure. Portland rents are already prohibitively high, causing a housing crisis in our city. Giving landlords the power to increase rent however much they want on turnovers will only make things worse. Calling this ballot question an act to improve tenant protections is misleading and biased. It does not protect tenants, rather it allows landlords to increase their wealth. I urge you to alter the summary language of this initiative and I support the competing measure. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. You. Next, we're in chambers. Hi, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Sarah Loudon and I live on Park Avenue in District 2. Um, I'm here tonight to urge all councillors to change the summary language of the proposed referendum question, as well as to vote in favor of adding a competing ballot measure to Portland's June ballot. As it currently stands, both the referendum title and act to improve tenant protections and its accompanying summary language are incredibly misleading and are written to intentionally confuse voters. In fact, during their signature collection drive last month, the Southern Maine Landlords Association- Hi there, I'm just gonna to try to redirect you to setting the election date and then the addition of a possible amendment. Uh, the Southern Maine Landlords Association, the group behind this referendum, hired circulators who intentionally misled uh, many Portland voters into signing their petitions. If you could you stick, tonight. please, to the public hearing that was posted. Um, I realize you don't want to, but I'm, I'm trying to get people to stick to the plan, which is we're setting an election date and we've got an amendment to consider. So thanks for, for adjusting maybe a focus on the content of the citizen initiative, which will be decided by voters. It needs to be reiterated that Portland voters decisively cast their ballots in favor of rent control in 2020 and again in 2022 to strengthen those existing tenant protections. Our city's landlords are now trying to trick Portland tenants, as you've heard from multiple signers of the petition, into voting against their own self-interests. Why? It's so these same landlords can continue to profit off of the working class people in the city. As the Portland Press Herald reported just a few weeks ago, the, in the last decade in Portland, we've witnessed an increase in fair market rent prices by 84%. Uh, 
Uh, counselors, I ask you in earnest, how many people do you know whose income has risen 84% over the past 10 years to keep up with such high rental increases? It should come as no surprise that currently between 50 and 70% of tenants in Portland are cost burdened by their monthly rents. And those are the people who are lucky enough to be able to find a place to live in Portland and the people who have not yet been priced out of their homes. An act to improve tenant protections is in fact the opposite of what it claims to be. It is a way for landlords, many of whom do not even reside in Portland. second warning. To continue to line their pockets with profits, it is at its core merely another mechanism for the rich to get richer at the expense of tenants. And if it passes in June, it will only add to Portland's escalating housing crisis. I want to thank the counselors who have already come out in support of a competing measure and to thank those who have already spoken in favor of changing the summer, summary language of this initiative. And I urge all remaining counselors to do the same. Thank you. Harlan Baker on Zoom, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Harlan Baker. I reside at 44 Mitten Street in Portland. I'm asking you to support a competing measure to the uh, petition that you have before you. I'm going to give you the reason why. I was one of the people who were misled into signing the petition. On the evening of February the 10th, I was approached by a young man asking if I would sign his petition on rent control. I asked about the petition and he assured me it was in support of rent control. I mentioned there was a petition going around to- Madam Mayor, point of order. And he assured Thank me- Thank you, Counselor. So not, Harlan, I'm gonna redirect you again I'm to- I'm giving you the reason why I think you should put out a competing measure. And I think you should put out a competing measure because of the-, the um, misleading attempts by the landlord association to get this measure on the ballot that well, is that's helpful context reason. thank you i'm serious i didn't know that you were advocating for the amendment so go ahead thank you you know i really don't like being interrupted i don't interrupt you you shouldn't be interrupting me i've had nothing else i want to say goodbye okay next we'll come to a speaker in chambers Hi, um, my name is Sarah McKee. I'm a realtor here in Portland, and my husband and I own a multi-unit on St. John Street. Uh, the very first time we raised the rent since purchasing the building in 2017 was after rent control was enacted, and our ability to bring our units to market was prohibited. One of our units is a three-bedroom. Our current rent for that unit, unit after a legal rent raise is $1,375. This is nearly $1,000 under what the state defines as affordable housing in Portland. We'd love to keep our current renters in place without raising the rent, but we are simply unable to do so under the current law under rent control. So like many other landlords, we reluctantly raised rent for the first time on our tenants. My husband and I also worked hard on the signature drive. Uh, we worked with 80 volunteers to get this small tweak on the ballot. We made sure they understood the issue and allowed for voters to read the initiative. Every petition had the proposed ordinance attached. In addition, it was confirmed that when the petitions were returned to the city, they were still attached. Uh, we met with gatherers bi-weekly to ensure that things were running smoothly and gather gatherers were able to touch base, express concerns and ask questions. We are proud of our effort. We collected over 3,000 signatures from registered Portland voters, twice the amount required by the city. I have concerns with the last minute amendment, amendment proposed by two city councilors. The amendment does nothing to incentivize landlords to not increase rent under the rent control ordinance. Additionally, it seems out of precedent of previous councilor, councils as competing measures were never added to the myriad of citizens initiatives over the last few election cycles. I feel this competing measure will only confuse voters, and I hope that the council chooses to place an act to improve tenant protections on the ballot without a competing measure. Uh, thank you for your comment. Spencer M on Zoom. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Spencer McFadden, and I live on Washington Avenue in District 5. Uh, I am speaking in support of changing the summary language on the proposed ballot question and in favor of the competing measure. Uh, rents are already uh, ridiculously high. Um, voluntarily uh, raising is one of the common tactics of gentrification. Um, to a city, which would make Portland um, much, much less diverse. Um, calling this ballot question an act to improve uh, tenant protections is straight up lying. Um, and like the uh, signature gathering tactics used, uh, outright deceptive. Uh, they repeat a lot. They, uh, I um, ended up signing. I got a lot of. Uh, the uh, phrasing of rent control uh, repeated to me a lot um, without actually going into it. And I would like people to actually um, be able to afford to live um, in the city. I urge you, uh, all city council members, uh, to alter the summary language of this initiative. And um, I am in favor of the competing measure. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next comment is in Chambers. Hi, my name is Buddy Moore. I live at 95 Wilt Street. I served on the rent board and helped to draft the current rent stabilization ordinance that was passed as question C last November. Uh, in the Portland metro area, I'm likely one of the most qualified individuals to speak about this topic. Portland is a city of tenants with almost 60% of our residents being renters and even more of our community members experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness, we are all existing tenants because we do not have control over our housing. I would encourage counselors to support a competing measure that would truly protect tenants, a reasonable proposal that addresses the concerns of frequent rent increases on incumbent renters while still allowing landlords to obtain a fair return. What the Southern Maine Landlord Association is proposing in contrast to the competing measure is called vacancy decontrol. This was implemented in many California cities at the behest of landlords, resulting in dire consequences for renters. According to several studies, the median rent in these cities doubled under vacancy decontrol. Each time a tenant moves out, that will be one less affordable part apartment in Portland, leading to what researchers call involuntary displacement. This process is a key driver of gentrification and the displacement and replacement of our community members. Despite concerns that landlords are unable to recoup investments and make needed repairs, the law already provides a pathway for them to reasonably increase rent, to recoup capital investments and make needed renovations, all while receiving a fair return on their investment in line with decades of legal and regulatory precedent. This process was approved by the council earlier tonight. The difference between the initiative in question and the law we have now, as well as the competing measure, is simply that the current system requires public oversight over drastic rent increases, while the proposed ordinance does not. This oversight is crucial to protect the interests of the majority of Portland residents. In the midst of this current housing crisis, the first thing we must do is keep the housing we do have as affordable as possible to tenants who make up most of our residents. The SMLA proposal alone would be a step backwards in the wrong direction for Portland. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We'll go to John uh, John on Zoom. Hey there, uh, John Wass, the Tigert Wass. I live on Robert Street uh, in Oakdale neighborhood. And I'm just wanted to um, speak out in support of this competing measure um, to this ballot initiative thing that the uh, landlord association put out there. Um, I myself am starting to have to like look for new housing and dear Lord, is it expensive? Um, and not sure I'm gonna be able to stay in Portland, but I'm also a social worker and a fair number of folks um, that I work with who are low income, live in Portland, have been just in the last year getting displaced. Um, some of the things that landlords have pulled have been blatantly illegal, um, but all of it really points to they were longtime tenants. 
Landlords clearly want market rate. They're pushing them out. Um, so I see this um, competing measure as um, hopefully a step in the right direction um, and away from this astroturfed whatever um, that these people put together. Um, and I also would urge that landlords just sell their buildings and get a real job. Um, and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your comment. Um, it is super hard to try to focus these comments tonight. So I really do appreciate when folks try. Um, I think we're being pretty loose with comment in general. People are passionate. We get that. We like that. That's why we're here. But I really am urging on both sides of the issue, focus on the publicized public hearing for tonight. I think it's just respectful, um, both of you know us and you and, and, and the differing viewpoints. So if we could do our best to focus on the published public hearing content, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. So we'll go to our next speaker in chambers, and then we've got a handful of other folks back on Zoom. I don't, I don't know what that means. What do you want me to do? I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, just just have been reminding that what we published for a public hearing tonight is order 157, 157, which is focused on setting an election date for the citizen initiative. So we're talking about, um, you know, we've heard from some folks, we'd like to see this on the June ballot. That's what's before us tonight. And then we've got a competing measure, an amendment to order 157. And so we're focusing comments on the uh, amendment and people's support or not for that amendment. Okay, so do I say that I'm in support of the amendment? Make it clear. Yes, absolutely. I'm in support of this. But first, if you wouldn't mind giving us your name and neighborhood and thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm sorry, I haven't done this in years. Um, my name is Hawa. I live on Park Ave. Um, I've been a renter for several years. Um, so I'm, I'm here in support of the amendment. Um, like I said, I'm a Portland resident. I've Me and my family have lived here for over 20 years. Um, after college, I decided to stay here because I fell in love with the city you know, like five years in and I, I wanted to stay here. So I was able to find semi-affordable housing that wouldn't put me in debt and I was really lucky. So I immediately signed up. Um, it's been two years since I was able to find it, um, anything like that in numbers. And although I consider myself lucky, I still am at an at-will tenant. Um, and so are the rest of us who uh, are tenants under a certain um, landlord company here in Portland. Um, I actually got a reminder on my way here today that my rent will be going up. It's only going up by $30, which is great, right? Um, I don't have a le lease right now. So like I said, I'm actually like an at-will tenant. Um, right now, legislation is preventing landlords from deciding the price for people like me. Um, being at-will, I could be moved out next month if that's what my lease says. I don't have a lease kind of unprotected here. So I just wanted to give my experience as an example. Um, this is why we need ordinances. I'm no stranger to confusing language. I asked earlier um, about what this meant. The language part is so essential. Um, English is my second language, as you all, uh, some of you all know. Um, and although I would say I'm pretty proficient, when I tried to read more info on this specific measure, I was actually, I left the document more confused than I was starting it. What I did find out though, is that this measure will allow landlords to essentially name their price when a tenant moves out. Why that isn't clear is lost on me. 60% um, 60 60 of people in Portland are Portland renters. I think the person behind me um, said that earlier. We want to stay here. We want to co contribute to the city. We love the city. This isn't a radical leftist group organizing together and showing up to take over Portland politics. These are families like mine who call the city home and want to stay. Please listen to your constituents tonight and please make this language clear. This is your chance to do the right thing. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll go to Damon on Zoom. Good evening. Uh, my name is Damon Yakovlev. I live on Bolton Street in District 3 in a single family home. I'm neither a tenant nor a landlord. I'm speaking to you, to you tonight um, in support of the competing measure and in favor of amending uh, the ballot language before you. Um, and I'll stick, stick to um, process related arguments. Um, I believe that 
the process the collectors used to uh, collect signatures uh, was flawed and muddied the waters in terms of um, creating an impression that the citizen initiative somehow uh, provides something for tenants here, which it clearly does not if it's read. Um, and I, there is a video evidence I'm aware of, of a collector who actually did not provide uh, the ballot language upon request. And I personally witnessed uh, many collectors who mis were mis highly misleading uh, in, in what the initiative uh, actually would do. Um, on the other hand, the competing measure actually does those things uh, that the collectors uh, purported uh, to do, that it would do. So I think in this case, um, the competing measure is, uh, is warranted. Um, you, I, I've heard um, a complaint that um, it would muddy the waters. On, on the contrary, it would provide a, a great deal of clarity here if you were to uh, provide this competing measure, which based on the arguments and the number of signatures that we've heard, um, actually might have a fair amount of support, something that legitimately has something for both landlords and uh, tenants to like in it. So I think it's uh, in the public interest for you to um, both amend um, the ballot language um, advanced by a Southern Maine Landlord Association and their allies, and to uh, add the competing measure to the ballot. So people have, uh, have a choice um, so that they can support something that there clearly is some amount of public support for. Um, and I, I think it's within your power to do that um, in terms of precedent um, that was done recently in 2021, a competing measure was added uh, to a citizen initiative related to homeless service center policies. And um, it also um, the, the uh, 30 second warning, the amendment language was also edited in that case. So it's well within your power to, to edit the language, add a competing measure, and there's also precedent to do that. So thank you all for your time this evening, and I hope you will do so. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else in chambers? Okay, we'll head back to Zoom. Amelia Kelleher. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Amelia Kelleher, and I'm a renter on Grant Street in District 2. And I'm here today to express my support of the measure um, and to clarify the language of the current ballot measure I'm also in favor of adding Councillor Phillips' proposed competing measure to the June ballot. Um, and a study released last Thursday by the National Low Income Housing Coalition found that affordable housing is unavailable for more than half of Maine's poorest renters. And data from 2021 shows that Maine's rental housing market is among the least affordable in the nation, with nearly 60% of extremely low income households spending over 50% of their income on rent. So as a renter who was misled into signing the petition, um, I believe the, the language of the existing measure needs to be clarified. And along with some of my peers who are also misled into signing the petition, I have requested to, I requested to have my name removed from the ballot. And unfortunately, it had already been submitted to city council. Um, but so after conducting additional research on the current measure, I believe that if passed, it would exacerbate the ongoing housing crisis by further increasing prohibitively high rental rates so in short, it just strikes me as very um, undemocratic to put a measure on the ballot that is worded in such a way as to intentionally confuse or sway Portland voters, which is already done. We've heard that from many constituents tonight. So I don't think that's something that you should feel proud of, as um, was said a few uh, minutes ago. But I would urge all councillors here tonight to alter the summary language of the initiative and add the proposed competing measure to the June ballot. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Um, next speaker on Zoom is Ale Alevi. You'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you um, in hopes it works out. Uh, next speaker, Joe. Yes, hi, <clears throat> this is Joe Luciano. I'm a property owner and I uh, rent to 15 um, renters in, in Portland. Um, I purchased a building in 2015 with my family, um, first generation um, American, uh, Italian American. I, I bring that up because I have a, a tenant who's from El Salvador. She's a, a new um, 
uh, a new Mainer and she's got two children and I've been renting to her since 2015. And since then we've worked things out to try to accommodate um, uh, not increasing rent. And unfortunately, as a result of uh, rent con uh, control, I've had to increase rent each year and it's, and it's something that I wish I could avoid, but uh, you know, having not raised rent since 2015, um, has really uh, created a very below market uh, rent for that unit. And so I bring that up because um, if I have the ability to raise to a market rate upon her choosing to, to move out, um, then that would make it much easier for me to uh, maintain the status quo that we started in 2015. And I bring this up because of the fact that adding this amendment that is complicated that many people on both sides of the fence this uh, this evening have, have mentioned how confusing and how convoluted the wording is. The the way that the wording for the initial uh, initiative that was put forth was that we're going to keep all rent controls in place, but upon that person's voluntary leaving of the unit, we can raise rents to a marketable rate. And keeping things simple on a ballot, I think, is crucial because what that allows is somebody to say yes or no. I want to move forward with this. This sounds like a good idea, or I don't. Adding a, 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 an alternative to that makes it very difficult for there to be an affirmative position. And so we put forth a, a proposal so that we could allow market rates to be adjusted upon uh, somebody voluntarily moving out, but it gives us the flexibility to say, hey, listen, you know, things are working out great. I want to keep you as a tenant. You can't afford it more. Okay, we're, we'll work this out. Um, and unfortunately, our hands are tied. We have to, I, you know, it, as I mentioned earlier, need to uh, increase rent each year. So um, nothing more to say other than the fact that I would like to set uh, the June ballot and, uh, you know, the, the earliest ballot and to keep things simple so that it is a yes or a no on the ballot to what was put forth and let the voters decide. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And we'll try again with a levy. So you are permitted to talk on our end, but we need you to unmute yourself. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna move on to Eli. Hi, uh, my name is Eli. I live on Cumberland Ave in Portland, Maine. Um, it came to my attention that the petition I signed that uh, is now what we're speaking about um, completely misled me in the information that was given. I now understand that it would eliminate the 5% cap in rent increase that currently exists on units that are voluntarily left by the tenant. Um, I also want to mention that uh, a couple of the landlords have been mentioning that they've unfortunately had to raise rent um, each year. Um, it is not my understanding that uh, landlords have to raise rent each year and that this would um, help them in not forcing them to raise rent. Um, it is my understanding that this new amendment, which again, I agree has very confusing language and I support um, the clarification of, um, would eliminate the 5% uh, cap and so that great, um, you could bring a, a lower income um, apartment up to market value, but you could also bring a market value one way, uh, way above what it, what it, what it should be. Um, so that being said, um, I'll keep it brief and I urge you to amend the ballot language on this question to remove any language that seemingly promotes um, uh, renters uh, good, goodwill um, and to um, add a competing measure. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And next we'll go to Britt Vitalius. Good evening. Thank you for your time. My name is Britt Vitalius. I'm president of the um, much uh, spoken about Rental Housing Alliance. Um, this is really a, a process question this evening and, um, and, and one we're concerned about. Um, I think it's worth looking at the language. We've heard a lot about housing challenges and um, greedy landlords. But looking at the language, I think the council has to determine whether it warrants and needs a competing measure. 
there is about all of one sentence in the proposed language um, that is that is what's in here. It says, if the tenancy of a covered unit is terminated voluntarily by a tenant, the landlord may establish a new base rent at their discretion. And then it de defines voluntary termination and the rest of it is about um, protecting the tenants. That's all. So I'm not sure what all these charges are about the confusion and then um, the clarity of the um, competing measure. I think the Green New Deal was rather confusing when it was an inclusionary housing bill called the Green New Deal. And what feels like is happening is the DSA and Ethan Strimling are finding a way to get something on the ballot without having to go through the process, uh, the referendum process here in the city. So to the substance Point of- order, Mayor, can we make the, sure he stays on topic, please? I'm sorry. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm, We're asking, I'm just uh, focusing on the content of the public hearing this evening, which is setting the election date for the citizen initiative and the amendment that we have before us in the packet to 157. Understood. I apologize. I was trying to cite the precedent for other titles and other summaries that have been in the past, and this exists within that context. I certainly, the I would like to hear the council explain um, what's going on in the counter proposal and how it's a competing measure against what is really a very simple question. Um, a 20% increase is not a given increase. We've all read this several times over the weekend, and it's very confusing. 20% is a cap of the increase, but that's on top of only what you get is uh, banked rent, 70% of CPI, and only 5% on a turnover. Those things are never going to equal 20%. So I think this is misleading. It's much more complicated. And we'd really like to know where it came from. The referendum process is a challenge in the city. We tried to craft morning. this, thank you, in a very, very narrow way. I hope the council wrestles with the proposal, puts it on the ballot, and sees that there is no need for countermeasure. Anyone who signed anything could easily read the language. It was there. And if it wasn't there, they should not have signed. But the process is important. And anything that comes forward from the council should be clear should have been deliberated. It's coming forward in the council's name. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And thank you for the point of order, um, Councilor Fournier. Okay, uh, Alivi, are you able to, to speak? I am, I think I unmuted myself. Great, you did. Okay, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Alan Levy. I live on Fessenden Street in Portland and I own rental units in South Portland as well as in Portland. And I am speaking in opposition to the competing measure of the referendum initiative. I respect the care and the due diligence that the South Portland City Council engaged in order to put together their rent control policy. While one may agree or disagree with the outcome, what I can say is that the process is good governance. It was unrushed, thoughtful, and stakeholders were considered. Over a two-year period, the city of South Portland developed their rent control policy. I consider this good governance. The city of Portland also has the opportunity to exercise good governance this evening. There are lessons to be learned from the South Portland City Council's rent control process. Please consider the due diligence and the amount of time it took for South Portland to come out with a well-thought-out rent control policy and then please consider the process of how Councillor Phillips and Councillor Trevorrow's competing measure came to be. I am unsure of how much due diligence went into the crafting of their measure. I am unsure if stakeholders were involved. I am unsure of its clarity to tenants or to landlords. The only fact that I am sure of is that this measure was presented publicly this past Sunday at the 11th hour. I am not asking the city councilors to vote for or against this amendment measure based on whether they are for or against rent control. I feel the council should vote against this measure due to its lack of a transparent and thorough process. The city of Portland voters deserve better if they, if they are gonna vote on a measure to amend rent, rent control. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Okay, I want to thank everybody who has offered comment tonight. I'm going to close public comment on order 157.
we've had about 40 speakers both here in chambers and on zoom and again um, a little tricky to keep everybody on course um, but the effort was is really made um, to you know try to try to stick with what we've publicized for a public hearing and be relevant to the order in front of the council for action tonight. Um, so as we get into our discussion, we're gonna need a motion and a second to consider what's before us this evening. Um, so I'm looking for a motion from the council, please. So moved. Is there a second? Second. 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 Councillor Trevaro with the second on Zoom. Thank you. Um, so we will get into uh, council discussion. Um, Councillor Phillips, at the appropriate time, you can go ahead and offer your amendment. Um, I would like to turn to the clerk just because we do have an inclusion in the packet that has to do with um, signature gathering and other elements associated with the clerk's work to support the council's action to set an election date. So if you, I just want to tee you up for that so that can be, um, you know, put put on the record that we've got that memo in the packet and then we'll go to council for discussion. Or do you want to read what I, you can just summarize maybe. Um, so um, on February 16th, the Rental Housing Alliance filed petitions in our office uh, regarding the amendments to the Portland City Court of Ordinances Chapter six, buildings and building regulations. Petitions were titled an act to improve tenant protections. Petitions contained a total of 4,013 signatures for verification. Um, through that process, we validated 3,087 signatures and 926 of them were rejected. The required number of signatures needed to be put on the ballot is 1,500. Um, we did have some uh, complaints about uh, removing signatures, but uh, once petitions are filed, we're not allowed to do so. Um, so uh, they won't, they shouldn't be removed once they're filed in our office. Um, even with those complaints, the amount of signatures that were collected was way more than what was needed to be put on the ballot. Um, during the council meeting on March 6th, the public hearing date was set for this evening, March 20th. Um, the notice of public hearing as well as full text of the ordinance was put into the Portland Press Herald on Friday, March 10th. Um, and then tonight's meeting, council will decide to put the initiative on the ballot for consideration on the June 13th, 2023 election. Under section 9-41A of the Portland City Code, I'm also requesting that the title and summary only be placed on the ballot due to the length of the text. Um, and it's not reasonably possible to reproduce the full text of the initiative on the ballot for June. I appreciate that. Thank you very much um, for sharing that information. And so we've got a motion, we've got a second. I look to the council for discussion. Councillor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just for clarification, we are we are discussing and debating the amendment as well, or primarily. The amendment has been teed up, but not yet offered, or uh, we don't have a motion um, for it. So right now we're in the content of 157. Okay, I'll do a little bit of both, uh, just because I feel like everything is really tied in. Um, well, first of all, thank you everyone for giving comment. I feel like the only time we really see this room as full as it is tonight is when we're discussing referenda. The last time was in August, uh, and a lot of familiar faces are here tonight. Um, I'm just going to take a moment uh, to discuss not the content of what we were talking about tonight so far with the referenda or the competing measure, but rather the process um, that got us here. Um, I think we've come to a point where we can now expect referenda at every election, not just in November, but now in June. Uh, it really doesn't matter uh, if the council is working on it in our committees, uh, even though that's what we were elected to do, um, but we're seeing them come in abundance. Uh, what was once a process that was meant to be the people's veto now feels a little bit weaponized uh, into a back and forth uh, in between elections. And um, it's resulting in uh, enacting policies that are well-intentioned but have unintended consequences. It's putting us in a position of wanting to do the best we can but having our hands tied because we can't change things in the moment. Um, and it's, it's creating situations for city staff where they are not able to, to 
enact the policies themselves. And it's even been shared tonight. So, you know, I personally just want to say I believe it's time for this council to collectively and collaboratively discuss and debate amendments to Chapter 9 and send our recommendations to Portlanders to align our referenda process with the state because this is not working. We are watching people tear each other apart every time they get something on the ballot. And we're going to disappoint whoever, whether it's you're in the room or someone who's watching on Zoom, you're gonna be disappointed because we have very limited capacity in this moment. And so I'm really frustrated because I really wanna help, but I can't. And I know my colleagues likely feel the same. Anyway, I digress. So it's already two, two and a half minutes left. Um, okay, so what I've heard a lot tonight is, I remember in 2022, the Landlord Association, it was a key funder of Enough is Enough a group that was formed to oppose all referenda because they said that the referenda process was being abused. I remember being in this room with all of you or most of you, um, welcome counselor. Um, and I remember we were being told, don't bring a competing measure, let Portlanders vote on it. We were being scolded. We were, if, if we considered that it was gonna be a direct slap in the face of our citizenry, um, let the voters vote it up or down. And I, I agreed with that. And, and now I'm hearing the opposite and I'm feeling a moment of cognitive dissonance because I don't know which one it is. Um, I, I, I wanna thank my colleagues, you know, Councillor Phillips, Councillor Trevorrow um, for engaging on this topic. I believe, you know, I did, I tried something similar last summer by adopting and referring. Um, it didn't work out, but I know how hard it is. And you, you walk away from this meeting feeling pretty bruised and people can be really harsh but it doesn't mean you're not coming from a really good place and you wanna, you wanna do good. And I, I respect you immensely for that, my friend. Um, but you know, I think it's really important for us to pursue what we're passionate about in this. I think that working with members of the community is really important. That being said, it's really important that we do that together. Um, we, we have to do that collaboratively. And the last time this body considered a competing measure was in 2021. It was with the uh, smaller shelters question. And at the time it had been worked on in HHS committee. Um, I expressed my concern with it because I was not on that committee and I didn't wanna put a council approved uh, competing measure uh, out without having a workshop on it. I had to go back and look at that meeting to remind myself of where I fell on that. And um, I can, I I'm having a hard time now and I had a hard time then saying, how can I understand the impacts of what this council was endorsing? 30 second if, warning. If I did, how is that possible? I'm gonna need an extension without, I didn't speak at all tonight. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some of that other time. It's horrible. How am I going to understand something this impactful without having time to dig into it, without having a workshop, without having a dialogue and working together? I received this competing measure on Friday morning. It was three days ago. Many of the people we heard tonight knew more about this before I did. And I spent the weekend reading it, but that puts me in a really uncomfortable spot because I'm supposed to be ready and to, to dive in. And I'm just being really honest with everyone. This, this, we don't get any special access before most other people do. This is just the name of the game. For me, here's where I'm at, and I'm gonna to try to wrap it up really quick. I would really like to see this referred to HEDC so it can get a full analysis from city staff and colleagues on the council. I know that we are in a time crunch here, but there's nothing that says that we can't bring something back for a November ballot uh, that says, you know, because we'd have to put this out for referenda for voters to vote on, um, but this needs more due diligence. I don't want to endorse, and I don't believe endorsing any referenda at this point. Seeing this dueling back and forth, overturning what just had passed is, like I said at the beginning of this, it's unsustainable. It's not how you run a city. Citizens are getting whiplash. They're getting angry. They're getting upset on both sides. And I understand that, but we can't exist in these polar opposite uh, politicized realms. It's, it's not good for any of us. And I want to believe that folks are, are coming from a good place and, and they really wanna see the best for the city, but I'm watching it tear, we're, tear at the fabric of, of what we're doing here at municipal government. Um, so I'm rambling. Um, ultimately, we need to bring landlords and tenants and developers and housing experts together. Seesawing between these questions isn't doing it. So just, just to be clear, I do not like this referendum. I personally will not be supporting it in June. 
I wasn't planning on bringing anything from the floor this evening, as I thought colleagues were also going to tonight with their competing measure bring amend, amending the title, um, because I do think the title is misleading and the council does have an obligation and a responsibility to amend that. Um, I did not prep anything in the packet because I thought it was coming, but I would be open to amending the title of the referenda this evening to be objective and clear. And my understanding is that it, the summary will not be on the ballot, just the title. So we, we potentially wouldn't have to amend the summary. Title and summary. There, I am corrected. Anyway, thank you for letting me go over. So sorry, I'll okay. yield my time. Thank you. <laughs> There's no time to yield, counselors. I will yield <laughs> your time. <laughs> <Rick>. <laughs> <laughs> Okie doke. Uh, thank you for your comments um, and thoughts shared. Councillor Fournier. Thank you so much. And I think what I'm going to say is very much echoes what Councillor Zaro just shared. Um, and so I will try and keep it brief. Um, and so I think my my issue is again more about process. And I appreciate that I had a great chance to chat with Councillor Phillips over the weekend to just talk a little bit through. Um, the content, it's not for me that I disagree with the content of what's in this. I very much agree that a lot of this needs to happen. But I think we also heard from the public that, you know, there is no committee process to be able to talk about referendums. You're right, because we're not supposed to govern by referenda. We have, we're set up to govern through committee, through this deliberative body where we can engage experts on city staff in our corporation council in the community to talk about all of these issues um, and be able to put forward good policy that's going to benefit more than just, again, as uh, Councillor mentioned, Councillor Zaro mentioned, this, this back and forth. And so I think I, I really appreciate the referendum process. I think you need to have um, the, the ability to be able to question the governing body. But again, it feels like we are doing this in every election, nothing has a chance to even get underway or be worked on because now we're in the next election cycle and trying to um, establish what's going uh, to be coming next. And so I think for me, it's it's sort of ironic, <laughs> as Councilor Zero mentioned, that this last election, we had a group very loudly advocating against referendum. And then the next election, they are using that <laughs> as um, their vehicle to move policy. And I just, I feel like this is not productive. Um, it's taking up city staff time. Um, I really believe that, you know, I have been the chair of legislative uh, um, committee and currently I'm the chair of health and human services and public safety and being able to have the ability to bring in experts, have deliberative conversations, be able to ask questions of corporation counsel. I'm very proud of some work we're getting to do on um, pregnancy crisis centers and you know, being able to bring forward that for our city, but it's through conversations that we're having um, with all of these different bodies to be able to, to make good policy um, that will withstand challenge that uh, will be enacted for our city. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit afar too. Um, really bringing it back to say, I I want us to have, um, we know rent controls work, you know, in different municipalities. Um, I really have high respect for um, my fellow sister counselors, uh, Trevorrow and Phillips, um, and appreciate that they brought this forward. I too would love to see it, and I, in my notes, had said I would love to see whether it's a task force or an ad hoc committee or going back to HEDC, the ability to bring together all of these stakeholders to talk about how do we right size this for our city. You know, we've heard from both landlords that have hundreds of units and those that have four and live in one of the four. And so I don't believe it's a one size fits all, but we can't discover that if we only have 48 hours to review very complex housing policy. I'm not a housing policy expert. That's not my job. My job um, is training people how to run for office, you know, who are um, native leaders in their own communities. So I have to be able to talk to experts and have time to deliberate. I need also some downtime over a weekend <laughs> to be able to spend time with my family. And so when we get something on Friday afternoon to have to make such a significant decision, this is not a quick and easy policy. I called Corporation Council this afternoon to try and work through some of my questions as well. And so I don't feel good about putting something on the ballot that I don't have all of my questions answered and having to now talk about this after an entire council meeting, debate this late into the evening. You know, I just don't, 
I don't feel comfortable being able to move this forward. So while I appreciate what the body of it is, and I do want to move these types of things forward, I think there are other avenues that we need to use rather than putting out a competing measure. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. 30 seconds to spare. Um, and you can yield that time. I'll, I'll give it back to <laughs> Councillor Zahn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. Councillor Dion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, let's do it in June. That's the easiest part of the uh, issue tonight. Let's, I vote for June. In terms of the competing measure, I'll vote against it. All right, and I, I spoke with Council Phillips beforehand, and it's really a matter of process. Certain people gathered petitions. How they gathered them, there are venues to deal with that. if They can be proved. But the fact of the matter is certain citizens gathered a petition opposing a question to the public. It's incumbent on the public to become educated. It's almost like we want to make sure they can't get confused. Isn't that said in every single election for every referendum question? My God, if I sense I could lose, they might be confused. If I sense they win, they must have understood everything I've said. Uh, I do agree with my fellow counselors. This journey we've taken into policy by referendum is disastrous. And I tried early in tonight's meeting to give us an illustration of that when I posed questions to the chair of the rental board to see if we could make modifications in something that I sensed he understood was a challenge for some of our constituencies. We, somewhere on the city, recognized a similar challenge. There ain't nothing we can do, right? Because it's a five-year term. That's no way to run government, all right? Somebody says, yes, there was precedent on the shelter initiative a competing measure was put on. After nine years of work in committee, it was clear what was at stake in that particular uh, competing measure. This one here, I learned about uh, vacancy deregulation, all the legal considerations on how to frame an argument for the space between tenants. I wish it was a clearly settled law, and I did read cases, I read articles, I read both sides of the argument, there are many questions and I raised that with Councillor Phillips and she agreed, well, there are other questions to be answered. If that is the case, and I took her at her word, then it's not ready for prime time. Now, would I support that HECD visits this question? Yeah, sure, that, that sounds good tonight. I'll say it's not likely to be effective because we'd be trying to modify the structure of a statute, an ordinance that we can't modify to what, 2025? Am I correct, Corporation Council? 2027, isn't it? Well, it's five years from the, from the election. Right now, we've got um, measures that were passed in 2023. Right. So that's still present. And it's unfortunate that we can't. See, that's the legal opinion. So 2027, it, it remains an immovable beast, right? No matter what good work we do on committee, it's just interesting, but it doesn't change the substance. I think there's more to be said for this council to engage in its work to modify how referendum questions are presented. That might change the atmosphere, but up to this point, I have to honor the efforts made by the parties who brought forward the petition. I don't have an objection uh, to this idea of modifying um, the language. I mean, an act to improve tenant protections. It could be a stretch, okay? It could be a stretch. Now, I will say in fairness, with some of the other material I've read from other parts of the country, there's part of that that fits into their theory of, as to why vacancy deregulation makes sense. So they wouldn't be so quick to chuckle that this title doesn't make sense. But I can understand that the common person might assume something by reading this title. And it goes to my overall theory on referendums. I'll close with that. Is most people just read the titles. That's why this is dangerous. You make, I read one referendum, it was 14 pages long. How many voters really read that? Come on, let's be real with each other now. If we're going to do this kind of work, we need to be real. So that's why I understand 
titles or everything. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dion. First to Councillor Trevaro on Zoom and then next to Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, not sure where to begin. I've, I've, my thoughts have been um, kind of everywhere based on the comments that I've just heard. Um, I think, you know, I was inclined to support this competing measure because I was coming at it from the perspective that it was a compromise between the the desire that we saw as exhibited by the the last referendum, which is now in place, to have um, to have tenants' rights, um, and this the need for landlords to you know recoup rising costs. Um, and there's nothing in the competing measure that gives more rights to tenants than they have currently. Um, it just, the, the major component for me was that it, it kind of um, gave some clarity to by how much uh, rents could be increased annually rather than just kind of to whatever degree if they deem appropriate. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of where we are. I, I'm finding it really unfortunate that the entire debate circulates around processes rather than substance. And my hope was that through the offering of a competing measure, that would be an avenue for us as a community to get to the substance of this issue. Um, you know, the comments from the public largely have have centered around processes and you know intentions and that's really not what we should be talking about we should be talking about you know what's appropriate increase in in rent each year what can tenants afford what can landlords afford um so that's just where where i was coming with this i i don't know that i'm on <laughs> totally on the same page with some of my colleagues regarding the referendum process. I, you know, I, I grew up in Maine and we're a referendum state. And to me, it has always been another check on the balance of powers and it's closer to a direct democracy. And to me, I, I, I like to, even though I'm, I'm on the side of the council now, <laughs> rather than the side of the public, I um, I like to retain the idea that these referenda keep us accountable to the work that we're supposed to be doing um, in terms of how much it's in alignment with the sentiment of the voters. Um, so, you know, I'm open to having those discussions in the future, but I was hoping that we could work with the process we have today to get to the, the sort of question that we need to grapple with. Uh, so, you know, if this were to be, or to be offered as an amendment, I would support it. Um, if it's not, then I suppose, well, here's one question. Do we have the, um, the purview to send this to the November ballot as opposed to the June ballot? Um, if we wanted to go the route of kind of putting this whole subject through committee? I guess that's a question maybe to the clerk or to corporation council. Mm. I'm, I'm looking at them. <laughs> I think we just need a minute there. Good question, counselor. We can come back to it if you want a no, little uh, more time. Well, the, the, there is language in, in, the, uh, in section 939, the time of the election, um, which has to be no less than 60 and no more than 150 calendar days after the council meeting. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think 150 days is before November, right? Mm -hmm. That's just, yeah. Okay. Pardon? I'll be hearing. It's, yeah, no, yeah, no less than 60 and no more than 150. Uh, days after um, uh, after today. Okay, so it is more than 150 days to the November election. Okay, I think that's the it's answer, Councillor. 
for that, um, for the the referendum, the signature referendum, we would we're only allowed to set it for June. Um, if we so, you know, if this amend if the amendment were offered, I would support it today going to the ballot. If it um, if we want to, as Councillor Zaro had suggested, put it um, on a November ballot, and in the meantime, put the referendum on this ballot, um, we could go that way. I would also be open to working through some amendment language for the title um, if councillors wanted to work that through this evening. That's just where I am at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tavaro. Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, on the backs of Councillor Trevorrow's comments, I think the only thing I wanted to say was um, kind of pause for a moment and see if there was going to be a motion before we go any deeper discussing it's something that's not really on the floor. Um, and then since I do have the mic and I have four minutes and 40 seconds to go, I'm not going to use them all. Um, I, I will say that um, I agree a lot with what most of my colleagues have said. Um, I am interested in looking at the process and, and having the council um, try to uh, mirror the, the state uh, citizens initiative process. Um, I, I do agree that the citizens initiative is intended to be a, a, like a, a a tool that the citizens use, and I don't want to discourage its use, but I also want to, uh, you know, I want to acknowledge the challenges that it presents to good governance, um, and particularly in issues that we've highlighted as the priority for us to to take on. So, um, all that said, I'm, I'm going to pause with four minutes to go and see if my colleague does want to put a motion to get the competing measure on the floor. And Councillor Phillips, I was just going to say in response to Councillor Rodriguez. Um, I think that you know we have the competing measure in the packet. If if you want to continue to hear people speak before you offer to get a sense of the room, you can, or you can just go ahead and offer it, whatever your preference is. No, I'd like to um, I'd like to go and offer it. And before I offer it, I just want to I just want to talk about the process, right? I, I um, first of all, I just wanted to address the referendum, Krisha. I wasn't here. I, I certainly understand the frustration about referendums and competing measures. And, you know, I, I understand that. I can't speak to that because I wasn't here in this role. And so whatever happened last year or two years ago or three years ago, I can't speak to. And so again, frustrating process, sure. It is what it is. What happened, happened. And so for me, it's like, okay, well, let's, let's even though that was a frustrating process, how about if we leave that in the past and then go forward and think about where we are right now? Because I, again, I can't speak to that, right? And we can have conversations about referendums and all that other stuff. I also didn't create a competing measure. That was here before me. It's in the ordinance. I didn't create it. I found out that you could do a com competing measure I, I saw I had some concerns on the landlord referendum. And so I said, hey, let's do a competing measure. And so, and so that's where it ended up. It, it was, I said, okay, let's go ahead and do one. And then it's like, okay, well, what is the language? I tried to look and see and be mindful that this is a tough subject and this was going to affect renters and it was going to affect landlords. And I said, what it, to me, what, what is fair out of this? What can we do? Um, and I tried to work with, I not tried, I worked with Corporation Council to figure out the correct language, the language that it came from me, language that came from me in order to bring this forward. And, and, <clears throat> and to, you know, and, and I, will, uh, I will maybe uh, continue on, to what my counselor, uh, Councillor Tavaro said, to get to to get all chopped up about the process, I thought I followed the process. I saw a competing measure. I got some language. I talked to Corporation Council. I talked to my colleagues. I talked to my colleagues. Right. I said, Hey, I'm going to be putting this forward. I don't know what. I don't know all the language. I wanted to wait for a Corporation Council uh, to give me something, and then I sent it out. And not only that, but I made personal phone calls to people to say, what do you think? Do you have anything that you wanna change? Let's have a conversation about this, right? I reached out. And so to say I didn't follow the process or right, whatever, uh, I, I followed the process that I thought I was supposed to follow. 
And for us to get tripped up over the process versus what's in this language, we have something that the, the, the initiative I wanna put forward is for us to look at a couple of things. One is bank rent, to take the 10% and make it 20%. So let's, let's look at the issue here, right? Let's look at the issue. Let's leave process out there you know, for a minute and let's leave referendum versus competing measures versus this versus that. Let's leave all that out in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the peripheral for a minute. So what I want to bring forward is to increase the rents from 10% to 20%, right? The other thing is a supplying an affidavit for somebody to say, yep, you know what? This was volunteer, voluntary between you and I. This was voluntary. I'm not asking you to leave. I'm not evicting you. You and I have agreed that it's time for us to part ways. You're going to go your way and I'm going to go mine. It also looks at increasing the relocation cost. Our priority is housing. We absolutely cannot put anybody else in a warming center or in a school or in a family shelter. We can't. So in order for us, in order for us to be fair to second warning. In order for us to be fair to our tenants, it's like, okay, well, <clears throat> you need to, you need to be relocated. We don't, nobody has security deposit and all that other stuff. So it's, it's also taking a look and increasing those relocation costs uh, about 2000 to, to 2002 uh, months rent. Um, and also, um, you know, what it means to be voluntary terminated from, uh, from an apartment. And, you know, we did talk to experts. They're right here. Did, was it set up separately and did we get in a room and you know have a great have a conversation about it no well actually we did because we're all in the room and we did have a conversation about it but we did have a conversation about it and there were folks that came forward that said rent in portland is unaffordable i know do you want me to stop well no i'm just i'm just giving you that look because uh, after the five minutes is up we usually say <laughs> the five minutes is up right, that right it is. So the five minutes is up. That's when Ashley, yes. Um, yes. Well, so okay. I, if you, I, I mean, I think, I think I'm, you know what I mean? I, I think people get it. Uh, I know it's late. I, you know, I know all of those things. I, I do not support putting it on the ballot in November. What happens to the referendum? The referendum, if we put it on the ballot in June, I don't know what will happen. But if we put this on the ballot in November, I don't, I, I don't know what happens. I, I don't have a crystal ball. All I'm saying is, is that we have a competing measure. To me, it's great language on how we can protect both the landlord and the tenants. Um, obviously, I am going to vote for it. Um, and, Councilor, would you like to offer a motion to amend Order One Fifty Seven? Oh, sorry. Yes, I'd like to offer a motion to amend One Fifty Seven. And is there a councilor who would like That's to second that? Councilor Ali with a second. So we've got a motion to we've got a motion and a second to amend Order One Fifty Seven. So we're in the amendment, and I'm going to take this opportunity to say a few words and I'll call on you, Councillor Pelletier. Um, so I appreciate this conversation. I really wish we were truly talking about the substance of the competing measure tonight. And um, instead we have been talking about policy um, or sorry, process. Um, so I do wanna first start out by thanking everybody who, who came and has stuck with us all night and who offered public comment, whether you're on Zoom or in person, I know that it's a long night and um, I appreciate that. Um, for me, I, I, I really want policy that's durable. And, and my I have to say that I feel like it's accomplished best through an inclusive process, the democratic process that is deliberately slow. And that's frustrating, but it's the way that policy making was developed in our country and how we ideally do the work here in Portland with representative government is to build an inclusive process so that we get those stakeholders that were mentioned earlier. We get citizens, we get experts, we get policymakers, we get corporation council, we get city staff. We really talk about the issue and we come up with a compromise as a result of debate and dialogue before policy is put forward for consideration and action. So for me, any ready-baked ordinance that comes to the council or to the community feels like it's not, it's, it's antithetical to durability. 
because that durability was taken away because there was no process. So that's always been my struggle with the citizen initiative process is we get something fully baked and we put it on a ballot and the drafting is done. We don't, nobody gets any say. And so that public po process regarding the substance to me is very important. It may be that somebody has a great idea for policy, but if it's not done in public with the opportunity for dialogue and debate, it just doesn't strike me as durable. And that's part of what I think we're struggling with here in Portland is that we're approving things on ballots that are ready baked and they're put before voters. And then people say, how do we change this? Okay, let's go back to the citizen initiative process because the council can't handle it in five years. And so we end up talking about this process versus substance because we're stuck in that tangle right now. I don't think it's ideal. Um, I think that the council has become an arbiter of political adversaries. This is what I have experienced over my three and a half years here. Starting in the summer of 2020, the council had to decide about putting um, citizen initiatives on ballots. Should there be a competing measure? What do we do? Do we adopt? If we adopt, are we circumventing the process that citizens want? So I think that the council has become an arbiter of political adversaries because um, we're getting the adversaries who are putting citizen initiatives out there. So our role is we're sort of stuck in the middle. What do we do with these things? Do we put them on this ballot or that ballot? What are the voters gonna do? Um, it's, it's frustrating. I think all of us raised our hand for public service because we wanted to be policymakers and we wanted to be part of a governing body and we want to um, act as fiduciaries. And um, we're stuck in the middle of people saying, don't use citizen initiatives for policy. Then we're stuck with people saying, don't offer competing measures. You need to respect the citizen initiatives. And that's exactly what has happened to us many times at this table in the last three and a half years. Don't touch the citizen initiatives, that's democracy. And I'm fine with that, as, as was mentioned earlier, lots of, Policymaking happens through referendum, but it is really difficult when we get the competing messages from the community, don't offer a competing measure, do offer a competing measure. What's, what's, don't vote for a citizen initiative. None of them do vote for citizen initiatives. So it's, it's tricky um, and frustrating, I would say, um, at this table, because we love this work. We would, I think that that's why you raise your hand for public services, because you actually really love the committee work and the slow iterative process to make good policy. So, you know, we're not required to advance a competing measure. Of course, we're not required to do that. We have a community group that wants that. Um, for me, consistent with past practice, um, we have been told, let the initiatives go to the voters. If it's gone by way of a legitimate process that's in our current code, let it go to the voters. Do I always love it? Not really, um, but this is what we've got right now. So as, as was mentioned earlier, I think that review of, substance, uh, of chapter nine, which is on the council's calendar, uh, we'll begin that work on March 27th is imperative. Um, and, uh, and, and so to me, that's where this lives. So I'm not inclined to support an amendment tonight. Um, I always, I always am uh, appreciative of, of people bringing things forward. I haven't had the, the chance to really discuss the content or the substance with the sponsors. Um, we've, we've, I, I feel like, unfortunately, we haven't discussed the substance. We've actually just discussed the process. And it all happened so rapidly that uh, something hit our agenda packet on Friday afternoon. Um, and so I haven't had time to digest that substance. So I won't be voting for the amendment. I will be voting to send the citizen initiative to the June ballot. Thank you for the time. Um, I think Councillor Pelletier and then back to Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, I'm tired, but I, yeah, I'm, I, I feel like I, I don't know where to begin on this whole conversation. And I'm, again, I feel in disalignment with some of my colleagues uh, because everybody wants to do process and everybody wants to tie it up in a bow and make it nice and neat. And there's this consistent undertone of like, we're not supposed to do it like this in process. But in terms of a competing measure, this is the process. Two counselors got together. They had a conversation with their stakeholders or they had a conversation with community members and they decided to create a competing measure. 
Um, and people put citizens referendum on the ballot. It's a process. It is the process. And I also just like to add, this is a city of renters and it's really scary being a renter. Your future is very unknown. You have very few rights. And I'm pretty sure I'm the only renter here on the council. It's scary being an at-will tenant. It's scary wondering if you'll get evicted so that your landlord can renovate the building and you have no money and nowhere to go. And it's scary not being able to afford your rent here. So I would love for us to be able to do this in a perfect way, but there is no perfect way because we are talking about an imperfect system with very significant power dynamic and power imbalance. And it's not ideal, but it's what we have, which is the competing measure. And I also feel like we're back and forth on like, we can't govern by referenda. We need to reel in chapter nine. And it's wild to me that Nowhere in this body we've discussed people feeling so disenfranchised by their local government. That's why they're putting forth measures like rent control. That's why they're putting forth measures like tenant protection. So if we are going to have a stakeholder conversation, I would love to have one about why people don't feel like their local government is in support of them. I would love for us to start there if we are going to dissect chapter nine, because that's a whole part of this conversation that I don't think that we talk about. I also think that there is always, like I said, a power imbalance between tenants and landlords, whether people want it or not, it exists. Even if you are the nicest landlord in the world, you still control the livelihood of your tenants by determining how much they pay and how long they can stay in the unit, even if you never raise the rent. And I think the amendment of an act to reduce no cause evictions is a balance, especially in terms of the relocation requirement, which I also think is fair. Landlords have normalized asking for first month's rent last month's rent and a security deposit before you can even rent the apartment. So I think moving this measure forward is more than fair. And at the end of the day, it's still going to be up to Portland. It's still going to be up to the voters. Just because we're putting it forward on the ballot does not mean it's automatically going to pass. And again, I think in a, in a city that is rapidly becoming unaffordable, Councillor Phillips and Councillor Trevorrow's amendment is fair. It feels like it is a balance and it feels like it is fair. And I feel like they followed the process. The last thing that I'll say is I'm, I'm not going to talk about the act to protect the act to protect tenants citizens referenda. Um, I'm not going to talk about the content of that because, because I'm, I'm fine with sending it um, so voters can support it. But I will say there is no way I will support sending it as it is written now, um, where it says an act to protect tenants. I am not comfortable with sending that to the ballot as it is written because I think it is subjective and misleading. Somebody already said that. Um, so I don't know where others stand on that. I've heard that some counselors are in agreement with maybe amending the, the title um, and the text. So that way, when people are going to vote, um, you know, they're clear on what they're voting on. So. Yeah, I'm just going to leave it there for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Rodriguez. Oh, and then Councilor Ali. Thank you, Mayor. A um, couple of things. I just wanted to say uh, to Councilor Phillips, um, you use the tools that are available to you, and that's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Kudos to you and Councilor Trevor for doing that. I think, however, that when we hear like the word process thrown around, I think the the best way my I hope I'm not mansplaining here. Um, the best way for me to like to explain how I feel about it is that you know, the, the way in which policymaking usually takes place compared to the way that, you know, this happened. It's a way shorter, you know, window of time. It's not as inclusive. I know that you reached out to me over the weekend. I was doing one of the four jobs that I that I do, and I just didn't get a chance to get, you know, as much attention to it as I, as I should have. Um, so in comparison and what, you know, a two-year process to create policy versus, you know, a weekend, Clearly, one is more thorough than the other. So I think that that's the difference here. But you you did exactly what's within your your toolbox, you know, and kudos to you. Um, I, I will not be supporting the amendment because, like I said, I just didn't think that it's a thorough process, and I haven't even had a, a decent chance to, to dive into it. Um, lastly, I'm, I hear and I sympathize with the call to change the language, but in, I've not seen a motion here. So without the example... I agree with it. I don't have an, a motion to offer. I'm fine putting it in as is presented. Um, so, but I hear a lot of energy, and I think we've all used up our time. So, if if we can just have a motion or or, or an example of what we want the language to be, let's have that discussion um, and see if we're gonna do it. But but right now, that's not on the floor. 
Um, so just to recap, well, I don't support the amendment. Um, I guess I'm fine putting the original motion on the ballot, though my heart tells me that even that doesn't make sense, but I don't want to undermine their process. Thank you, Council Rodriguez. I, um, I think that when it comes to um, any amendments outside of the motion that we're currently in, uh, Councillor Phillips' amendment right now, that would, obviously we don't have anything prepared or shared or in the packet, so somebody would need to come forward with something from the floor. So that's up to my colleagues to decide if you're ready to do that. In the meantime, Councillor Ali, the floor is yours, and we're in the midst of discussing the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a question and then I will discuss the amendment. If someone wants to bring the uh, motion on the floor, how many votes do they need? Uh, seven. Seven, okay. Just to clarify that. Um, I know that we are having a conversation around process. I am very process. Ali, I just, sorry, I answered real quickly. I wanted to make sure, are you saying if someone were to offer a separate amendment that's not in the agenda packet, how many votes would it need to make its way? Yes, that's my question. Seven, no? I think five minutes. Five minutes. Sorry, five sorry, five I wanna, minutes. yeah. No, just a regular a majority. Yeah. Just a regular amendment, not a competing measure or a competing measure? A, a motion to change the title. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I misunderstood. Glad we paused. Okay, let's let's go to the experts here. Majority. That, that's just five votes. Uh, five. If it's just an amendment from the floor like that, if it was a competing measure and it wasn't in the packet, then what the mayor said was correct. It would have been seven votes from the floor um, because it would have been an unagended item. But we're just talking a straight amendment to, to the title. It's five votes. Yeah, I'm not offering an amendment. I'm just asking because I've heard that there's a rumor that, uh, yeah. Uh, I know we're speaking, we're having discussion about uh, um, um, process and uh, uh, substance, I am extremely process oriented. And I believe that uh, you get to substance through process. And uh, uh, I've been through several of these uh, amendments and backlashes and um, you should have done this, you didn't do this. Uh, it was a time that I was the only one that didn't support uh, an amendment, that didn't uh, join my colleagues on the council to make a public statement against a, a a referendum. Why? Because of, I believe in process. They were accused of uh, uh, having gone under the rock and create a, uh, a, 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 a referendum without having enough public process. And I've heard that today from both sides. And uh, uh, I don't know what to say to that. Um, I hope and hope that in the next few months, we will look at, uh, is it chapter nine, Mayor? That is your favorite chapter, right? Um, we will look at chapter nine and then find a way to fine tune that process. Like I said, I'm process oriented. Find a way to fine tune that process so that uh, whether it is those of us who are here right now or a new uh, group of counselors that will be discussing referendums in the near future, they don't have to go through a process like this. And Councillor Phillips, thank you for bringing this forward. I'm not supporting it, but thank you for, um, as Councillor Rodriguez said, you use what is available to you. I may not agree with it, but thank you for the effort. And uh, um, as I said, I'm a the process oriented, it's part of the process. So thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Okay, so I think I don't see any more hands. I, oh, okay, Councillor Fournier. Um, just a real quick interruption. Um, where we're after 10, do we need to take a motion to continue? Do you want to offer a motion to continue the meeting? I'd like to offer a motion, I guess, to continue beyond 10 o'clock now that it's 10 16. Councillor Ali has the second. We'll take a quick vote on the motion to continue our meeting past 10 p.m., which it is. California. Yes. Councillor Rodriguez. I want to think about this. <laughs> yes. Councillor Dion. Yes. Councillor Ali. Yes. Councillor Zaro. Yes. Councillor Trevaro. Yes. Councillor Pelletier. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Okay. We can continue. Thank you. Thank you for that procedural check in. We're back to the um, amendment that's being offered to Order 157. I think we're ready to vote on the amendment brought forward by both Councillor Phillips and Councillor Trevaro. Councillor Fournier. No. Councilor Rodriguez? No. Councilor Dion? No. Councilor Ali? No. Councilor Zaro? No. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. 
Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? No. Um, Okie doke. So the um, amendment fails uh, six to three. And I have a hand up from my colleague, Councillor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> if my colleagues will um, uh, uh, humor me, uh, I'd like to make uh, a motion to um, amend the title of the proposed citizen initiated referendum question. Uh, and my proposed change would be uh, to amend the title of the ordinance uh, from an act to improve tenant protections to an act to amend uh, rent control and tenant protections. Can you repeat it? <clears throat> yes. So uh, right now it is an act to improve tenant connect, uh, protections. Excuse me. Uh, and I would like to uh, propose changing it to an act to amend rent control and tenant protections. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Councillor Zaro with Councillor Rodriguez. Um, before us, uh, we've got comment from Cor Corporation Council. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to point out a, a couple of quick things about some of the language in Chapter 9 um, that addresses uh, this issue. And um, I think this has been brought to the Council's attention in the past, but I just want to make sure that um, not to overlook it, but um, the, the, uh, the ordinance, um, Chapter nine has instructions to the petitioners um, in a citizen referendum to submit a summary to accompany the proposed ordinance on the petition. Um, and, and it says that the summary uh, shall be clearly and object or shall clearly and objectively objectively, excuse me, describe the content of the proposal and shall be written in words with common and everyday meaning. The summary shall not contain language designed to promote or oppose the proposal. Um, and so so that's what it, that's how it describes. That's sort of instructions to the petitioners. Um, the the uh, text of the ordinance goes on to say that the summary included on the petition shall accompany the title and text of the ordinance on the ballot. So on the one hand, it gives instructions to the petitioners to do a certain thing. Um, on the other hand, it instructs the uh, council to include that language on the um, on the ballot. Uh, and that appears in another in another place as well on the um, under the form of the ballot where it says in, in a situation like this where we're including the title and summary only um, on the ballot it says that the summary provided with the petition shall accompany the title on the ballot in place of the full text so um, I wanted to bring that to the council's attention I think there's you know perhaps some ambiguity in that language maybe something that can be clarified um, in the future, as the council is considering amendments to Article or to uh, to Chapter Nine, um, but I, you know, I just want to say I can't I can't guarantee that there wouldn't be some challenge down the road um, regarding a change to the title or the summary. But I know that the council has also done it in the past, and so um, I just want to highlight that issue. Okay, thank you for doing that, Councilor Zaro. Uh, thank you for the clarification, Corporation Council, and I, I know the council has done it before a couple of times since I've been on the council. Um, just a point of clarification, though, are you saying that if we are going to make an amendment to the title, then <clears throat> because the summary accompanies it, we would do that to the summary as well? The I think the rule applies equally to the title and the summary. And so if I think in the past, my understanding, I don't know, I don't, I'm aware of situations where the council and Danielle has been around longer than I have, she can weigh in, but I'm aware of situations where the council has amended the summary in the past. I don't know if the council has amended the, the title. In this case, the change that's being proposed to the title is, I believe, very objective. It's, it states exactly what it's doing, which is amending the rent control and tenant protection ordinance. That's the title of the existing ordinance. Uh, and so I, I don't anticipate any substantial, you know, uh, problems with that. Um, but I just wanted to make sure to highlight the language. And yeah, and I think that in the past we have we've actually uh, had counselors get into the summary language itself and actually amend that. I don't. I was trying to think of a time where someone amended the title. I don't know if I recall one specifically, but we have um council uh past councils have amended the the summary so um i think it's due to that ambiguity that michael described but um he he was right to flag it i think it's been flagged in the past as well but thank you that's helpful 
Okay, we've got a motion and a second, second. to amend the title. We've already got a second. Thank you, Councillor Dion. <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm. Um, so we have that on the floor to discuss. Um, Corporation Council, I'm actually going to discuss and go back to you uh, at, at the very top of what you were talking about in Chapter 9. Can you just read that initial part again that you were referencing when you started out the discussion? It doesn't sound like you're saying you can or can't do something. You're saying be aware that there's language in Chapter 9. Yeah. Y yes. Do you want me to? Sorry. Do you want me to read yeah. the language again? Yeah, yes, yeah. please. So, um, yeah, this is in uh, just to be clear, uh, section nine thirty seven. The this is this is instructions to the petitioners on the form of the petition, and it says, at the time of submitting the proposed ordinance, the petitioners must submit a summary to accompany the proposed ordinance on the petition. Said summary shall clearly and objectively describe the content of the proposal and shall be written in words with common and everyday meaning. The summary shall not contain language designed to promote or oppose the proposal. Uh, and then and then it goes on to say that in the event the uh, that sufficient signatures are obtained to submit the ordinance to the voters, the summary included on the petition shall accompany the title and text of the ordinance on the ballot. Okay, thank you. Sure. I appreciate that. Um, Councillor Zaro, I, I, I don't have any problem um, supporting this title amendment. Councillor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. One thing I did notice, though, it's, is the title is the first line of the summary. So we do actually have to change the summary if we're going to change the title, just to make them the same. Good catch. Any council discussion on at least the the amendment that we're in, which is a revision to the title. Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Councilor Zaro. I like it. I will support it. Thank you. Other input? Any? Thank you, Councilor Fournier. Thank you. Sorry, my hands. Like, I'm tired. <laughs> um, so I. I, I like it. I'll support this. Um, I wonder um, if we're um, adjusting the summary language to then match what the title is. Um, I'm just drawn to um, the the rest of the summary language to be more plain, plainly aligned with what the actual changes are. Um, and so the way that it reads currently is the act removes incentives for landlords to increase rents for existing tenants and discourages no cause evictions by allowing for the establishment of new base rents at the time of new tenancy. So I think part of that is factual and then part of that is assume, assuming or subjective. So um, the removing incentive for landlords, it just to me feels like that's a little subjective. So I think you can say what it's exactly doing, but the might not, I'm, I might not be making sense at this point. Um, the other, the last piece um, of that as well is the act also brings Portland's rent stabilization ordinance into alignment with most local and national rent stabilization ordinances. Again, to me, that's subjective. I, I don't have any factual information to base that on and nothing within the ordinance itself speaks directly to that. So to me, I don't know why you would include that part. Mm -hmm. So I would proposed summary language that really is more um, aligned to like an act to amend rent control um, uh, and tenant protections, amends the existing rent control and tenant protection ordinance. I've been writing this out, sorry. It doesn't make sense. Um, to allow for the establishment of new base rents at the time of new tenancy, but only when a prior tenant moves out voluntarily. Um, it's removing just all the additional language around things that you could assume, depending on what side of the argument you're on. Thank you, Councilor Fournier. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll, I'll uh, I'm comfortable with um, the amendment offered by Councilor Zaro to the title and replacing the initial element of the summary that references the title. At this moment, I don't 
we, we've had the summary language now for a, a bit of time and I, we, nobody, we, nobody's come forward with a prepared amendment. So I feel like I'm not equipped at the moment to respond to something on the fly. That's where I am. We can always go ahead and just vote on the amendment that's before us and see where we get, Councillor Zaro. Okay. Why don't we, Councillor Pelletier? Can you just read it? Read the amendment again. Do you want me to read it? it I think uh, an act to amend rent control and tenant protection. We, ha we don't have a, an amendment on the text at this time. That would come next. Counts, uh, Corporation Council. Yeah, I think uh, just to clear, I think to to uh, clarify that issue, the, the first uh, line of the title, well, the, the, the title and the first line of the summary are the same. And so that change would be made in two places. Okay. So Councillor Zara, would you want to change your proposed amendment to include the first line of the summary to mirror the changed title? Yes, would Could we like do that? say that whole thing? Okay. So I'm looking, I think Councillor Rodriguez, if you're okay with that. Happy, yes. So it would be a change to the title as just discussed, and then a change to the summary language to reflect the new title. Sound good? Okay. That's what we've got before us right now. I think we're going to go ahead and vote on that amendment. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Okay. So we are actually back at Order 157 as amended. We can go ahead and vote on Order 157 as amended, or if there's additional information uh, or items for consideration from the council, we can take them at this time. I think we're ready to vote on Order 157. Oh, oh, just a quick clarification. This is to place it on the June ballot. That's right. That's what yeah. the Thank you. order reads that we would be the city council will vote to set the election date of June 13th. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Councilor Zaro. Sorry, now just now that we're in it, Councilor Fournier actually brought up a really good point in the last sentence of the summary. And uh, the act also brings Portland's rent stabilization ordinance into alignment with most local and national rent stabilization ordinances. You actually bring up a really good point. I don't recall seeing anywhere that we have uh, a local ordinance that this brings this brings this in compliance to at the local or the state level. Do we have any information that that that, that clarifies if this is fact or not? I'm going to look to Corporation Council for that. Um, the, uh, uh, nothing was submitted to my office to to either support that or uh, or refute it. I, yeah, I, I'm not aware of that. So it's language that came as from the petitioners. Oh yeah, yeah. The summary that's drafted, uh, the title, the summary and the ordinance language itself were all drafted by the petitioners. It's the language that was included on the petition um, and circulated by the circulators. Councilor Dion. I would move to strike the sentence because we don't know. We simply don't. I, I have an opinion based on some reading, but it's not, it's not reliable. It's one man's opinion. I mean, others could dispute it, even if it were passed as to whether or not it's in alignment. So I would become, I don't think removing that last sentence harms the core question being advanced by the proposition. So. We have an amend. We have a motion to amend the summary language to strike the last sentence. Second, we're in discussion on that. Corporation Council, can you weigh in on that? Can you offer any opinion about the removal of language from the petitioners at this stage? Um, I think that the it, it it seems to me to be an overall sort of more substantial change than changing the title as has been proposed or has already been approved. Um, uh, you know, I've read the the language in the 
in the ordinance that describes, you know, what is supposed to be included on the ballot, which is the, the summary um, that was included there. Um, at the same time, the council has changed the summaries in the past. Uh, and so, you know, I don't, I think I would agree, I think with Councillor Dion that, um, and Councillor Fournier, that that, that is the, 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 the statement in the last sentence is not something that's addressed in the changes to the ordinance. Uh, and so I don't know that it has any real bearing on the substance of the ordinance. Um, but again, it would be a decision of the council on whether or not to to include that. And I see Daniel is chomping I'm at just, the bit. I'm, I'm remembering why um, we got into this in the past. We chose not to put summaries on a couple of times and put the entire ordinance language on, which um, took all of these questions away because it takes you out of that provision you're reading. And so we put the whole thing on. But the thing that that does obviously is make the, <laughs> the ballot huge and very um, expensive. And we've had some issues with that. So my one question to you, Ashley, is at each polling place, the language will be available, right? Yeah, the language is gonna be posted on our website um, and it will also be available at every post, single polling location. Okay, so I mean, we'll have the language itself there. So I'm not sure removing that sentence really takes away any of the substance, but um, I think that's the other option for the council is to put the whole, uh, the whole kit and caboodle right onto the ballot, but that does make for a very, uh, pricey and um, difficult ballot for voters because it becomes an very long. Unbudgeted expense. Yeah, an unbudgeted expense, which uh, Ashley, the city clerk, just reminded me of, and they are very costly. Well, but we've done it. <laughs> Councilor Dion, you had your hand up. I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but I think the proponents say that this initiative can be summarized in one sentence. I think I heard that clearly. And then when you look at the text, it is one sentence wrapped in all existing other protections from the standing ordinance, which I think was a way to assert, we're not disturbing anything other than this one specific issue. And our issue is addressed by one specific sentence. So I think you've got that in the summary, Corporation Council. And uh, striking the last sentence, I guess, as I think about it, one could read that as an implicit endorsement of the proposition that others have adopted it, so therefore it must be okay. Whether that's true or not, I think just reinforces the idea it's not a neutral statement. The other sentences are neutral and allows the voter to draw their own conclusion as to the anticipated benefits of the proposition. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dion. And I think that we have, as a council, made that choice in the past to be to change language to make it as objective and neutral as we can. Councillor Zaro, did you have a hand up? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. One one last thing. Um, but I just want to piggyback on what Councillor Dion and Councillor Fournier were saying. I, I'm I don't think there are any municipalities in the state of Maine that have a rent control ordinance on the books. South Portland is the closest, mm -hmm. but so taking that into account, I agree with you entirely. There's no, I mean, what is, what is it even referencing? So I, I, I would support, I would support striking that last sentence. Thank you. I, okay, I think we're ready to go ahead and vote on that motion uh, from Councillor Dion with a second from Councillor Fournier. I'm just confirming that to strike the last sentence in the summary language. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Slater? Yes. Okay, um, that, was a mo uh, that was an amendment uh, within order 157 to remove the last sentence of the summary. We're back to order 157 as amended. Is there any further discussion at this time? Okay, let's go ahead and vote on order 157 as amended. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 157, as amended, passes unanimously. This will be a question on the ballot um, on June 13th. So thank you again, everybody, for uh, being here tonight for 
thoughtful deliberation at the council table. Thank you to staff for all of your help and support. Thank you to the community for coming out and being with us this evening and offering your voice. Uh, this meeting, oh wait, I need a motion to adjourn. So I was gonna just adjourn us. Councilor Ali. Second. Councilor Zara with a second. And we'll go ahead and vote on our adjournment. Councilor Fournier. Yes. Councilor Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Dion. Yes. Councilor Ali. Councilor Zaro. Yes. Councilor Chabarro. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Councilor Phillips. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Uh, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>